Book Two, Chapter Two, Part Three of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter Two, Symposium. Part Three of Three. In Darkness. One sultry afternoon late in July, Richard Caramel telephoned from New York that he and Maury were coming out, bringing a friend with them. They arrived about five, a little drunk, accompanied by a small, stocky man of thirty-five, whom they introduced as Mr. Joe Hull, one of the best fellows that Anthony and Gloria had ever met. Joe Hull had a yellow beard continually fighting through his skin, and a low voice which varied between basso profundo and a husky whisper. Anthony, carrying Maury's suitcase upstairs, followed into the room and carefully closed the door. "'Who is this fellow?' he demanded. Maury chuckled enthusiastically. "'Who, Hull? Oh, he's all right. He's a good one.' "'Yes, but who is he?' "'Hull? He's just a good fellow. He's a prince.' His laughter redoubled, culminating in a succession of pleasant cat-like grins. Anthony hesitated between a smile and a frown. He looks sort of funny to me, weird-looking clothes. He paused. I've got a sneaking suspicion you two picked him up somewhere last night. Ridiculous, declared Maury. Why, I've known him all my life. However, as he capped his statement with another series of chuckles, Anthony was impelled to remark, The devil you have. Later, just before dinner, while Maury and Dick were conversing uproariously, with Joe Hull listening in silence as he sipped his drink, Gloria drew Anthony into the dining room. "'I don't like this man Hull,' she said. "'I wish he'd use Tana's bathtub. "'I can't very well ask him to. "'Well, I don't want him in ours. "'He seems to be a simple soul. "'He's got on white shoes that look like gloves. "'I can see his toes right through them. "'Ugh, who is he, anyway?' "'You've got me. "'Well, I think they've got their nerve to bring him out here. "'This isn't a sailor's rescue home.' They were tight when they phoned. Maury said they've been on a party since yesterday afternoon. Gloria shook her head angrily, and saying no more, returned to the porch. Anthony saw that she was trying to forget her uncertainty and devote herself to enjoying the evening. It had been a tropical day, and even into the late twilight the heat waves emanating from the dry road were quivering faintly like undulating panes of isinglass. The sky was cloudless, but far beyond the woods in the direction of the sound, a faint and persistent rolling had commenced. When Tana announced dinner, the men, at a word from Gloria, remained coatless and went inside. Moria began a song, which they accompanied in harmony during the first course. It had two lines and was sung to a popular air called Daisy Deer. The lines were, The panic has come over us, so has the moral decline. Each rendition was greeted with bouts of enthusiasm and prolonged applause. "'Cheer up, Gloria,' suggested Maury. "'You seem the least bit depressed.' "'I'm not,' she lied. "'Here, Tannenbaum,' he called over his shoulder. "'I've filled you a drink. Come on.' Gloria tried to stay his arm. "'Please don't, Maury.' "'Why not? Maybe he'll play the flute for us after dinner. Here, Tana.' Tana, grinning, bore the glass away to the kitchen. In a few moments, Maury gave him another. "'Cheer up, Gloria,' he cried. "'For heaven's sakes, everybody, cheer up, Gloria.' "'Dearest, have another drink,' counseled Anthony. "'Do, please.' "'Cheer up, Gloria,' said Joe Hull easily. Gloria winced at this uncalled-for using of her first name and glanced around to see if anyone else had noticed it. The word coming so glibly from the lips of a man to whom she had taken an inordinate dislike repelled her. A moment later she noticed that Joe Hull had given Tana another drink, and her anger increased, heightened somewhat from the effects of the alcohol. And once, Maury was saying, Peter Granby and I went into a Turkish bath in Boston, about two o'clock at night. There was no one there but the proprietor, and we jammed him into a closet and locked the door. Then a fellow came in and wanted a Turkish bath. Thought we were the rubbers, by golly. Well, we just picked him up and tossed him into the pool with all his clothes on. 
Then we dragged him out and laid him on a slab and slapped him until he was black and blue. Not so rough, fellows, he'd say in a little squeaky voice. Please. Was this Maury? thought Gloria. From anyone else the story would have amused her, but from Maury, the infinitely appreciative, the apotheosis of tact and consideration, the panic has come over us, so has... A drum of thunder from outside drowned out the rest of the song. Gloria shivered and tried to empty her glass, but the first taste nauseated her, and she set it down. Dinner was over, and they all marched into the big room, bearing several bottles and decanters. Someone had closed the porch door to keep out the wind, and in consequence circular tentacles of cigar smoke were twisting already upon the heavy air. Paging Lieutenant Tannenbaum! Again it was the changeling Maury. Bring us the flute! Anthony and Maury rushed into the kitchen. Richard Caramel started the phonograph and approached Gloria. Dance with your well-known cousin. I don't want to dance. Then I'm going to carry you around. As though he were doing something of overpowering importance, he picked her up in his fat little arms and started trotting gravely about the room. Set me down, Dick. I'm dizzy, she insisted. He dumped her in a bouncing bundle on the couch and rushed off to the kitchen, shouting, Tana, Tana! Then, without warning, she felt other arms around her, felt herself lifted from the lounge. Joe Hull had picked her up and was trying drunkenly to imitate Dick. Put me down, she said sharply. His maudlin laugh and the sight of that prickly yellow jaw close to her face stirred her to intolerable disgust. At once! The panic, he began, but got no further, for Gloria's hand swung around swiftly and caught him in the cheek. At this, he all at once let go of her, and she fell to the floor, her shoulder hitting the table a glancing blow in transit. Then the room seemed full of men and smoke. There was Tana in his white coat, reeling about, supported by Maury. Into his flute, he was blowing a weird blend of sound that was known, cried Anthony, as the Japanese train song. Joe Hull had found a box of candles and was juggling them, yelling, One down! every time he missed, and Dick was dancing by himself in a fascinated whirl around and about the room. It appeared to her that everything in the room was staggering in grotesque fourth-dimensional gyrations through intersecting planes of hazy blue. Outside the storm had come up amazingly, the lulls within were filled with the scrape of tall bushes against the house and the roaring of rain on the tin roof in the kitchen. The lightning was interminable, letting down thick drips of thunder like pig iron from the heart of a white-hot furnace. Gloria could see that the rain was spitting in at three of the windows, but she could not move to shut them. She was in the hall. She had said good night, but no one had heard or heeded her. It seemed for an instant as though something had looked down over the head of the banister, but she could not have gone back into the living room. Better madness than the madness of that clamor. Upstairs she fumbled for the electric switch and missed it in the darkness. A room full of lightning showed her the button plainly on the wall, but when the impenetrable black shut down it again eluded her fumbling fingers, so she slipped off her dress and petticoat and threw herself weakly on the dry side of the half-drenched bed. She shut her eyes. From downstairs arose the babble of the drinkers, punctured suddenly by a tinkling shiver of broken glass, and then another, and by a soaring fragment of unsteady, irregular song. She lay there for something over two hours, so she calculated afterward, sheerly by piecing together the bits of time. She was conscious, even aware, after a while, that the noise downstairs had lessened and that the storm was moving off westward, throwing back lingering showers of sound that fell, heavy and lifeless as her soul, into the soggy fields. This was succeeded by a slow, reluctant scattering of rain and wind, until there was nothing outside her windows but a gentle dripping and the swishing play of a cluster of wet vine against the sill. She was in a state halfway between sleeping and waking, with neither condition predominant, and she was harassed by a desire to rid herself of a weight pressing down upon her breast. She felt that if she could cry the weight would be lifted, and forcing the lids of her eyes together she tried to raise a lump in her throat, to no avail. 
drip, drip, drip. The sound was not unpleasant, like spring, like a cool rain of her childhood that made cheerful mud in her backyard and watered the tiny garden she had dug with miniature rake and spade and hoe. Drip, drip. It was like days when the rain came out of yellow skies that melted just before twilight and shot one radiant shaft of sunlight diagonally down the heavens into the damp green trees. So cool, so clear and clean, and her mother there at the center of the world, at the center of the rain, safe and dry and strong. She wanted her mother now, and her mother was dead, beyond sight and touch forever. Oh, it pressed on her so. She became rigid. Someone had come to the door and was standing regarding her, very quiet except for a slight swaying motion. She could see the outline of his figure distinct against some indistinguishable light. There was no sound anywhere, only a great persuasive silence. Even the dripping had ceased. Only this figure, swaying, swaying in the doorway, an indiscernible and subtly menacing terror, a personality filthy under its varnish, like smallpox spots under a layer of powder. Yet her tired heart, beating until it shook her breasts, made her sure that there was still life in her, desperately shaken, threatened. The minute, or succession of minutes, prolonged itself interminably, and a swimming blur began to form before her eyes, which tried with childish persistence to pierce the gloom in the direction of the door. In another instant it seemed that some unimaginable force would shatter her out of existence. And then the figure in the doorway, it was Hull, she saw, Hull, turned deliberately, and, still slightly swaying, moved back and off, as if absorbed into that incomprehensible light that had given him dimension. Blood rushed back into her limbs, blood and life together. With a start of energy she sat upright, shifting her body until her feet touched the floor over the side of the bed. She knew what she must do, now, now, before it was too late. She must go out into this cool damp, out, away, to feel the wet swish of the grass around her feet and the fresh moisture on her forehead. Mechanically she struggled into her clothes, groping in the dark of the closet for a hat. She must go from this house where the thing hovered that pressed upon her bosom, or else made itself into stray swaying figures in the gloom. In a panic she fumbled clumsily at her coat, found the sleeve just as she heard Anthony's footsteps on the lower stair. She dared not wait, he might not let her go, and even Anthony was a part of this wait, part of this evil house and the somber darkness that was growing up about it. Through the hall, then, and down the back stairs, hearing Anthony's voice in the bedroom she had just left. Gloria! Gloria! But she had reached the kitchen now, passed out through the doorway into the night. A hundred drops, startled by a flare of wind from a dripping tree, scattered on her, and she pressed them gladly to her face with hot hands. Gloria! Gloria! The voice was infinitely remote, muffled and made plaintive by the wall she had just left. She rounded the house and started down the front path toward the road, almost exultant as she turned into it, and followed the carpet of short grass alongside, moving with caution in the intense darkness. Gloria! She broke into a run, stumbled over the segment of a branch twisted off by the wind, the voice was outside the house now. Anthony, finding the bedroom deserted, had come on to the porch. But this thing was driving her forward. It was back there with Anthony, and she must go on in her flight under this dim and oppressive heaven, forcing herself through the silence ahead as though it were a tangible barrier before her. She had gone some distance along the barely discernible road, probably half a mile, and passed a single deserted barn that loomed up, black and foreboding, the only building of any sort between the grey house and Marietta. Then she turned the fork, where the road entered the wood, and ran between two high walls of leaves and branches that nearly touched overhead. She noticed suddenly a thin, longitudinal gleam of silver upon the road before her, like a bright sword half embedded in the mud. As she came closer she gave a little cry of satisfaction. It was a wagon rut full of water, and glancing heavenward, she saw a light rift of sky and knew that the moon was out. Gloria! She started violently. Anthony was not two hundred feet behind her. 
Gloria, wait for me. She shut her lips tightly to keep from screaming and increased her gait. Before she had gone another hundred yards, the woods disappeared, rolling back like a dark stocking from the leg of the road. Three minutes' walk ahead of her, suspended now in the high and limitless air, she saw a thin interlacing of attenuated gleams and glitters, centered in a regular undulation on some one invisible point. Abruptly she knew where she would go. That was the great cascade of wires that rose high over the river, like the legs of a giant spider whose eye was the little green light in the switch house, and ran with the railroad bridge in the direction of the station. The station! There would be a train to take her away. Gloria! It's me! It's Anthony! Gloria, I won't try to stop you! For God's sake, where are you? She made no answer, but began to run, keeping on the high side of the road, and leaping the gleaming puddles, dimensionless pools of thin, unsubstantial gold. Turning sharply to the left, she followed a narrow wagon road, serving to avoid a dark body on the ground. She looked up as an owl hooted mournfully from a solitary tree. Just ahead of her, she could see the trestle that led to the railroad bridge and the steps mounting up to it. The station lay across the river. Another sound startled her, the melancholy siren of an approaching train, and, almost simultaneously, a repeated call, thin now and far away. Gloria! Gloria! The siren soared again, closer at hand, and then, with no anticipatory roar and clamor, a dark, insinuous body curved into view against the shadows far down the high-banked track, and with no sound but the rush of the cleft wind and the clock-like tick of the rails, moved toward the bridge. It was an electric train. Above the engine, two vivid blurs of blue light formed incessantly, a radiant crackling bar between them, which, like a sputtering flame in a lamp beside a corpse, lit for an instant the successive rows of trees, and caused Gloria to draw back instinctively to the far side of the road. The light was tepid, the temperature of warm blood. The clicking blended suddenly with itself, in a rush of even sound, and then, elongating in somber elasticity, the thing roared blindly by her and thundered onto the bridge, racing the lurid shaft of fire it cast into the solemn river alongside. Then it contracted swiftly, sucking in its sound until it left only a reverberant echo, which died upon the farther bank. Silence crept down again over the wet country. The faint dripping resumed, and suddenly a great shower of drops tumbled upon Gloria, stirring her out of the trance-like torpor which the passage of the train had wrought. She ran swiftly down a descending level to the bank and began climbing the iron stairway to the bridge, remembering that it was something she had always wanted to do, and that she would have the added excitement of traversing the yard-wide plank that ran beside the tracks over the river. There, this was better. She was at the top now, and could see the lands about her as successive sweeps of open country, cold under the moon, coarsely patched and seamed with thin rows and heavy clumps of trees. To her right, half a mile down the river, which trailed away behind the light, like the shiny, slimy path of a snail, winked the scattered lights of Marietta. Not two hundred yards away at the end of the bridge squatted the station, marked by a sullen lantern. The oppression was lifted now. The treetops below her were rocking the young starlight to a haunted doze. She stretched out her arms with a gesture of freedom. This was what she had wanted, to stand alone where it was high and cool. Gloria! Like a startled child, she scurried along the plank, hopping, skipping, jumping, with an ecstatic sense of her own physical lightness. Let him come now. She no longer feared that. Only she must first reach the station, because that was part of the game. She was happy. Her hat, snatched off, was clutched tightly in her hand, and her short curled hair bobbed up and down about her ears. She had thought she would never feel so young again, but this was her night, her world. Triumphantly, she laughed as she left the plank, and reaching the wooden platform, flung herself down happily beside an iron roof post. "'Here I am,' she called, gay as the dawn in her elevation. "'Here I am, Anthony, dear, old worried Anthony.' "'Gloria.' He reached the platform, ran toward her, 
Are you all right? Coming up, he knelt and took her in his arms. Yes. What was the matter? Why did you leave? He queried anxiously. I had to. There was something... She paused, and a flicker of uneasiness lashed at her mind. There was something sitting on me. Here. She put her hand on her breast. I had to go out and get away from it. What do you mean by something? I don't know. That man Hull. Did he bother you? He came to my door, drunk. I think I'd gotten sort of crazy by that time. Gloria, dearest. Wearily, she laid her head upon his shoulder. Let's go back, he suggested. She shivered. Ah, uh, no, I couldn't. It'd come and sit on me again. Her voice rose to a cry that hung plaintive in the darkness. That thing... There, there, he soothed her, pulling her close to him. We won't do anything you don't want to do. What do you want to do? Just sit here? I want... I want to go away. Where? Oh, anywhere. By golly, Gloria, he cried. You're still tight. No, I'm not. I haven't been all evening. I went upstairs about... Oh, I don't know. About half an hour after dinner. Ouch! He had inadvertently touched her right shoulder. It hurts me. I hurt it some way. I don't know. Somebody picked me up and dropped me. Gloria, come home. It's late and damp. I can't, she wailed. Oh, Anthony, don't ask me to. I will tomorrow. You go home and I'll wait here for a train. I'll go to a hotel. I'll go with you. No, I don't want you with me. I want to be alone. I want to sleep. Oh, I want to sleep. And then tomorrow, when you've got all the smell of whiskey and cigarettes out of the house, and everything straight, and Hull is gone, then I'll come home. If I went now, that thing, oh... She covered her eyes with her hand. Anthony saw the futility of trying to persuade her. I was all sober when you left, he said. Dick was asleep on the couch, and Maury and I were having a discussion. That fellow Hull had wandered off somewhere. Then I began to realize I hadn't seen you for several hours, so I went upstairs. He broke off as a salutary, Hello there, boomed suddenly out of the darkness. Gloria sprang to her feet, and he did likewise. It's Maury's voice, she cried excitedly. If it's Hull with him, keep him away, keep them away. Who's there? Anthony called. Just Dick and Maury returned two voices reassuringly. Where's Hull? He's in bed, passed out. Their figures appeared dimly on the platform. What the devil are you and Gloria doing here? inquired Richard Caramel with sleepy bewilderment. What are you two doing here? Maury laughed. Damned if I know. We followed you and had the deuce of a time doing it. I heard you out on the porch yelling for Gloria, so I woke up the caramel here and got it through his head, with some difficulty, that if there was a search party we'd better be on it. He slowed me up by sitting down in the road at intervals and asking me what it was all about. We tracked you by the pleasant scent of Canadian Club. There was a rattle of nervous laughter under the low train shed. How did you track us, really? Well, we followed along down the road, and then we suddenly lost you. Seems you turned off at a wagon trail. After a while, somebody hailed us and asked us if we were looking for a young girl. Well, we came up and found it was a little shivering old man, sitting on a fallen tree like somebody in a fairy tale. She turned down here, he said, and most stepped on me, going somewhere in an awful hustle, and then a fella in short golfing pants come running along and went after her. He throwed me this. The old fellow had a dollar bill he was waving around. Oh, the poor old man, ejaculated Gloria, moved. I threw him another, and we went on, though he asked us to stay and tell him what it was all about. Poor old man, repeated Gloria dismally. Dick sat down sleepily on a box. And now what? he inquired in the tone of stoic resignation. Gloria's upset, explained Anthony. She and I are going to the city by the next train. Maury, in the darkness, had pulled a timetable from his pocket. Strike a match. A tiny flare leaped out of the opaque background, illuminating the four faces, grotesque and unfamiliar here in the open night. Let's see. Two, two-thirty? No, that's evening. By gad, you won't get a train till five-thirty. 
Anthony hesitated. Well, he muttered uncertainly, we've decided to stay here and wait for it. You two might as well go back and sleep. You go too, Anthony, urged Gloria. I want you to have some sleep, dear. You've been pale as a ghost all day. Why, you little idiot. Dick yawned. Very well. You stay, we stay. He walked out from under the shed and surveyed the heavens. Rather a nice night, after all. Stars are out and everything. Exceptionally tasty assortment of them. Let's see. Gloria moved after him, and the other two followed her. Let's sit out here, she suggested. I like it much better. Anthony and Dick converted a long box into a backrest and found a board dry enough for Gloria to sit on. Anthony dropped down beside her, and with some effort, Dick hoisted himself onto an apple barrel near them. Tanner went to sleep in the porch hammock, he remarked. We carried him in and left him next to the kitchen stove to dry. He was drenched to the skin. That awful little man, sighed Gloria. How do you do? The voice, sonorous and funereal, had come from above, and they looked up, startled, to find that in some manner Maury had climbed to the roof of the shed, where he sat dangling his feet over the edge, outlined as a shadowy and fantastic gargoyle against the now brilliant sky. It must be for such occasions as this, he began softly, his voice having the effect of floating down from an immense height and settling softly upon his auditors, that the righteous of the land decorate the railroads with billboards, asserting in red and yellow that Jesus Christ is God, and placing them, appropriately enough, next to announcements that Gunter's whiskey is good. There was gentle laughter, and the three below kept their heads tilted upward. I think I shall tell you the story of my education, continued Maury, under these sardonic constellations. Do, please. Shall I, really? They waited expectantly while he directed a ruminative yawn toward the white smiling moon. Well, he began, as an infant I prayed, I stored up prayers against future wickedness. One year I stored up nineteen hundred, now I lay me. Throw down a cigarette, murmured someone. A small package reached the platform simultaneously with a stentorian command, Silence! I am about to unburden myself of many memorable remarks reserved for the darkness of such earths and the brilliance of such skies. Below, a lighted match was passed from cigarette to cigarette. The voice resumed. I was adept at fooling the deity. I prayed immediately after all crimes, until eventually prayer and crime became indistinguishable to me. I believed that because a man cried out, My God, when a safe fell on him, it proved that belief was rooted deep in the human breast. Then I went to school. For fourteen years, half a hundred earnest men pointed to ancient flintlocks and cried to me, There's the real thing. These new rifles are only shallow, superficial imitations. They damned the books I read, and the things I thought, by calling them immoral. Later the fashion changed, and they damned things by calling them clever. And so I turned, canny for my years, from the professors to the poets, listening to the lyric tenor of Swinburne and the tenor robusto of Shelley, to Shakespeare with his first bass and his fine range, to Tennyson with his second bass and his occasional falsetto, to Milton and Marlowe, Bassos Profundo. I gave ear to Browning chatting, Byron declaiming, and Wordsworth droning. This, at least, did me no harm. I learned a little of beauty, enough to know that it had nothing to do with truth, and I found, moreover, that there was no great literary tradition. There was only the tradition of the eventual death of every literary tradition. Then I grew up, and the beauty of succulent illusions fell away from me. The fiber of my mind coarsened, and my ears grew miserably keen. Life rose around my island like a sea, and presently I was swimming. The transition was subtle. The thing had lain in wait for me for some time. It has its insidious, seemingly innocuous trap for everyone. With me? No. I didn't try to seduce the janitor's wife, nor did I run through the streets unclothed, proclaiming my virility. It is never quite passion that does the business. It is the dress that passion wears. I became bored, that was all. Boredom, which is another name, 
and a frequent disguise for vitality, became the unconscious motive of all my acts. Beauty was behind me, do you understand? I was grown. He paused. End of school and college period. Opening of part two. Three quietly active points of light show the location of his listeners. Gloria was now half sitting, half lying in Anthony's lap. His arm was around her so tightly that she could hear the beating of his heart. Richard Caramel, perched on the apple barrel, from time to time stirred and gave off a faint grunt. I grew up then, into this land of jazz, and fell immediately into a state of almost audible confusion. Life stood over me like an immortal schoolmistress, editing my ordered thoughts. But with a mistaken faith and intelligence, I plodded on. I read Smith, who laughed at charity, and insisted that the sneer was the highest form of self-expression. But Smith himself replaced charity as an obscure of the light. I read Jones, who neatly disposed of individualism, and behold, Jones was still in my way. I did not think. I was a battleground for the thoughts of many men. Rather was I one of those desirable but impotent countries over which the great powers surge back and forth. I reached maturity under the impression that I was gathering the experience to order my life for happiness. Indeed, I accomplished the not unusual feat of solving each question in my mind long before it presented itself to me in life, and of being beaten and bewildered just the same. But after a few tastes of the slaughter dish, I had had enough. Here, I said, experience is not worth the getting. It's not a thing that happens pleasantly to a passive you. It's a wall that an active you runs up against. So I wrapped myself in what I thought was my invulnerable skepticism, and decided that my education was complete. But it was too late. Protect myself as I might, by making no new ties with a tragic and predestined humanity, I was lost with the rest. I had traded the fight against love for the fight against loneliness, the fight against life for the fight against death. He broke off to give emphasis to his last observation. After a moment, he yawned and resumed. I suppose that the beginning of the second phase of my education was a ghastly dissatisfaction at being used in spite of myself for some inscrutable purpose, of whose ultimate goal I was unaware, if indeed there was an ultimate goal. It was a difficult choice. The schoolmistress seemed to be saying, we're going to play football and nothing but football. If you don't want to play football, you can't play at all. What was I to do? The playtime was so short. You see, I felt that we were even denied what consolation there might have been in being a figment of a corporate man rising from his knees. Do you think that I leaped at this pessimism, grasped it as a sweetly smug, superior thing, no more depressing, really, than, say, a grey autumn day before a fire? I don't think I did that. I was a great deal too warm for that, and too alive. For it seemed to me that there was no ultimate goal for man. Man was beginning a grotesque and bewildered fight with nature, nature that, by the divine and magnificent accident, had brought us to where we could fly in her face. She had invented ways to rid the race of the inferior, and thus give the remainder strength to fill her higher, or, let us say, her more amusing, though still unconscious and accidental, intentions. And, actuated by the highest gifts of the Enlightenment, we were seeking to circumvent her, in this republic I saw the black beginning to mingle with the white. In Europe there was taking place an economic catastrophe to save three or four diseased and wretchedly governed races from the one mastery that might organize them for material prosperity. We produce a Christ who can raise up the leper, and presently the breed of the leper is the salt of the earth. If anyone can find any lesson in that, let him stand forth. There's only one lesson to be learned from life anyway— interrupted Gloria, not in contradiction, but in a sort of melancholy agreement. "'What's that?' demanded Maury sharply. "'That there's no lesson to be learned from life.' After a short silence, Maury said, "'Young Gloria, the beautiful and merciless lady, first looked at the world with the fundamental sophistication I have struggled to attain, that Anthony never will attain, that Dick will never fully understand.' There was a disgusted groan from the apple barrel. 
Anthony, grown accustomed to the dark, could see plainly the flash of Richard Caramel's yellow eye, and the look of resentment on his face as he cried, "'You're crazy! By your own statement I should have attained some experience by trying.' "'Trying what?' cried Moray fiercely, trying to pierce the darkness of political idealism with some wild, despairing urge towards truth, sitting day after day supine in a rigid chair and infinitely removed from life, staring at the tip of a steeple through the trees, trying to separate, definitely and for all time, the knowable from the unknowable, trying to take a piece of actuality and give it glamour from your own soul to make for that inexpressible quality it possessed in life and lost in transit to paper or canvas, struggling in a laboratory through weary years for one iota of relative truth in a mass of wheels or a test tube, have you? Moray paused, and in his answer, when it came, there was a measure of weariness, a bitter overnote that lingered for a moment in those three minds, before it floated up and off, like a bubble bound for the moon. Not I, he said softly. I was born tired, but with the quality of mother wit, the gift of women like Gloria. To that, for all my talking and listening, my waiting in vain for the eternal generality that seems to lie just beyond every argument and every speculation, to that I have added not one jot. In the distance, a deep sound that had been audible for some moments identified itself by a plaintive mooing like that of a gigantic cow and by the pearly spot of a headlight apparent half a mile away. It was a steam-driven train this time, rumbling and groaning, and as it tumbled by with a monstrous complaint, it sent a shower of sparks and cinders over the platform. Not one jot. Again Moray's voice dropped down to them as from a great height. What a feeble thing intelligence is, with its short steps, its waverings, its pacings back and forth, its disastrous retreats. Intelligence is a mere instrument of circumstances. There are people who say that intelligence must have built the universe. Why, intelligence never built a steam engine. Intelligence is little more than the short foot rule by which we measure the infinite achievements of circumstances. I could quote you the philosophy of the hour, but, for all we know, fifty years may see a complete reversal of this abnegation that's absorbing the intellectuals today, the triumph of Christ over Anatole France. He hesitated, and then added, But all I know, the tremendous importance of myself to me, and the necessity of acknowledging that importance to myself, these things the wise and lovely Gloria was born knowing, these things and the painful futility of trying to know anything else. Well, I started to tell you of my education, didn't I? But I learned nothing, you see, very little, even about myself, and if I had, I should die with my lips shut, and the guard on my fountain pen, as the wisest men have done since, oh, since the failure of a certain matter, a strange matter, by the way. It concerns some skeptics who thought they were far-sighted, just as you and I. Let me tell you about them, by way of an evening prayer, before you all drop off to sleep. Once upon a time, all the men of mind and genius in the world became of one belief, that is to say, of no belief. But it wearied them to think that, within a few years of their death, many cults and systems and prognostications would be ascribed to them, which they had never meditated nor intended. So they said to one another, Let's join together and make a great book that will last forever to mock the credulity of man. Let's persuade our more erotic poets to write about the delights of the flesh and induce some of our robust journalists to contribute stories of famous amours. We'll include all the most preposterous old wives' tales, now current. We'll choose the keenest satirist alive to compile a deity from all the deities worshipped by mankind, a deity who will be more magnificent than any of them, and yet so weakly human that he'll become a byword for laughter the world over, and will ascribe to him all sorts of jokes and vanities and rages, in which he'll be supposed to indulge for his own diversion, so that the people will read our book and ponder it, and there'll be no more nonsense in the world. Finally, let us take care that the book possesses all the virtues of style, so that it may last forever as a witness to our profound skepticism and our universal irony. So the men did, and they died. But the book lived always, 
so beautifully had it been written and so astounding the quality of imagination with which these men of mind and genius had endowed it they had neglected to give it a name but after they were dead it became known as the bible when he concluded there was no comment some damp languor sleeping on the air of night seemed to have bewitched them all as i said i started on the story of my education but my highballs are dead and the night's almost over and soon there'll be an awful jabbering going on everywhere in the trees and the houses in the two little stores over there behind the station and there'll be a great running up and down upon the earth for a few hours well he concluded with a laugh thank god we four can all pass to our eternal rest knowing we've left the world a little better for having lived in it a breeze sprang up blowing with it faint wisps of life which flattened against the sky your remarks grow rambling and inconclusive said anthony sleepily you expected one of those miracles of illumination by which you say your most brilliant and pregnant things in exactly the setting that should provoke the ideal symposium meanwhile gloria has shown her far-sighted attachment by falling asleep i can tell that by the fact that she has managed to concentrate her entire weight upon my broken body have i bored you inquired maury looking down with some concern no you have disappointed us you've shot a lot of arrows but did you shoot any birds i leave the birds to dick said maury hurriedly i speak erratically in dissociated fragments you can get no rise from me muttered dick my mind is full of any number of material things i want a warm bath too much to worry about the importance of my work or what proportion of us are pathetic figures dawn made itself felt in a gathering whiteness eastward over the river and an intermittent cheeping in the nearby trees quarter to five sighed dick almost another hour to wait look two gone he was pointing to anthony whose lids had sagged over his eyes sleep of the patch family but in another five minutes despite the amplifying cheeps and chirrups his own head had fallen forward nodded down twice thrice only maury noble remained awake seated upon the station roof his eyes wide open and fixed with fatigued intensity upon the distant nucleus of morning he was wondering at the unreality of ideas at the fading radiance of existence at the little absorptions that were creeping avidly into his life like rats into a ruined house he was sorry for no one now on monday morning there would be his business and later there would be a girl of another class whose whole life he was these were the things nearest his heart in the strangeness of the brightening day it seemed presumptuous that with this feeble broken instrument of his mind he had ever tried to think there was the sun letting down great glowing masses of heat there was life active and snarling moving about them like a fly swarm the dark pants of smoke from the engine a crisp all aboard and a bell ringing confusedly maury saw eyes in the milk train staring curiously up at him heard gloria and anthony in quick controversy as to whether he should go to the city with her then another clamor and she was gone and the three men pale as ghosts were standing alone upon the platform while a grimy coal heaver went down the road on top of a motor truck caroling hoarsely at the summer morning end of book two chapter two part three of three Book Two, Chapter Three, Part One of Two of *The Beautiful and Damned*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *The Beautiful and Damned* by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Book Two, Chapter Three, *The Broken Lute*, Part One of Two. It is seven thirty of an August evening. The windows in the living room of the gray house are wide open, patiently exchanging the tainted inner atmosphere of liquor and smoke for the fresh drowsiness of the late hot dusk. There are dying flower scents upon the air, so thin, so fragile, 
as to hint already of a summer laid away in time. But August is still proclaimed relentlessly by a thousand crickets around the side porch, and by one who has broken into the house and concealed himself confidently behind a bookcase, from time to time shrieking of his cleverness and his indomitable will. The room itself is in messy disorder. On the table is a dish of fruit, which is real but appears artificial. Around it are grouped an ominous assortment of decanters, glasses, and heaped ash-trays, the latter still raising wavy smoke ladders into the stale air, the effect on the whole needing but a skull to resemble that venerable chromo, once a fixture in every den, which presents the appendages to the life of pleasure with delightful and awe-inspiring sentiment. After a while, the springly solo of the super-cricket is interrupted rather than joined by a new sound, the melancholy wail of an erratically fingered flute. It is obvious that the musician is practicing rather than performing, for from time to time the gnarled strain breaks off and, after an interval of indistinct mutterings, recommences. Just prior to the seventh false start, a third sound contributes to the subdued discord. It is a taxi outside. A minute's silence, then the taxi again, its boisterous retreat almost obliterating the scrape of footsteps on the cinder walk. The doorbell shrieks alarmingly through the house. From the kitchen enters a small, fatigued Japanese, hastily buttoning a servant's coat of white duck. He opens the front screen door and admits a handsome young man of thirty, clad in the sort of well-intentioned clothes peculiar to those who serve mankind. To his whole personality clings a well-intentioned air. His glance about the room is compounded by curiosity and a determined optimism. When he looks at Tana, the entire burden of uplifting the godless Oriental is in his eyes. His name is Frederick E. Paramore. He was at Harvard with Anthony, where, because of the initials of their surnames, they were constantly placed next to each other in classes. A fragmentary acquaintance developed, but since that time they have never met. Nevertheless, Paramore enters the room with a certain air of arriving for the evening. Tenna is answering a question. Tenna, grinning with ingratiation. Gone to inn for dinner. Be back half hour. Gone since half past six. Paramore, regarding the glasses on the table. Have they company? Tenna, yes, company. Mr. Caramel, Mr. and Mrs. Baines, Miss Kane, all stay here. Paramore, I see kindly. They've been having a spree, I see. Tana, I know on Stan. Paramore, they've been having a fling. Tana, yes, they have drink. Oh, many, many, many drink. Paramore, receding delicately from the subject. Didn't I hear the sounds of music as I approached the house? Tana, with a spasmodic giggle. Yes, I play. Paramore, one of the Japanese instruments. He is quite obviously a subscriber to National Geographic magazine. Tana. I play flute, Japanese flute. Paramore. What song were you playing? One of your Japanese melodies? Tana, his brow undergoing preposterous contraction. I play train song, how you call railroad song. So call in my country. Like train, it goes so. That mean whistle, train start. Then go so. That mean train go, go like that. Very nice song in my country, children's song. Paramore, it sounded very nice. It is apparent at this point that only a gigantic effort at control restrains Tana from rushing upstairs for his postcards, including the six made in America. Tana, I fix highball for gentlemen? Paramore, no thanks, I don't use it. He smiles. Tana withdraws into the kitchen, leaving the intervening door slightly ajar. From the crevice, there suddenly issues again the melody of the Japanese train song, this time not a practice, surely, but a performance, a lusty, spirited performance. The phone rings. Tana, absorbed in his harmonics, gives no heed, so Paramore takes up the receiver. Paramore. Hello? Yes? No, he's not here now, but he'll be back any moment. Butterworth? Hello? I didn't quite catch the name. Hello, hello, hello? Hello? Huh. The phone obstinately refuses to yield up any more sound. Paramore replaces the receiver. At this point, the taxi motif re-enters, 
wafting with it a second young man. He carries a suitcase and opens the front door without ringing the bell. Maury, in the hall. Oh, Anthony! Yo-ho! He comes into the large room and sees Paramore. How do? Paramore, gazing at him with gathering intensity. Is this, is this Maury noble? Maury, that's it. He advances, smiling and holding out his hand. How are you, old boy? Haven't seen you for years. He has vaguely associated the face with Harvard, but is not even positive about that. The name, if he ever knew it, he has long since forgotten. However, with a fine sensitiveness and an equally commendable charity, Paramore recognizes the fact and tactfully relieves the situation. Paramore. You forgotten Fred Paramore? We were both in old Unc Robert's history class. Maury. No, I haven't, Unc. I mean, Fred. Fred was, I mean, Unc was a great old fellow, wasn't he? Paramore, nodding his head humorously several times. Great old character, great old character. Maury, after a short pause. Yes, he was. Where's Anthony? Paramore, the Japanese servant told me he was at some inn. Having dinner, I suppose. Maury, looking at his watch. Gone long? Paramore, I guess so. The Japanese told me they'd be back shortly. Maury, suppose we have a drink. Paramore, no thanks, I don't use it. He smiles. Maury, mind if I do? Yawning as he helps himself from a bottle. What have you been doing since you left college? Paramore, oh, many things. I've led a very active life, knocked about here and there. His tone implies anything from lion stalking to organized crime. Maury, oh, been over to Europe? Paramore, no, I haven't, unfortunately. Maury, I guess we'll all go over before long. Paramore, do you really think so? Maury, sure. Country's been fed on sensationalism for more than two years. Everybody getting restless. Want to have some fun. Paramore, then you don't believe any ideals are at stake? Maury, nothing of much importance. People want excitement every so often. Paramore, intently. It's very interesting to hear you say that. Now, I was talking to a man who'd been over there. During the ensuing testament, left to be filled in by the reader with such phrases as saw with his own eyes, splendid spirit of France, and salvation of civilization, Maury sits with lowered eyelids, dispassionately bored. Maury, at the first available opportunity. By the way, do you happen to know there's a German agent in this very house? Paramore, smiling cautiously. Are you serious? Maury, absolutely. Feel it my duty to warn you. Paramore, convinced. A governess? Maury, in a whisper, indicating the kitchen with his thumb. Tana! That's not his real name. I understand he constantly gets mail addressed to Lieutenant Emile Tannenbaum. Paramore, laughing with hearty tolerance. You are kidding me. Maury, I may be accusing him falsely but you haven't told me what you've been doing. Paramore, for one thing, writing. Maury, fiction? Paramore, no, non-fiction. Maury, what's that? A sort of literature that's half fiction and half fact? Paramore, oh, I've confined myself to fact. I've been doing a good deal of social service work. Maury, oh. An immediate glow of suspicion leaps into his eyes. It is as though Paramore had announced himself as an amateur pickpocket. Paramore, at present I'm doing service work in Stamford. Only last week someone told me that Anthony Patch lived so near. They are interrupted by a clamor outside, unmistakable as that of two sexes in conversation and laughter. Then there enter the room in a body Anthony, Gloria, Richard Caramel, Muriel Kane, Rachel Barnes, and Rodman Barnes, her husband. They surge about Maury, illogically replying, fine, to his general, hello. Anthony, meanwhile, approaches his other guest. Anthony, well, I'll be darned. How are you? Mighty glad to see you. Paramore, it's good to see you, Anthony. I'm stationed in Stamford, so I thought I'd run over. Roguishly, we have to work to beat the devil most of the time, so we're entitled to a few hours vacation. In an agony of concentration, Anthony tries to recall the name. After a struggle of parturition, his memory gives up the fragment, Fred, around which he hastily builds the sentence, Glad you did, Fred. 
Meanwhile, the slight hush prefatory to an introduction has fallen upon the company. Maury, who could help, prefers to look on in malicious enjoyment. Anthony, in desperation, Ladies and gentlemen, this is... this is Fred. Muriel, with obliging levity. Hello, Fred. Richard Caramel and Paramore greet each other intimately by their first names, the latter recollecting that Dick was one of the men in his class who had never before troubled to speak to him. Dick fatuously imagines that Paramore is someone he has previously met in Anthony's house. The three young women go upstairs. Moray, in an undertone to Dick, haven't seen Muriel since Anthony's wedding. Dick, she's now in her prime. Her latest is, I'll say so. Anthony struggles for a while with Paramore, and at length attempts to make the conversation general by asking everyone to have a drink. Maury, I've done pretty well on this bottle. I've gone from proof down to distillery. He indicates the words on the label. Anthony, to Paramore, never can tell when these two will turn up. Said goodbye to them one afternoon at five, and darned if they didn't appear about two in the morning. A big hired touring car from New York drove up to the door, and out they stepped, drunk as lords, of course. In an ecstasy of consideration, Paramore regards the cover of a book which he holds in his hand. Maury and Dick exchange a glance. Dick, innocently, to Paramore. You work here in town? Paramore. No, I'm in the Laird Street settlement in Stamford to Anthony. You have no idea the amount of poverty in these small Connecticut towns, Italians and other immigrants, Catholics mostly, you know, so it's very hard to reach them. Anthony, politely, lot of crime? Paramore, not so much crime as ignorance and dirt. Maury, that's my theory, immediate electrocution of all ignorant and dirty people. I'm all for the criminals, give color to life, but trouble is, if you started to punish ignorance, You'd have to begin in the first families, then you could take up the moving picture people, and finally Congress and the clergy. Paramore, smiling uneasily, I was speaking of the more fundamental ignorance, of even our language. Maury, thoughtfully, I suppose it is rather hard. Can't even keep up with the new poetry. Paramore, it's only when the settlement work has gone on for months that one realizes how bad things are. As our secretary said to me, your fingernails never seem dirty until you wash your hands. Of course, we're already attracting much attention. Maury, rudely, as your secretary might say, if you stuff paper into a grate, it'll burn brightly for a moment. At this point, Gloria, freshly tinted and less full of admiration and entertainment, rejoins the party, followed by her two friends. For several moments, the conversation becomes entirely fragmentary. Gloria calls Anthony aside. Gloria, please don't drink so much, Anthony. Anthony, why? Gloria, because you're so simple when you're drunk. Anthony, good Lord, what's the matter now? Gloria, after a pause during which her eyes gaze coolly into his. Several things. In the first place, why do you insist on paying for everything? Both those men have more money than you. Anthony, why, Gloria? They're my guests. Gloria, that's no reason why you should pay for a bottle of champagne Rachel Barnes smashed. Dick tried to fix that second taxi bill, and you wouldn't let him. Anthony, why, Gloria, Gloria, when we have to keep selling bonds to even pay our bills, it's time to cut down on excess generosities. Moreover, I wouldn't be quite so attentive to Rachel Barnes. Her husband doesn't like it any more than I do. Anthony, why, Gloria, Gloria, mimicking him sharply. Why, Gloria, but that's happened a little too often this summer. With every pretty woman you meet, it's grown to be a sort of habit, and I'm not going to stand it. If you can play around, I can too. Then, as an afterthought, by the way, this Fred person isn't a second Joe Hull, is he? Anthony, heavens no. He probably came up to get me to wheedle some money out of grandfather for his flock. Gloria turns away from a very depressed Anthony and returns to her guests. By nine o'clock, these can be divided into two classes, those who have been drinking consistently and those who have taken little or nothing. In the second group are the Barneses, Muriel and Frederick E. Paramore. Muriel, I wish I could write. 
I get these ideas, but I never seem to be able to put them into words. Dick. As Goliath said, he understood how David felt, but he couldn't express himself. The remark was immediately adopted for a motto by the Philistines. Muriel. I don't get you. I must be getting stupid in my old age. Gloria. Weaving unsteadily among the company like an exhilarated angel. If anyone's hungry, there's some French pastry on the dining room table. Maury. Can't tolerate those Victorian designs it comes in. Muriel, violently amused. I'll say you're tight, Moray. Her bosom is still a pavement that she offers to the hoofs of many passing stallions, hoping that their iron shoes may strike even a spark of romance in the darkness. Messieurs Barnes and Paramore have been engaged in conversation upon some wholesome subject, a subject so wholesome that Mr. Barnes has been trying for several moments to creep into the more tainted air around the central lounge, whether Paramore is lingering in the grey house out of politeness or curiosity, or in order at some future time to make a sociological report on the decadence of American life, it is problematical. Maury. Fred, I imagined you were very broad-minded. Paramore. I am. Muriel. Me too. I believe one religion's as good as another in everything. Paramore. There's some good in all religions. Muriel. I'm a Catholic, but, as I always say, I'm not working at it. Paramore, with a tremendous burst of tolerance, the Catholic religion is a very, a very powerful religion. Maury, well, such a broad-minded man should consider the raised plane of sensation and the stimulated optimism contained in this cocktail. Paramore, taking the drink rather defiantly, thanks, I'll try one. Maury, one, outrageous! Here we have a class of 1910 reunion, and you refuse to be even a little pickled. Come on. Here's a health to King Charles. Here's a health to King Charles. Bring the bowl that you boast. Paramore joins in with a hearty voice. Maury, fill the cup, Frederick. You know everything's subordinated to nature's purposes with us, and her purpose with you is to make you a rip-roaring tippler. Paramore, if a fellow can drink like a gentleman, Maury, what is a gentleman, anyway? Anthony, a man who never has pins under his coat lapel. Maury, nonsense. A man's social rank is determined by the amount of bread he eats in a sandwich. Dick, he's a man who prefers the first edition of a book to the last edition of a newspaper. Rachel, a man who never gives an impersonation of a dope fiend. Maury, an American who can fool an English butler into thinking he's one. Muriel, a man who comes from a good family and went to Yale or Harvard or Princeton and has money and dances well and all that. Maury, at last, the perfect definition. Cardinal Newman's is now a back number. Paramore, I think we ought to look on the question more broad-mindedly. Was it Abraham Lincoln who said that a gentleman is one who never inflicts pain? Maury, it's attributed, I believe, to General Lindendorf. Paramore, surely you're joking. Maury, have another drink. Paramore, I oughtn't to, lowering his voice from Maury's ear alone. What if I were to tell you this is the third drink I've ever taken in my life? Dick starts the phonograph, which provokes Muriel to rise and sway from side to side, her elbows against her ribs, her forearms perpendicular to her body and out like fins. Muriel, oh, let's take up the rugs and dance. This suggestion is received by Anthony and Gloria with interior groans and sickly smiles of acquiescence. Muriel, come on, you lazy bones, get up and move the furniture back. Dick, wait till I finish my drink. Maury, intent on his purpose towards Paramour. I'll tell you what, let's each fill one glass, drink it off, and then we'll dance. A wave of protest which breaks against the rock of Maury's insistence. Muriel, my head is simply going round now. Rachel, in an undertone to Anthony, did Gloria tell you to stay away from me? Anthony, confused, why, certainly not, of course not. Rachel smiles at him inscrutably. Two years have given her a sort of hard, well-groomed beauty. Maury, holding up his glass, here's to the defeat of democracy and the fall of Christianity. Muriel, now really... She flashes a mock reproachful glance at Maury, and then drinks. 
They all drink, with varying degrees of difficulty. Muriel, clear the floor! It seems inevitable that this process is to be gone through, so Anthony and Gloria join in the great moving of tables, piling of chairs, rolling of carpets, and breaking of lamps. When the furniture has been stacked in ugly masses at the sides, there appears a space about eight feet square. Muriel, oh, let's have music. Maury, Tana will render the love song of an eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist. Amid some confusion due to the fact that Tana has retired for the night, preparations are made for the performance. The pajama Japanese, flute in hand, is wrapped in a comforter and placed in a chair atop one of the tables, where he makes a ludicrous and grotesque spectacle. Paramore is perceptibly drunk, and so enraptured with the notion that he increases the effect by simulating funny paper staggers and even venturing on an occasional hiccough. Paramore, to Gloria, want to dance with me? Gloria, no sir, want to do the swan dance, can you do it? Paramore, sure, do them all. Gloria, all right, you start from that side of the room and I'll start from this. Muriel, let's go. Then Bedlam creeps screaming out of the bottles. Tana plunges into the recondite mazes of the train song, the plaintive tootle toot toot blending its melancholy cadences with the poor butterfly tink a tink by the blossoms waiting of the phonograph. Muriel is too weak with laughter to do more than cling desperate to Barnes, who, dancing with the ominous rigidity of an army officer, tramps without humor around the small space. Anthony is trying to hear Rachel's whisper without attracting Gloria's attention. But the grotesque, the unbelievable, the histrionic incident is about to occur, one of those incidents in which life seems set upon the passionate imitation of the lowest forms of literature. Paramore has been trying to emulate Gloria, and as the commotion reaches its height, he begins to spin around and round, more and more dizzily. He staggers, recovers, staggers again, then falls in the direction of the hall, almost into the arms of old Adam Patch, whose approach has been rendered inaudible by the pandemonium in the room. Adam Patch is very white. He leans upon a stick. The man with him is Edward Shuttleworth, and it is he who seizes Paramore by the shoulder and deflects the course of his fall away from the venerable philanthropist. The time required for quiet to descend upon the room like a monstrous pall may be estimated at two minutes, though for a short period after that the phonograph gags and the notes of the Japanese train song dribble from the end of Tana's flute. Of the nine people, only Barnes, Paramore, and Tana are unaware of the latecomer's identity. Of the nine, not one is aware that Adam Patch has that morning made a contribution of fifty thousand dollars to the cause of national prohibition. It is given to Paramore to break the gathering silence. The high tide of his life's depravity is reached in this incredible remark. Paramore, crawling rapidly toward the kitchen on his hands and knees, I'm not a guest here. I work here. Again silence falls, so deep now, so weighted with intolerably contagious apprehension, that Rachel gives a nervous little giggle, and Dick finds himself telling over and over a line from Swinburne, grotesquely appropriate to the scene. One gaunt, bleak blossom of scentless breath. Out of the hush, the voice of Anthony, sober and strained, saying something to Adam Patch, then this too dies away. Shuttleworth passionately. Your grandfather thought he would motor over to see your house. I phoned from Rye and left a message. A series of little gasps, emanating, apparently, from nowhere, from no one, fall into the next pause. Anthony is the color of chalk. Gloria's lips are parted, and her level gaze at the old man is tense and frightened. There is not one smile in the room. Not one? Or does cross patches drawn mouth tremble slightly open to expose the even rows of his thin teeth? He speaks five mild and simple words. Adam Patch, we'll go back now, Shuttleworth. And that is all. He turns and, assisted by his cane, goes out through the hall, through the front door, and, with hellish portentousness, 
his uncertain footsteps crunch on the gravel path under the August moon. Retrospect In this extremity they were like two goldfish in a bowl from which all water had been drawn. They could not even swim across to each other. Gloria would be twenty-six in May. There was nothing, she had said, that she wanted, except to be young and beautiful for a long time, to be gay and happy, and to have money in love. She wanted what most women want, but she wanted it much more fiercely and passionately. She had been married over two years. At first there had been days of serene understanding, rising to ecstasies of proprietorship and pride. Alternating these periods had occurred sporadic hates, enduring a short hour, and forgetfulness lasting no longer than an afternoon. That had been for half a year. Then the serenity, the content, had become less jubilant, had become gray. Very rarely, with the spur of jealousy or forced separation, the ancient ecstasies returned. The apparent communion of soul and soul, the emotional excitement. It was possible for her to hate Anthony for as much as a full day, to be carelessly incensed at him for as long as a week. Recrimination had displaced affection as an indulgence, almost as an entertainment, and there were nights when they would go to sleep trying to remember who was angry and who should be reserved the next morning. And as the second year waned there had entered two new elements. Gloria realized that Anthony had become capable of utter indifference toward her, a temporary indifference, more than half lethargic, but one from which she could no longer stir him by a whispered word or a certain intimate smile. There were days when her caresses affected him as a sort of suffocation. She was conscious of these things. She never entirely admitted them to herself. It was only recently that she perceived that in spite of her adoration of him, her jealousy, her servitude, her pride, she fundamentally despised him, and her contempt blended indistinguishably with her other emotions. All this was her love, the vital and feminine illusion that had directed itself toward him one April night, many months before. On Anthony's part she was, in spite of these qualifications, his sole preoccupation. Had he lost her he would have been a broken man, wretchedly and sentimentally absorbed in her memory for the remainder of life. He seldom took pleasure in an entire day spent alone with her, except on occasions he preferred to have a third person with them. There were times when he felt if he were not left absolutely alone he would go mad. There were a few times when he definitely hated her. In his cups he was capable of short attractions toward other women, the hitherto suppressed outcroppings of an experimental temperament. That spring, that summer, they had speculated upon future happiness, how they were to travel from summer land to summer land, returning eventually to a gorgeous estate and possibly idyllic children, then entering diplomacy or politics, to accomplish, for a while, beautiful and important things, until finally, as a white-haired, beautifully silkily white-haired, couple, they were to loll about in serene glory, worshipped by the bourgeoisie of the land. These times were to begin, when we get our money. It was on such dreams, rather than on any satisfaction with their increasingly irregular, increasingly dissipated life, that their hope rested. On grey mornings, when the jests of the night before had shrunk to ribaldries, without wit or dignity, they could, after a fashion, bring out this batch of common hopes and count them over, then smile at each other and repeat, by way of clinching the matter, the terse yet sincere Nietzscheanism of Gloria's defiant, I don't care. Things had been slipping perceptibly. There was the money question, increasingly annoying, increasingly ominous. There was the realization that liquor had become a practical necessity to their amusement, not an uncommon phenomenon in the British aristocracy of a hundred years ago, but a somewhat alarming one in a civilization steadily becoming more temperate and more circumspect. Moreover, both of them seemed vaguely weaker in fiber, not so much in what they did as in their subtle reactions to the civilization about them. In Gloria had been born something that she had hitherto never needed, the skeleton, incomplete but nevertheless unmistakable, of her ancient abhorrence, a conscience. 
This admission to herself was coincidental with the slow decline of her physical courage. Then, on the August morning after Adam Patch's unexpected call, they awoke, nauseated and tired, dispirited with life, capable of only one pervasive emotion, fear. Panic. Well, Anthony sat up in bed and looked down at her. The corners of his lips were drooping with depression. His voice was strained and hollow. Her reply was to raise her hand to her mouth and begin a slow, precise nibbling at her finger. We've done it, he said after a pause. Then, as she was still silent, he became exasperated. Why don't you say something? What on earth do you want me to say? What are you thinking? Nothing. Then stop biting your finger. Ensued a short, confused discussion of whether or not she had been thinking. It seemed essential to Anthony that she should muse aloud upon last night's disaster. Her silence was a method of settling the responsibility on him. For her part, she saw no necessity for speech. The moment required that she should gnaw at her finger like a nervous child. I've got to fix up this damn mess with my grandfather, he said with uneasy conviction. A faint newborn respect was indicated by his use of my grandfather instead of grandpa. You can't, she affirmed abruptly. You can't ever. He'll never forgive you as long as he lives. Perhaps not, agreed Anthony miserably. Still, I might possibly square myself by some sort of reformation and all that sort of thing. He looked sick, she interrupted, pale as flour. He is sick. I told you that three months ago. I wish he died last week, she said petulantly. Inconsiderate old fool. Neither of them laughed. But let me just say, she added quietly, the next time I see you acting with any woman like you did with Rachel Barnes last night, I'll leave you, just like that. I'm simply not going to stand it. Anthony quailed. Oh, don't be absurd, he protested. You know there's no woman in the world for me except you. None, dearest. His attempt at a tender note failed miserably. The more imminent danger stalked back into the foreground. "'If I went to him,' suggested Anthony, and said with appropriate biblical quotations that I'd walked too long in the way of unrighteousness and at last seen the light, he broke off and glanced with a whimsical expression at his wife. "'I wonder what he'd do. I don't know.' She was speculating as to whether or not their guests would have the acumen to leave directly after breakfast. Not for a week did Anthony muster the courage to go to Tarrytown. The prospect was revolting, and left alone he would have been incapable of making the trip. But if his will had deteriorated in these past three years, so had his power to resist urging. Gloria compelled him to go. It was all very well to wait a week, she said, for that would give his grandfather's violent animosity time to cool, but to wait longer would be an error. It would give it a chance to harden. He went, in trepidation, and vainly. Adam Patch was not well, said Shuttleworth indignantly. Positive instructions had been given that no one was to see him. Before the ex-gin physician's vindictive eye, Anthony's front wilted. He walked out to his taxicab, with what was almost a slink, recovering only a little of his self-respect as he boarded the train, glad to escape, boy-like, to the wonder palaces of consolation that still rose and glittered in his own mind. Gloria was scornful when he returned to Marietta. Why had he not forced his way in? That was what she would have done. Between them they drafted a letter to the old man, and after considerable revision sent it off. It was half an apology, half a manufactured explanation. The letter was not answered. Came a day in September, a day slashed with alternate sun and rain, sun without warmth, rain without freshness. On that day they left the grey house, which had seen the flower of their love. Four trunks and three monstrous crates were piled in the dismantled room where, two years before, they had sprawled lazily, thinking in terms of dreams, remote, languorous content. The room echoed with emptiness. Gloria, in a new brown dress edged with fur, sat upon a trunk in silence, and Anthony walked nervously to and fro, smoking, as they waited for the truck that would take their things to the city. 
What are those? she demanded, pointing to some books piled on one of the crates. That's my old stamp collection, he confessed sheepily. I forgot to pack it. Anthony, it's so silly to carry it around. Well, I was looking through it the day we left the apartment last spring, and I decided not to store it. Can't you sell it? Haven't we enough junk? I'm sorry, he said humbly. With a thunderous rattling, the truck rolled up to the door. Gloria shook her fist defiantly at the four walls. I'm so glad to go, she cried, so glad. Oh, my God, how I hate this house. So the brilliant and beautiful lady went up with her husband to New York. On the very train that bore them away, they quarreled. Her bitter words had the frequency, the regularity, the inevitability of the stations they passed. "'Don't be cross,' begged Anthony piteously. "'We've got nothing but each other, after all.' "'We haven't even that most of the time,' cried Gloria. "'When haven't we?' "'A lot of times. Beginning with one occasion on the station platform at Redgate. You don't mean to say that—' "'No,' she interrupted coolly. "'I don't brood over it. It came and went, and when it went it took something with it.' She finished abruptly. Anthony sat in silence, confused, depressed. The drab visions of Trainside, Mamora Neck, Larchmont, Rye, Pelham Manor succeeded each other with intervals of bleak and shoddy wastes posing ineffectually as country. He found himself remembering how, on one summer morning, they too had started from New York in search of happiness. They had never expected to find it, perhaps, yet, in itself, that quest had been happier than anything he expected forevermore. Life, it seemed, must be a setting up of props around one, otherwise it was a disaster. There was no rest, no quiet. He had been futile in longing to drift and dream. No one drifted except to maelstroms. No one dreamed, without his dreams becoming fantastical nightmares of indecision and regret. Pelham. They had quarreled in Pelham because Gloria must drive and when she set her little foot on the accelerator, the car had jumped off spunkily, and their two heads had jerked back, like marionettes worked by a single string. The Bronx, the houses gathering and gleaming in the sun, which was falling now through the wide, refulgent skies and tumbling caravans of light down the streets. New York, he supposed, was home, the city of luxury and mystery, of preposterous hopes and exotic dreams, here, on the outskirts, absurd stucco palaces reared themselves in the cool sunset, posed for an instant in cool unreality, glided off far away, succeeded by the mazed confusion of the Harlem River. The train moved in through the deepening twilight, above and past half a hundred cheerful sweating streets of the Upper East Side, each one passing the car window like the space between the spokes of a gigantic wheel each one with its vigorous, colorful revelation of poor children swarming in feverish activity like vivid ants in alleys of red sand. From the tenement windows leaned rotund, moon-shaped mothers as constellations of this sordid heaven, women like dark, imperfect jewels, women like vegetables, women like great bags of abominably dirty laundry. "'I like these streets,' observed Anthony aloud. I always feel as though it's a performance being staged for me, as though the second I've passed they'll all stop leaping and laughing and, instead, grow very sad, remembering how poor they are, and retreat with bowed heads into their houses. You often get that effect abroad, but seldom in this country. Down in a tall, busy street he read a dozen Jewish names on a line of stores. In the door of each stood a dark little man, watching the passers from intent eyes eyes gleaming with suspicion, with pride, with clarity, with cupidity, with comprehension. New York, he could not dissociate it now from the slow upward creep of this people, the little stores growing, expanding, consolidating, moving, watched over with hawk's eyes and a bee's attention to detail. They slathered out on all sides. It was impressive. In perspective, it was tremendous." Gloria's voice broke in with strange appropriateness upon his thoughts. I wonder where Blockman's been this summer. End of Book Two, Chapter Three, The Broken Lute, Part One of Two.
Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter Three The Broken Loot. Part Two of Two. The Apartment. After the sureties of youth, there sets in a period of intense and intolerable complexity. With the soda jerker, this period is so short as to be almost negligible. Men higher in this scale hold out longer in the attempt to preserve the ultimate niceties of relationship, to retain impractical ideas of integrity. But by the late twenties, the business has grown too intricate, and what has hitherto been imminent and confusing has become gradually remote and dim. Routine comes down like twilight on a harsh landscape, softening it until it is tolerable. The complexity is too subtle, too varied. The values are changing utterly with each lesion of vitality. It has begun to appear that we can learn nothing from the past with which to face the future, so we cease to be impulsive, convincible men, interested in what is ethically true by fine margins. We substitute rules of conduct for ideas of integrity, we value safety above romance, we become, quite unconsciously, pragmatic. It is left to the few to be persistently concerned with the nuances of relationships, and even this few only in certain hours especially set aside for the task. Anthony Patch had ceased to be an individual of mental adventure, of curiosity, and had become an individual of bias and prejudice, with a longing to be emotionally undisturbed. This gradual change had taken place through the past several years, accelerated by a succession of anxieties preying on his mind. There was, first of all, the sense of waste, always dormant in his heart, now awakened by the circumstances of his position. In his moments of insecurity, he was haunted by the suggestion that life might be, after all, significant. In his early twenties, the conviction of the futility of effort, of the wisdom of abnegation, had been confirmed by the philosophies he had admired, as well as by his association with Maury Noble, and later with his wife. Yet there had been occasions, just before his first meeting with Gloria, for example, and when his grandfather had suggested he should go abroad, as a war correspondent, upon which his dissatisfaction had driven him almost to a positive step. One day, just before they left Marietta for the last time, carelessly turning over the pages of a Harvard alumni bulletin, he had found a column which told him what his contemporaries had been about in this six years since graduation. Most of them were in business, it was true, and several were converting the heathen of China or America to a nebulous Protestantism. But a few, he found, were working constructively at jobs that were neither sinecures nor routines, there was Calvin Boyd, for instance, who, though barely out of medical school, had discovered a new treatment for typhus, had shipped abroad, and was mitigating some of the civilization that the great powers had brought to Servia. There was Eugene Bronson, whose articles in the New Democracy were stamping him as a man with ideas transcending both vulgar timelines and popular hysteria. There was a man named Daly, who had been suspended from the faculty of a righteous university, for preaching Marxian doctrines in the classroom. In art, science, politics, he saw the authentic personalities of his time emerging. There was even Severance, the quarterback, who had given up his life rather neatly and gracefully with the Foreign Legion on the Aisne. He laid down the magazine and thought for a while about these diverse men. In the days of his integrity, he would have defended his attitude to the last, an Epicurus in Nirvana, he would have cried that to struggle was to believe, to believe was to limit. He would as soon have become a churchgoer, because the prospect of immortality gratified him, as he would have considered entering the leather business, because the intensity of the competition would have kept him from unhappiness. But at present he had no such delicate scruples. This autumn, as his twenty-ninth year began, he was inclined to close his mind to many things, to avoid prying deeply into motives, and first causes, and mostly to long passionately for security from the world and from himself. He hated to be alone. 
As has been said, he often dreaded being alone with Gloria. Because of this chasm, which his grandfather's visit had opened before him, and the consequent revulsion from his late mode of life, it was inevitable that he should look around in this suddenly hostile city for the friends and environments that had once seemed the warmest and most secure. His first step was a desperate attempt to get back his old apartment. In the spring of 1912, he had signed a four-year lease at 1700 a year with an option of renewal. This lease had expired the previous May. When he had first rented the rooms, they had been mere potentialities, scarcely to be discerned as that. But Anthony had seen into these potentialities and arranged in the lease that he and the landlord should each spend a certain amount in improvements. Rents had gone up in the past four years, and last spring, when Anthony had waived his option, the landlord, a Mr. Sewenberg, had realized that he could get a much bigger price for what was now a prepossessing apartment. Accordingly, when Anthony approached him on the subject in September, he was met with Sewenberg's offer of a three-year lease at twenty-five hundred a year. This, it seemed to Anthony, was outrageous. It meant that well over a third of their income would be consumed in rent. In vain, he argued that his own money, his own ideas in the repartitioning, had made the rooms attractive. In vain, he offered two thousand dollars, twenty-two hundred, though they could ill afford it. Mr. Sewenberg was obdurate. It seemed that two other gentlemen were considering it. Just that sort of an apartment was in demand at the moment, and it would scarcely be business to give it to Mr. Patch. Besides, though he had never mentioned it before, several of the other tenants had complained of noise during the previous winter, singing and dancing late at night, that sort of thing. Internally raging, Anthony hurried back to the Ritz to report his discomfiture to Gloria. "'I can just see you,' she stormed, letting him back you down. "'What could I say? You could have told him what he was. I wouldn't have stood it. No other man in the world would have stood it. You just let people order you around and cheat you and bully you and take advantage of you as if you were a silly little boy. It's absurd.' "'Oh, for heaven's sake, don't lose your temper. I know, Anthony, but you are such an ass.' Well, possibly. Anyway, we can't afford that apartment, but we can afford it better than living here at the Ritz. You were the one who insisted on coming here. Yes, because I knew you'd be miserable in a cheap hotel. Of course I would. At any rate, we've got to find a place to live. How much can we pay? she demanded. Well, we can pay even his price if we sell more bonds, but we agreed last night that until I had gotten something definite to do, we— Oh, I know all that. I asked you how much we can pay out of just our income. They say you ought not to pay more than a fourth. How much is a fourth? One hundred and fifty a month. Do you mean to say we've only got six hundred dollars coming in every month? A subdued note crept into her voice. Of course, he answered angrily. Do you think we've gone on spending more than twelve thousand a year without cutting way into our capital? I knew we'd sold bonds, but have we spent that much a year? How did we? Her awe increased. Oh, I'll look in those careful account books we kept, he remarked ironically, then added, two rents a good part of the time, clothes, travel, why, each of those springs in California cost about four thousand dollars. That darn car was an expense from start to finish, and parties and amusements and, oh, one thing and another. They were both excited now, and inordinately depressed. The situation seemed worse in the actual telling Gloria than it had when he had first made the discovery himself. "'You've got to make some money,' she said suddenly. "'I know it.' "'And you've got to make another attempt to see your grandfather.' "'I will.' "'When?' "'When we get settled.' This eventuality occurred a week later. They rented a small apartment on 57th Street at 150 a month. It included bedroom, living room, kitchenette, and bath in a thin, white stone apartment house. And though the rooms were too small to display Anthony's best furniture, they were clean, new, and, in a blonde and sanitary way, not unattractive. Bounds had gone abroad to enlist in the British Army, and in his place they tolerated, rather than enjoyed, the services of a gaunt, big-boned Irish woman, whom Gloria loathed because she discussed the glories of Sinn Féin as she served breakfast. 
but they had vowed they would have no more Japanese, and English servants were for the present hard to obtain. Like Bounds, the woman prepared only breakfast. Their other meals they took at restaurants and hotels. What finally drove Anthony post-haste up to Tarrytown was an announcement in several New York papers that Adam Patch, the multimillionaire, the philanthropist, the venerable uplifter, was seriously ill and not expected to recover. The Kitten Anthony could not see him. The doctor's instructions were that he was to talk to no one, said Mr. Shuttleworth, who offered kindly to take any message that Anthony might care to entrust with him and deliver it to Adam Patch when his condition permitted. But by obvious innuendo, he confirmed Anthony's melancholy inference that the prodigal grandson would be particularly unwelcome at the bedside. At one point in the conversation, Anthony, with Gloria's positive instructions in mind, made a move as though to brush by the secretary, but Shuttleworth, with a smile, squared his brawny shoulders, and Anthony saw how futile such an attempt would be. Miserably intimidated, he returned to New York, where husband and wife passed a restless week. A little incident that occurred one evening indicated to what tension their nerves were drawn. Walking home along a cross street after dinner, Anthony noticed a night-bound cat prowling near a railing. I always have an instinct to kick a cat, he said idly. I like them. I yielded to it once. When? Oh, years ago, before I met you. One night between the acts of a show, cold night, like this, and I was a little tight, one of the first times I was ever tight, he added. The poor little beggar was looking for a place to sleep, I guess, and I was in a mean mood, so it took my fancy to kick it. Oh, the poor kitty, cried Gloria, sincerely moved. Inspired with the narrative instinct, Anthony enlarged on the theme. It was pretty bad, he admitted. The poor little beast turned around and looked at me rather plaintively, as though hoping I'd pick him up and be kind to him. He was really just a kitten, and before he knew it, a big foot launched out at him and caught his little back. Oh! Gloria's cry was full of anguish. It was such a cold night, he continued perversely, keeping his voice upon a melancholy tone. I guess it expected kindness from somebody, and it got only pain. He broke off suddenly. Gloria was sobbing. They had reached home, and when they entered the apartment she threw herself upon the lounge, crying as though he had struck at her very soul. "'Oh, the poor little kitty!' she repeated piteously. "'The poor little kitty, so cold! Gloria, don't come near me! Please, don't come near me! You killed the soft little kitty!' Touched, Anthony knelt beside her. "'Dear,' he said. "'Oh, Gloria, darling, it isn't true. I invented it, every word of it.' but she would not believe him. There had been something in the details he had chosen to describe that made her cry herself to sleep that night, for the kitten, for Anthony, for herself, for the pain and bitterness and cruelty of all the world. The Passing of an American Moralist Old Adam died on a midnight of late November with a pious compliment to his God on his thin lips. He, who had been flattered so much, faded out flattering the omnipotent abstraction, which he fancied he might have angered in the more lascivious moments of his youth. It was announced that he had arranged some sort of an armistice with the deity, the terms of which were not made public, though they were thought to have included a large cash payment. All the newspapers printed his biography, and two of them ran short editorials on his sterling worth, in his part in the drama of industrialism, with which he had grown up. They referred guardedly to the reforms he had sponsored and financed. The memories of Comstock and Cato the Censor were resuscitated and paraded like gaunt ghosts through the columns. Every newspaper remarked that he was survived by a single grandson, Anthony Comstock Patch, of New York. The burial took place in the family plot at Tarrytown. Anthony and Gloria rode in the first carriage, too worried to feel grotesque, both trying desperately to glean presage of fortune from the faces of retainers who had been with him at the end. They waited a frantic week for decency, and then, having received no notification of any kind, Anthony called up his grandfather's lawyer. Mr. Brett was not in. He was expected back in an hour. 
Anthony left his telephone number. It was the last day of November, cool and crackling outside, with a lusterless sun peering bleakly in at the windows. While they waited for the call, ostensibly engaged in reading, the atmosphere, within and without, seemed pervaded with a deliberate rendition of the pathetic fallacy. After an interminable while, the bell jingled, and Anthony, starting violently, took up the receiver. Hello? His voice was strained and hollow. Yes, I did leave word. Who is this, please? Yes. Why, it was about the estate. Naturally, I'm interested, and I've received no word about the reading of the will. I thought you might not have my address. What? Yes. Gloria fell on her knees. The intervals between Anthony's speeches were like tourniquets winding on her heart. She found herself helplessly twisting the large buttons from a velvet cushion. Then, that's, that's very, very odd. That's very odd. That's very odd. Not even any, uh, mention or any, uh, reason? His voice sounded faint and far away. She uttered a little sound, half gasp, half cry. Yes, I'll see. All right, thanks, thanks. The phone clicked. Her eyes, looking along the floor, saw his feet cut the pattern of a patch of sunlight on the carpet. She arose and faced him with a gray, level glance just as his arms folded about her. My dearest, he whispered huskily, he did it, God damn him. Next day. Who are the heirs? asked Mr. Haight. You see, when you can tell me so little about it, Mr. Haight was tall and bent and beetle-browed. He had been recommended to Anthony as an astute and tenacious lawyer. "'I only know vaguely,' answered Anthony. "'A man named Shuttleworth, who was a sort of pet of his, has the whole thing in charge as administrator or trustee or something, all except the direct bequests to charity and the provisions for servants and for those two cousins in Idaho.' "'How distant are the cousins?' "'Oh, third or fourth, anyway. I never even heard of them.' Mr. Haight nodded comprehensively. "'And you want to contest a provision of the will?' "'I guess so,' admitted Anthony, helplessly. "'I want to do what sounds most hopeful. That's what I want you to tell me.' "'You want them to refuse probate to the will?' Anthony shook his head. "'You've got me. I haven't any idea what probate is. I want a share of the estate.' "'Suppose you tell me some more details. For instance—' Do you know why the testator disinherited you? Why, yes, began Anthony. You see, he was always a sucker for moral reform and all that. I know, interjected Mr. Haight humorlessly. And I don't suppose he ever thought I was much good. I didn't go into business, you see. But I feel certain that, up to last summer, I was one of the beneficiaries. We had a house out in Marietta, and one night Grandfather got the notion that he'd come over and see us. It just happened that there was a rather gay party going on, and he arrived without any warning. Well, he took one look, he and this fellow Shuttleworth, and then turned around and tore right back to Tarrytown. After that, he never answered my letters or even let me see him. He was a prohibitionist, wasn't he? He was everything. Regular religious maniac. How long before his death was the will made that disinherited you? Recently. I mean, since August. And you think that the direct reason for his not leaving you the majority of his estate was his displeasure with your recent actions? Yes. Mr. Haight considered. Upon what grounds was Anthony thinking of contesting the will? Why, isn't there something about evil influence? Undue influence is one ground, but it's the most difficult. You would have to show that such pressure was brought to bear so that the deceased was in a condition where he disposed of his property contrary to his intentions. Well, suppose this fellow Shuttleworth dragged him over to Marietta, just when he thought some sort of a celebration was probably going on. That wouldn't have any bearing on the case. There's a strong division between advice and influence. You'd have to prove that the secretary had a sinister intention. I'd suggest some other grounds. A will is automatically refused probate in case of insanity, drunkenness, here Anthony smiled, or feeble-mindedness through premature old age. But, objected Anthony, his private physician, being one of the beneficiaries, would testify that he wasn't feeble-minded, and he wasn't. 
As a matter of fact, he probably did just what he intended to with his money. It was perfectly consistent with everything he'd ever done in his life. Well, you see, feeble-mindedness is a great deal like undue influence. It implies that the property wasn't disposed of as originally intended. The most common ground is duress, physical pressure. Anthony shook his head. Not much chance on that, I'm afraid. Undue influence sounds best to me. After more discussion, so technical as to be largely unintelligible to Anthony, he retained Mr. Haight as counsel. The lawyer proposed an interview with Shuttleworth, who, jointly with Wilson, Hymer, and Hardy, was executor of the will. Anthony was to come back later in the week. It transpired that the estate consisted of approximately forty million dollars. The largest bequest to an individual was of one million to Edward Shuttleworth, who received in addition thirty thousand a year salary as administrator of the thirty million dollar trust fund, left to be doled out to various charities and reform societies practically at his own discretion. The remaining nine millions were proportioned among the two cousins in Idaho and about twenty-five other beneficiaries friends, secretaries, servants, and employees, who had, at one time or another, earned the seal of Adam Patch's approval. At the end of another fortnight, Mr. Haight, on a retainer's fee of $15,000, had begun preparations for contesting the will. The Winter of Discontent Before they had been two months in the little apartment on 57th Street, it had assumed for both of them the same indefinable but almost material taint that had impregnated the gray house in Marietta. There was the odor of tobacco, always. Both of them smoked incessantly. It was in their clothes, their blankets, the curtains, and the ash-littered carpets. Added to this was the wretched aura of stale wine, with its inevitable suggestion of beauty gone foul and revelry remembered in disgust. About a particular set of glass goblets on the sideboard, the odor was particularly noticeable, and in the main room the mahogany table was ringed with white circles where glasses had been set down upon it. There had been many parties. People broke things, people became sick in Gloria's bathroom, people spilled wine, people made unbelievable messes of the kitchenette. These things were a regular part of their existence. Despite the resolutions of many Mondays, it was tacitly understood, as the weekend approached, that it should be observed with some sort of unholy excitement. When Saturday came, they would not discuss the matter, but would call up this person or that from among their circle of sufficiently irresponsible friends and suggest a rendezvous. Only after the friends had gathered and Anthony had set out decanters would he murmur casually, I guess I'll have just one highball myself. Then they were off for two days, realizing on a wintry dawn that they had been the noisiest and most conspicuous members of the noisiest and most conspicuous party at the Boul Mitch or the Club Ramay, or at other resorts much less particular about the hilarity of their clientele. They would find that they had somehow squandered eighty or ninety dollars, how they never knew. They customarily attributed it to the general penury of the friends who had accompanied them. It began to be not unusual for the more sincere of their friends to remonstrate with them, in the very course of a party, and to predict a somber end for them in the loss of Gloria's looks and Anthony's constitution. The story of the summarily interrupted revel in Marietta had, of course, leaked out in detail. Muriel doesn't mean to tell everyone she knows, said Gloria to Anthony, but she thinks everyone she tells is the only one she's going to tell. And, diaphanously veiled, the tale had been given a conspicuous place in the town tattle. When the terms of Adam Patch's will were made public, and the newspapers printed items concerning Anthony's suit, the story was beautifully rounded out, to Anthony's infinite disparagement. They began to hear rumors about themselves from all quarters, rumors founded usually on a soupçon of truth, but overlaid with preposterous and sinister detail. Outwardly, they showed no signs of deterioration. Gloria, at twenty-six, was still the Gloria of twenty, her complexion a fresh damp setting for her candid eyes, her hair still a childish glory, darkening slowly from corn color to a deep russet gold, her slender body suggesting ever a nymph running and dancing through Orphic groves. Masculine eyes, dozens of them, 
followed her with a fascinated stare when she walked through a hotel lobby or down the aisle of a theatre. Men asked to be introduced to her, fell into prolonged states of sincere admiration, made definite love to her, for she was still a thing of exquisite and unbelievable beauty. And for his part, Anthony had gained rather than lost in appearance. His face had taken on a certain intangible air of tragedy, romantically contrasted with his trim and immaculate person. Early in the winter, when all conversation turned on the probability of America's going into the war, when Anthony was making a desperate and sincere attempt to write, Muriel Kane arrived in New York and came immediately to see them. Like Gloria, she seemed never to change. She knew the latest slang, danced the latest dances, and talked of the latest songs and plays with all the fervor of her first season as a New York drifter. Her coyness was eternally new, eternally ineffectual, her clothes were extreme, her black hair was bobbed now, like Gloria's. "'I've come up for the midwinter prom at New Haven,' she announced, imparting her delightful secret. Though she must have been older then than any of the boys in college, she managed always to secure some sort of invitation, imagining vaguely that at the next party would occur the flirtation which was to end at the romantic altar. "'Where have you been?' inquired Anthony, unfailingly amused. "'I've been at Hot Springs. It's been slick and peppy this fall. More men!' "'Are you in love, Muriel?' "'What do you mean, love?' This was the rhetorical question of the year. "'I'm going to tell you something,' she said, switching the subject abruptly. "'I suppose it's none of my business, but I think it's time for you two to settle down.' "'Why, we are settled down.' "'Yes, you are.' she scoffed archly. Everywhere I go, I hear stories of your escapades. Let me tell you, I have an awful time sticking up for you. You needn't bother, said Gloria coldly. Now, Gloria, she protested, you know I'm one of your best friends. Gloria was silent. Muriel continued. It's not so much the idea of a woman drinking, but Gloria is so pretty, and so many people know her by sight all around, that it's naturally conspicuous. "'What have you heard recently?' demanded Gloria, her dignity going down before her curiosity. "'Well, for instance, that that party in Marietta killed Anthony's grandfather.' Instantly husband and wife were tense with annoyance. "'Why, I think that's outrageous.' "'That's what they say,' persisted Muriel stubbornly. Anthony paced the room. "'It's preposterous,' he declared. "'The very people we take on at parties shout the story around as a great joke.' and eventually it gets back to us in some such form as this. Gloria began running her finger through a stray reddish curl. Muriel licked her veil as she considered her next remark. You ought to have a baby. Gloria looked up wearily. We can't afford it. All the people in the slums have them, said Muriel triumphantly. Anthony and Gloria exchanged a smile. They had reached the stage of violent quarrels that were never made up, quarrels that smoldered and broke out again at intervals, or died away from sheer indifference. But this visit of Muriel's drew them temporarily together. When the discomfort under which they were living was remarked upon by a third party, it gave them the impetus to face this hostile world together. It was very seldom now that the impulse toward reunion sprang from within. Anthony found himself associating his own existence with that of the apartment's night elevator man, a pale, scraggly-bearded person of about sixty, with an air of being somewhat above his station. It was probably because of this quality that he had secured the position. It made him a pathetic and memorable figure of failure. Anthony recollected, without humor, a hoary jest about the elevator man's career being a matter of ups and downs. It was, at any rate, an enclosed life of infinite dreariness. Each time Anthony stepped into the car, he waited breathlessly for the old man's well, I guess we're going to have some sunshine today. Anthony thought how little rain or sunshine he would enjoy, shut into that close little cage in the smoke-colored, windowless hall. A darkling figure, he attained tragedy in leaving the life that had used him so shabbily. Three young gunmen came in one night, tied him up, and left him on a pile of coal in the cellar while they went through the trunk room. When the janitor found him the next morning, he had collapsed from chill. He died of pneumonia four days later. He was replaced by a glib Martinique negro, 
with an incongruous British accent and a tendency to be surly, whom Anthony detested. The passing of the old man had approximately the same effect on him that the kitten story had had on Gloria. He was reminded of the cruelty of all life, and in consequence of the increasing bitterness of his own. He was writing, and in earnest at last. He had gone to Dick and listened for a tense hour to an elucidation of those minutiae of procedure which hitherto he had rather scornfully looked down upon. He needed money immediately. He was selling bonds every month to pay their bills. Dick was frank and explicit. So, as far as articles on literary subjects and these obscure magazines go, you couldn't make enough money to pay your rent. Of course, if a man has the gift of humor, or a chance at a big biography or some specialized knowledge, he may strike it rich. But for you, fiction's the only thing. You say you need money right away? I certainly do. Well, it'd be a year and a half before you'd make any money out of a novel. Try some popular short stories. And, by the way, unless they're exceptionally brilliant, they have to be cheerful and on the side of the heaviest artillery to make you any money. Anthony thought of Dick's recent output, which had been appearing in a well-known monthly. It was concerned chiefly with the preposterous actions of a class of sawdust effigies who, one was assured, were New York society people, and it turned, as a rule, upon questions of the heroine's technical purity, with mock sociological overtones about the mad antics of the four hundred. "'But your stories!' exclaimed Anthony aloud, almost involuntarily. "'Oh, that's different,' Dick asserted astoundingly. "'I have a reputation, you see, so I'm expected to deal with strong themes.' Anthony gave an interior start, realizing with this remark how much Richard Caramel had fallen off. Did he actually think these amazing latter productions were as good as his first novel? Anthony went back to the apartment and set to work. He found that the business of optimism was no mean task. After half a dozen futile starts, he went to the public library and for a week investigated the files of a popular magazine. Then, better equipped, he accomplished his first story, The Dictaphone of Fate. It was founded upon one of his few remaining impressions of that six weeks in Wall Street the year before. It purported to be the sunny tale of an office boy who, quite by accident, hummed a wonderful melody into the dictaphone. The cylinder was discovered by the boss's brother, a well-known producer of musical comedy, and then immediately lost. The body of the story was concerned with the pursuit of the missing cylinder and the eventual marriage of the noble office boy now a successful composer, to Miss Rooney, the virtuous stenographer who was half Joan of Arc and half Florence Nightingale. He had gathered that this was what the magazines wanted. He offered, in his protagonists, the customary denizens of the pink and blue literary world, immersing them in a saccharine plot that would offend not a single stomach in Marietta. He had it typed in double space, this last as advised by a booklet, Success as a Writer Made Easy by R. Meggs Whittlestein, which assured the ambitious plumber of the futility of perspiration, since, after a six-lesson course, he could make at least a thousand dollars a month. After reading it to a bored Gloria, and coaxing from her the immemorial remark that it was better than a lot of stuff that gets published, he satirically affixed the nom de plume of Gilles de Sade, and enclosed the proper return envelope, and sent it off. Following the gigantic labor of conception, he decided to wait until he heard from the first story before beginning another. Dick had told him that he might get as much as two hundred dollars. If by any chance it did happen to be unsuited, the editor's letter would, no doubt, give him an idea of what changes should be made. "'It is without question the most abominable piece of writing in existence,' said Anthony. The editor quite conceivably agreed with him. He returned the manuscript with a rejection slip. Anthony sent it off elsewhere and began another story. The second one was called The Little Open Doors. It was written in three days. It concerned the occult. An estranged couple were brought together by a medium in a vaudeville show. There were six altogether, six wretched and pitiable efforts to write down by a man who had never before made a consistent effort to write at all. Not one of them contained a spark of vitality, and their total yield of grace and felicity was less than that of an average newspaper column. 
During their circulation, they collected, all told, 31 rejection slips, headstones for the packages that he would find lying like dead bodies at his door. In mid-January, Gloria's father died, and they went again to Kansas City, a miserable trip, for Gloria brooded interminably, not upon her father's death, but on her mother's. Russell Gilbert's affairs having been cleared up, they came into possession of about three thousand dollars and a great amount of furniture. This was in storage, for he had spent his last days in a small hotel. It was due to his death that Anthony made a new discovery concerning Gloria. On the journey east, she disclosed herself, astonishingly, as a billfist. Why, Gloria, he cried, you don't mean to tell me you believe that stuff. Well, she said defiantly, why not? Because it's, it's fantastic. You know that in every sense of the word you're an agnostic. You'd laugh at any orthodox form of Christianity, and then you come out with the statement that you believe in some silly rule of reincarnation. What if I do? I've heard you and Maury, and everyone else for whose intellect I have the slightest respect, agree that life as it appears is utterly meaningless, but it's always seemed to me that if I were unconsciously learning something here, it might not be so meaningless. You're not learning anything. You're just getting tired. And if you must have a faith to soften things, take up one that appeals to the reason of someone, besides a lot of hysterical women. A person like you oughtn't to accept anything unless it's decently demonstrable. I don't care about truth. I want some happiness. Well, if you've got a decent mind, the second has got to be qualified by the first. Any simple soul can delude himself with mental garbage. I don't care, she held out stoutly, and what's more, I'm not propounding any doctrine. The argument faded off, but reoccurred to Anthony several times thereafter. It was disturbing to find this old belief, evidently assimilated from her mother, inserting itself again under its immemorial disguise as an innate idea. They reached New York in March, after an expensive and ill-advised week spent in hot springs, and Anthony resumed his abortive attempts at fiction. As it became plainer to both of them that escape did not lie in the way of popular literature, there was a further slipping of their mutual confidence and courage. A complicated struggle went on incessantly between them. All efforts to keep down expenses died away from sheer inertia, and by March they were again using any pretext as an excuse for a party. With an assumption of recklessness, Gloria tossed out the suggestion that they should take all their money and go on a real spree while it lasted. Anything seemed better than to see it go in unsatisfactory driblets. Gloria, you want parties as much as I do. It doesn't matter about me. Everything I do is in accordance with my ideas, to use every minute of these years, when I'm young, in having the best time I possibly can. How about after that? After that I won't care. Yes, you will. Well, I may, but I won't be able to do anything about it, and I'll have had my good time. You'll be the same, then. After a fashion, we have had our good time, raised the devil, and we're in the state of paying for it. Nevertheless, the money kept going. There would be two days of gaiety, two days of moroseness, an endless, almost invariable round. The sharp pull-ups, when they occurred, resulted usually in a spurt of work for Anthony, while Gloria, nervous and bored, remained in bed or else chewed abstractedly at her fingers. After a day or so of this, they would make an engagement, and then, oh, what did it matter? This night, this glow, the cessation of anxiety, and the sense that, if living was not purposeful, it was, at any rate, essentially romantic. Wine gave a sort of gallantry to their own failure. Meanwhile, the suit progressed slowly, with interminable examinations of witnesses and marshallings of evidence. The preliminary proceedings of settling the estate were finished. Mr. Haight saw no reason why the case should not come up for trial before summer. Blockman appeared in New York late in March, he had been in England for nearly a year on matters connected with films par excellence. The process of general refinement was still in progress. Always he dressed a little better, his intonation was mellower, and in his manner there was perceptibly more assurance that the fine things of the world were his by a natural and inalienable right. He called to the apartment, remained only an hour, 
during which he talked chiefly of the war, and left telling them he was coming again. On his second visit Anthony was not at home, but an absorbed and excited Gloria greeted her husband later in the afternoon. "'Anthony,' she began, "'would you still object if I went in the movies?' His whole heart hardened against the idea. As she seemed to recede from him, if only in threat, her presence became again not so much precious as desperately necessary. Oh, Gloria! Blockhead said he'd put me in, only if I'm ever going to do anything I'll have to start now. They only want young women. Think of the money, Anthony. For you, yes, but how about me? Don't you know that anything I have is yours, too? It's such a hell of a career he burst out, the moral, the infinitely circumspect Anthony, and such a hell of a bunch, and I'm so utterly tired of that fellow Blockman coming here and interfering. I hate theatrical things. It isn't theatrical. It's utterly different. What am I supposed to do? Chase you all over the country? Live on your money? Then make some yourself. The conversation developed into one of the most violent quarrels they had ever had. After the ensuing reconciliation, and the inevitable period of moral inertia, she realized that he had taken the life out of the project. Neither of them ever mentioned the probability that Blockman was by no means disinterested, but they both knew that it lay back of Anthony's objection. In April, war was declared with Germany. Wilson and his cabinet, a cabinet that, in its lack of distinction, was strangely reminiscent of the Twelve Apostles, let loose the carefully starved dogs of war and the press began to whoop hysterically against the sinister morals, sinister philosophy, and sinister music produced by the Teutonic temperament. Those who fancied themselves particularly broad-minded made the exquisite distinction that it was only the German government which aroused them to hysteria. The rest were worked up to a condition of retching indecency. Any song which contained the word mother and the word Kaiser was assured of a tremendous success. At last, every one had something to talk about, and almost every one fully enjoyed it, as though they had been cast for parts in a somber and romantic play. Anthony, Maury, and Dick sent in their applications for officers' training camps, and the two latter went about feeling strangely exalted and reproachless. They chattered to each other, like college boys, of wars being the one excuse for, and justification of, the aristocrat and conjured up an impossible cast of officers, to be composed, it appeared, chiefly of the more attractive alumni of three or four eastern colleges. It seemed to Gloria that, in this huge red light streaming across the nation, even Anthony took on a new glamour. The 10th Infantry, arriving in New York from Panama, were escorted from saloon to saloon by patriotic citizens to their great bewilderment. West Pointers began to be noticed for the first time in years, and the general impression was that everything was glorious, but not half so glorious as it was going to be pretty soon, and that everybody was a fine fellow, and every race a great race, always excepting Germans, and in every strata of society, outcasts and scapegoats had but to appear in uniform to be forgiven, cheered, and wept over by relatives, ex-friends, and utter strangers." Unfortunately, a small and precise doctor decided that there was something the matter with Anthony's blood pressure. He could not conscientiously pass him for an officer's training camp. The Broken Lute Their third anniversary passed, uncelebrated, unnoticed. The season warmed in thaw, melted into hotter summer, simmered and boiled away. In July, the will was offered for probate, and upon the contestation, was assigned by the surrogate to trial term for trial. The matter was prolonged into September. There was difficulty in impaneling an unbiased jury because of the moral sentiments involved. To Anthony's disappointment, a verdict was finally returned in favor of the testator, whereupon Mr. Haight caused a notice of appeal to be served upon Edward Shuttleworth. As the summer waned, Anthony and Gloria talked of the things they were to do when the money was theirs and of the places they were to go after the war, when they would agree on things again. For both of them looked forward to a time when love, springing like the phoenix from its own ashes, should be born again in its mysterious and unfathomable haunts. He was drafted early in the fall, 
and the examining doctor made no mention of low blood pressure. It was all very purposeless and sad when Anthony told Gloria one night that he wanted, above all things, to be killed. But, as always, they were sorry for each other for the wrong things at the wrong times. They decided that, for the present, she was not to go with him to the southern camp where his contingent was ordered. She would remain in New York to use the apartment, to save money, and to watch the progress of the case, which was pending now in the appellate division, of which the calendar, Mr. Haight told them, was far behind. Almost their last conversation was a senseless quarrel about the proper division of the income. At a word, either would have given it all to the other. It was typical of the muddle and confusion of their lives that, on the October night when Anthony reported at Grand Central Station for the journey to camp, she arrived only in time to catch his eye over the anxious heads of a gathered crowd. Through the dark light of the enclosed train sheds, their glances stretched across a hysterical area, foul with yellow sobbing, and the smells of poor women. They must have pondered upon what they had done to one another, and each must have accused himself of drawing the somber pattern through which they were tracing tragically and obscurely. At the last, they were too far away for either to see the other's tears. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Part two of two. Book three, chapter one, part one of two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book three, chapter one, A Matter of Civilization. Part one of two. At a frantic command from some invisible source, Anthony groped his way inside. He was thinking that, for the first time in more than three years, he was to remain longer than a night away from Gloria. The finality of it appealed to him drearily. It was his clean and lovely girl that he was leaving. They had arrived, he thought, at the most practical financial settlement. She was to have three hundred and seventy-five dollars a month, not too much, considering over half of that would go in rent, and he was taking fifty to supplement his pay. He saw no need for more. Food, clothes, and quarters would be provided. There were no social obligations for a private. The car was crowded and already thick with breath. It was one of the type known as tourist cars, a sort of Brummagem Pullman with a bare floor and straw seats that needed cleaning. Nevertheless, Anthony greeted it with relief. He had vaguely expected that the trip south would be made in a freight car, in one end of which would stand eight horses, and in the other end forty men. He had heard the Alms Quarante Chevaux Huit story so often that it had become confused and ominous. As he rocked down the aisle with his barrack bag slung at his shoulder like a monstrous blue sausage, he saw no vacant seats, but after a moment his eye fell on a single space at present occupied by the feet of a short, swarthy Sicilian, who, with his hat drawn over his eyes, hunched defiantly in the corner. As Anthony stopped beside him he stared up with a scowl, evidently intended to be intimidating. He must have adopted it as a defense against this entire gigantic equation. At Anthony's sharp, that seat taken? He very slowly lifted the feet as though they were a breakable package, and placed them with some care upon the floor. His eyes remained on Anthony, who, meanwhile, sat down and unbuttoned the uniform coat issued to him at Camp Upton the day before. It chafed him under the arms. Before Anthony could scrutinize the other occupants of the section, a young second lieutenant blew in at the upper end of the car and wafted airily down the aisle announcing in a voice of appalling acerbity, "'There will be no smoking in this car! No smoking! Don't smoke, men, in this car!' As he sailed out at the other end, a dozen little clouds of expostulation arose on all sides. "'Oh, cripe! Jeez! No smoking? Hey, come back here, fella! What's the idea?' Two or three cigarettes were shot out through the open windows. Others were retained inside, though kept sketchily away from view. From here and there, in accents of bravado, of mockery, of submissive humor, 
a few remarks were dropped that soon melted into the listless and pervasive silence. The fourth occupant of Anthony's section spoke up suddenly. "'Goodbye, Liberty,' he said sullenly. "'Goodbye everything except being an officer's dog.' Anthony looked at him. He was a tall Irishman, with an expression molded of indifference and utter disdain. His eyes fell on Anthony as though he expected an answer, and then upon the others. Receiving only a defiant stare from the Italian, he groaned and spat noisily on the floor by way of a dignified transition back into taciturnity. A few minutes later the door opened again, and the second lieutenant was borne in upon his customary official zephyr, this time singing out a different tiding. "'All right, men, smoke if you want to. My mistake, men. It's all right, men. Go on and smoke. My mistake.' This time Anthony had a good look at him. He was young, thin, already faded. He was like his own mustache. He was like a great piece of shiny straw. His chin receded, faintly. This was offset by a magnificent and unconvincing scowl, a scowl that Anthony was to connect with the faces of many young officers during the ensuing year. Immediately everyone smoked, whether they had previously desired to or not. Anthony's cigarette contributed to the hazy oxidation which seemed to roll back and forth in opalescent clouds with every motion of the train. The conversation, which had lapsed between the two impressive visits of the young officer, now revived tepidly. The men across the aisle began making clumsy experiments with their straw seats' capacity for comparative comfort. Two card games, half-heartedly begun, soon drew several spectators to sitting positions on the arms of seats. In a few minutes Anthony became aware of a persistently obnoxious sound. The small, defiant Sicilian had fallen audibly asleep. It was wearisome to contemplate that animate protoplasm, reasonable by courtesy only, shut up in a car by an incomprehensible civilization, taken somewhere, to do a vague something without aim or significance or consequence. Anthony sighed, opened a newspaper which he had no recollection of buying, and began to read by the dim yellow light. Ten o'clock bumped stuffily into eleven. The hours clogged and caught and slowed down. Amazingly, the train halted along the dark countryside, from time to time, indulging in short, deceitful movements backward or forward, and whistling harsh pains into the high October night. Having read his newspaper through, editorials, cartoons, and war poems, his eye fell on a half-column headed Shakespeareville, Kansas. It seemed that the Shakespeareville Chamber of Commerce had recently held an enthusiastic debate as to whether the American soldiers should be known as Sammies or Battling Christians. The thought gagged him. He dropped the newspaper, yawned, and let his mind drift off at a tangent. He wondered why Gloria had been late. It seemed so long ago already, he had a pang of elusive loneliness. He tried to imagine from what angle she would regard her new position, what place in her considerations he would continue to hold. The thought acted as a further depressant. He opened his paper and began to read again. The members of the Chamber of Commerce in Shakespeareville had decided upon Liberty Lads. For two days and two nights they rattled southward, making mysterious, inexplicable stops in what were apparently arid wastes, and then rushing through large cities with a pompous air of hurry. The whimsicalities of this train foreshadowed for Anthony the whimsicalities of all army administration. In the arid wastes they were served from the baggage car with beans and bacon that at first he was unable to eat. He dined scantily on some milk chocolate distributed by a village canteen. But on the second day the baggage car's output began to appear surprisingly palatable. On the third morning the rumor was passed along that within the hour they would arrive at their destination, Camp Hooker. It had become intolerably hot in the car, and the men were all in shirt sleeves. The sun came in through the windows, a tired and ancient sun, yellow as parchment and stretched out of shape in transit. It tried to enter in triumphant squares and produced only warped splotches. 
but it was appallingly steady, so much so that it disturbed Anthony not to be the pivot of all the inconsequential sawmills and trees and telegraph poles that were turning around him so fast. Outside, it played its heavy tremolo over olive roads and fallow cotton fields, back of which ran a ragged line of woods broken with eminences of gray rock. The foreground was dotted sparsely with wretched, ill-patched shanties, among which there would flash by, now and then, a specimen of the languid yokelry of South Carolina, or else a strolling darky with sullen and bewildered eyes. Then the woods moved off, and they rolled into a broad space like the baked top of a gigantic cake, sugared with an infinity of tents arranged in geometric figures over its surface. The train came to an uncertain stop, and the sun and the poles and the trees faded, and his universe rocked itself slowly back to its old usualness, with Anthony Patch in the center. As the men, weary and perspiring, crowded out of the car, he smelt that unforgettable aroma that impregnates all permanent camps, the odor of garbage. Camp Hooker was an astonishing and spectacular growth, suggesting a mining town in 1870, the second week. It was a thing of wooden shacks and whitish-gray tents, connected by a pattern of roads, with hard tan drill grounds fringed with trees. Here and there stood green YMCA houses, unpromising oases, with their muggy odor of wet flannels and closed telephone booths, and across from each of them there was usually a canteen, swarming with life, presided over indolently by an officer who, with the aid of a sidecar, usually managed to make his detail a pleasant and chatty sinecure. Up and down the dusty roads sped the soldiers of the quartermaster corps, also in sidecars, up and down drove the generals in their government automobiles, stopping now and then to bring unalert details to attention, to frown heavily upon captains marching at the heads of companies, to set the pompous pace in that gorgeous game of showing off which was taking place triumphantly over the entire area. The first week after the arrival of Anthony's draft was filled with a series of interminable inoculations and physical examinations, and with the preliminary drilling. The days left him desperately tired. He had been issued the wrong size shoes by a popular, easy-going supply sergeant, and in consequence his feet were so swollen that the last hours of the afternoon were an acute torture. For the first time in his life he could throw himself down on his cot between dinner and afternoon drill call, and, seeming to sink with each moment deeper into a bottomless bed, drop off immediately to sleep while the noise and laughter around him faded to a pleasant drone of drowsy summer sound. In the morning he awoke, stiff and aching, hollow as a ghost, and hurried forth to meet the other ghostly figures who swarmed in the wan company streets, while a harsh bugle shrieked and spluttered at the gray heavens. He was in a skeleton infantry company of about a hundred men. After the invariable breakfast of fatty bacon, cold toast, and cereal, the entire hundred would rush for the latrines, which, however well policed, seemed always intolerable, like the lavatories in cheap hotels. Out on the field, then, in ragged order, the lame man on his left, grotesquely marring Anthony's listless efforts to keep in step, the platoon sergeants either showing off violently to impress the officers and recruits, or else quietly lurking in, close to the line of march, avoiding both labor and unnecessary visibility. When they reached the field, work began immediately. They peeled off their shirts for calisthenics. This was the only part of the day that Anthony enjoyed. Lieutenant Cretching, who presided at the antics, was sinewy and muscular, and Anthony followed his movements faithfully with the feeling that he was doing something of positive value to himself. The other officers and sergeants walked about among the men with the malice of schoolboys, grouping here and there around some unfortunate who lacked muscular control, giving him confused instructions and commands. When they discovered a particularly forlorn, ill-nourished specimen, they would linger the full half-hour, making cutting remarks and snickering among themselves. One little officer named Hopkins, who had been a sergeant in the regular army, was particularly annoying. He took the war as a gift of revenge from the high gods to himself, and the constant burden of his harangues was that these rookies did not appreciate the full gravity and responsibility of the service. He considered that, 
by a combination of foresight and dauntless efficiency, he had raised himself to his current magnificence. He aped the particular tyrannies of every officer under whom he had served in times gone by. His frown was frozen on his brow. Before giving a private a pass to go to town, he would ponderously weigh the effect of such an absence upon the company, the army, and the welfare of the military profession the world over. Lieutenant Crutching, blond, dull, and phlegmatic, introduced Anthony ponderously to the problems of attention, right face, about face, and at ease. His principal defect was his forgetfulness. He often kept the company straining and aching at attention for five minutes while he stood out in front and explained a new movement. As a result, only those men in the center knew what it was all about. Those on both flanks had been too emphatically impressed with the necessity of staring straight ahead. The drill continued until noon. It consisted of stressing a succession of infinitely remote details. And though Anthony perceived that this was consistent with the logic of war, it nonetheless irritated him. That the same faulty blood pressure which would have been indecent in an officer did not interfere with the duties of a private was a preposterous incongruity. Sometimes, after listening to a sustained invective concerned with a dull and, on the face of it, absurd subject known as military courtesy, he suspected that the dim purpose of the war was to let the regular army officers, men with the mentality and aspirations of schoolboys, have their fling with some real slaughter. He was being grotesquely sacrificed to the twenty-year patience of a Hopkins. Of his three tent-mates, a flat-faced, conscientious objector from Tennessee, a big, scared Pole, and the disdainful Celt whom he had sat beside on the train. The two former spent the evenings in writing eternal letters home, while the Irishman sat in the tent door whistling over and over to himself half a dozen shrill and monotonous bird calls. It was rather to avoid an hour of their company than with any hope of diversion that, when the quarantine was lifted at the end of the week, he went into town. He caught one of the swarm of jitneys that overran the camp each evening, and in half an hour was set down in front of the Stonewall Hotel on the hot and drowsy Main Street. Under the gathering twilight, the town was unexpectedly attractive. The sidewalks were peopled by vividly overdressed, overpainted girls who chattered volubly in low, lazy voices, by dozens of taxi drivers who assailed passing officers with, Take ye anywhere, lieutenant? and by an intermittent procession of ragged, shuffling, subservient negroes. Anthony, loitering along through the warm dusk, felt for the first time in years the slow, erotic breath of the South, imminent in the hot softness of the air, in the pervasive lull of thought and time. He had gone about a block when he was arrested suddenly by a harsh command at his elbow. "'Haven't you been taught to salute officers?' He looked dumbly at the man who addressed him a stout, black-haired captain, who fixed him menacingly with brown pop-eyes. "'Come to attention!' The words were literally thundered. A few pedestrians nearby stopped and stared. A soft-eyed girl in a lilac dress tittered to her companion. Anthony came to attention. "'What's your regiment and company?' Anthony told him. "'After this, when you pass an officer in the street, you straighten up and salute.' "'All right. Say yes, sir.' Yes, sir. The stout officer grunted, turned sharply, and marched down the street. After a moment Anthony moved on. The town was no longer indolent and exotic. The magic was suddenly gone out of the dusk. His eyes were turned precipitately inward upon the indignity of his position. He hated that officer, every officer. Life was unendurable. After he had gone half a block, he realized that the girl in the lilac dress who had giggled at his discomfiture, was walking with her friend about ten paces ahead of him. Several times she had turned and stared at Anthony, with cheerful laughter and the large eyes that seemed the same color as her gown. At the corner, she and her companion visibly slackened their pace. He must make his choice between joining them and passing obliviously by. He passed, hesitated, then slowed down. In a moment the pair were abreast of him again, dissolved in laughter now, not such strident mirth as he would have expected in the North from actresses in this familiar comedy, but a soft, low rippling, 
like the overflow from some subtle joke, into which he had inadvertently blundered. "'How do you do?' he said. Her eyes were soft as shadows. Were they violet, or was it their blue darkness, mingling with the grey hues of dusk? "'Pleasant evening,' ventured Anthony uncertainly. "'Sure is,' said the second girl. "'Hasn't been a very pleasant evening for you,' sighed the girl in lilac. Her voice seemed as much a part of the night as the drowsy breeze stirring the wide brim of her hat. "'He had to have a chance to show off,' said Anthony, with a scornful laugh. "'Reckon so,' she agreed. They turned the corner and moved lackadaisically up a side street, as if following a drifting cable to which they were attached. In this town it seemed entirely natural to turn corners like that, it seemed natural to be bound nowhere in particular, to be thinking nothing. The side street was dark, a sudden offshoot into a district of wild rose hedges and little quiet houses set far back from the street. "'Where are you going?' he inquired politely. "'Just going.' The answer was an apology, a question, an explanation. "'Can I stroll along with you?' "'Reckon so.' It was an advantage that her accent was different. He could not have determined the social status of a southerner from her talk. In New York, a girl of a lower class would have been raucous, unendurable, except through the rosy spectacles of intoxication. Dark was creeping down, talking little, Anthony in careless, casual questions, the other two with provincial economy of phrase and burden. They sauntered past another corner and another, in the middle of a block they stopped beneath a lamp-post. "'I live near here,' explained the other girl. "'I live round the block,' said the girl in lilac. "'Can I see you home?' "'To the corner, if you want to.' The other girl took a few steps backward. Anthony removed his hat. "'You're supposed to salute,' said the girl in lilac, with a laugh. "'All the soldiers salute.' "'I'll learn,' he responded soberly. The other girl said, Well, hesitated, then added, Call me up tomorrow, Dot, and retreated from the yellow circle of the street lamp. Then, in silence, Anthony and the girl in lilac walked the three blocks to the small, rickety house which was her home. Outside the wooden gate, she hesitated. Well, thanks. Must you go in so soon? I ought to. Can't you stroll around a little longer? She regarded him dispassionately. "'I don't even know you.' Anthony laughed. "'It's not too late.' "'I reckon I'd better go in. I thought we might walk down and see a movie. I'd like to. Then I could bring you home. I'd have just enough time. I've got to be in camp by eleven. It was so dark that he could scarcely see her now. She was a dress swayed infinitesimally by the wind, two limpid, reckless eyes. Why don't you come, Dot? Don't you like movies? Better come. She shook her head. I oughtn't to. He liked her, realizing that she was temporizing for the effect on him. He came closer and took her hand. If we can get back by ten, can't you? Just to the movies? Well, I reckon so. Hand in hand, they walked back toward downtown, along a hazy, dusky street, where a negro newsboy was calling an extra in the cadence of the local vendor's tradition, a cadence that was as musical as song. Dot. Anthony's affair with Dorothy Raycroft was an inevitable result of his increasing carelessness about himself. He did not go to her desiring to possess the desirable, nor did he fall before a personality more vital, more compelling than his own, as he had done with Gloria four years before. He merely slid into the matter through his inability to make definite judgments. He could say, no, neither to man nor woman, borrower and temptress alike found him tender-minded and pliable. Indeed, he seldom made decisions at all, and when he did, they were but half-hysterical resolves formed in the panic of some aghast and irreparable awakening. The particular weakness he indulged on this occasion was his need of excitement and stimulus from without. He felt that, for the first time in four years, he could express and interpret himself anew. The girl promised rest, 
the hours in her company each evening alleviated the morbid and inevitably futile poundings of his imagination he had become a coward in earnest completely the slave of a hundred disordered and prowling thoughts which were released by the collapse of the authentic devotion to gloria that had been the chief jailer of his insufficiency on that first night as they stood by the gate he kissed dorothy and made an engagement to meet her the following saturday then he went out to camp and with the light burning lawlessly in his tent he wrote a long letter to gloria a glowing letter full of the sentimental dark full of the remembered breath of flowers full of a true and exceeding tenderness these things he had learned again for a moment in a kiss given and taken under a rich warm moonlight just an hour before when saturday came he found dot waiting at the entrance of the bijou moving picture theatre she was dressed as on the preceding wednesday in her lilac gown of frailest organdy but it had evidently been washed and starched since then for it was fresh and unrumpled daylight confirmed the impression he had received that in a sketchy faulty way she was lovely she was clean her features were small irregular but eloquent and appropriate to each other she was a dark unenduring little flower yet he thought he detected in her some quality of spiritual reticence of strength drawn from her passive acceptance of all things in this he was mistaken Dorothy Raycroft was nineteen. Her father had kept a small, unprosperous corner store, and she had graduated from high school in the lowest fourth of her class two days before he died. At high school she had enjoyed a rather unsavory reputation. As a matter of fact, her behavior at the class picnic, where the rumors started, had been merely indiscreet. She had retained her technical purity until over a year later. The boy had been a clerk in a store on Jackson Street, and on the day after the incident he departed unexpectedly to New York. He had been intending to leave for some time, but had tarried for the consummation of his amorous enterprise. After a while she confided the adventure to a girlfriend, and later, as she watched her friend disappear down the sleepy street of dusty sunshine, she knew in a flash of intuition that her story was going out into the world. Yet after telling it she felt much better, and a little bitter, and made as near an approach to character as she was capable of by walking in another direction and meeting another man with the honest intention of gratifying herself again. As a rule, things happened to Dot. She was not weak, because there was nothing in her to tell her she was being weak. She was not strong, because she never knew that some of the things she did were brave. She neither defied, nor conformed, nor compromised. She had no sense of humor, but— to take its place a happy disposition that made her laugh at the proper times when she was with men. She had no definite intentions. Sometimes she regretted vaguely that her reputation precluded what chance she had ever had for security. There had been no open discovery. Her mother was interested only in starting her off on time, each morning, for the jewelry store, where she earned fourteen dollars a week. But some of the boys she had known in high school now looked the other way when they were walking with nice girls, and these incidents hurt her feelings. When they occurred, she went home and cried. Besides the Jackson Street clerk, there had been two other men, of whom the first was a naval officer, who passed through town during the early days of the war. He had stayed over a night to make a connection, and was leaning idly against one of the pillars of the Stonewall Hotel when she passed by. He remained in town four days. She thought she loved him, lavished on him that first hysteria of passion that would have gone to the pusillanimous clerk. The naval officer's uniform, there were few of them in those days, had made the magic. He left with vague promises on his lips, and, once on the train, rejoiced that he had not told her his real name. Her resultant depression had thrown her into the arms of Cyrus Fielding, the son of a local clothier, who had hailed her from his roadster one day as she passed along the sidewalk. She had always known him by name. Had she been born into a higher stratum, he would have known her before. She had descended a little lower, so he met her after all. After a month he had gone away to training camp, a little afraid of the intimacy, a little relieved in perceiving that she had not cared deeply for him, and that she was not the sort who would ever make trouble. Dot romanticized this affair, and conceded to her vanity that the war had taken these men away from her. 
She told herself that she could have married the naval officer. Nevertheless, it worried her that, within eight months, there had been three men in her life. She thought, with more fear than wonder in her heart, that she would soon be like those bad girls on Jackson Street, at whom she and her gum-chewing, giggling friends had stared with fascination three years before. For a while she attempted to be more careful. She let men pick her up, she let them kiss her, and even allowed certain other liberties to be forced upon her, but she did not add to her trio. After several months the strength of her resolution, or rather the poignant expediency of her fears, was worn away. She grew restless drowsing there, out of life and time, while the summer months faded. The soldiers she met were either obviously below her, or, less obviously, above her, in which case they desired only to use her. They were Yankees, harsh and ungracious, they swarmed in large crowds. And then she met Anthony. On that first evening he had been little more than a pleasantly unhappy face, a voice, the means with which to pass an hour, but when she kept her engagement with him on Saturday she regarded him with consideration. She liked him. Unknowingly she saw her own tragedies mirrored in his face. Again they went to the movies, again they wandered along the shadowy, scented streets, hand in hand this time, speaking a little in hushed voices. They passed through the gate, up toward the little porch. "'I can stay a while, can't I?' "'Shh,' she whispered. "'You've got to be very quiet. Mother sits up reading snappy stories.' In confirmation he heard the faint crackling inside as a page was turned. The open shutter slits emitted horizontal rods of light that fell in thin parallels across Dorothy's skirt. The street was silent save for a group on the steps of a house across the way who, from time to time, raised their voices in a soft bantering song. When you wake, you shall have all the pretty little houses. Then, as though it had been waiting on a nearby roof for their arrival, the moon came slanting suddenly through the vines and turned the girl's face to the color of white roses. Anthony had a start of memory, so vivid that, before his closed eyes there formed a picture, distinct as a flashback on a screen, a spring night of thaw set out of time in a half-forgotten winter five years before, another face, radiant, flower-like, upturned to lights as transforming as the stars. Ah, la belle dame sans merci, who lived in his heart, made known to him in transitory, fading splendor by dark eyes in the Ritz-Carlton, by a shadowy glance from a passing carriage in the Bois de Boulogne. But those nights were only part of a song, a remembered glory. Here again were the faint winds, the illusions, the eternal present with its promise of romance. Oh, she whispered, do you love me? Do you love me? The spell was broken. The drifted fragments of the stars became only light. The singing down the street diminished to a monotone, to the whimper of locusts in the grass. With almost a sigh, he kissed her fervent mouth while her arms crept up about his shoulders. The Man at Arms As the weeks dried up and blew away, the range of Anthony's travels extended until he grew to comprehend the camp and its environment. For the first time in life he was in constant personal contact with the waiters to whom he had given tips, the chauffeurs who had touched their hats to him, the carpenters, plumbers, barbers and farmers, who had previously been remarkable only in the subservience of their professional genuflections. During his first two months in camp he did not hold ten minutes consecutive conversation with a single man. On his service record his occupation stood as student. On the original questionnaire he had prematurely written author, but when men in his company asked his business he commonly gave it as bank clerk. Had he told the truth that he did no work, they would have been suspicious of him as a member of the leisure class. His platoon sergeant, Pop Donnelly, was a scraggly old soldier, worn thin with drink. In the past he had spent unnumbered weeks in the guardhouse, but recently, thanks to the drill master Famine, he had been elevated to his present pinnacle. His complexion was full of shell holes. It bore an unmistakable resemblance to those aerial photographs of the battlefield at blank. Once a week he got drunk downtown on white liquor, returned quietly to camp and collapsed upon his bunk, joining the company at Reveille, looking more than ever like a white mask of death. 
he nursed the astounding delusion that he was astutely slipping it over on the government. He had spent eighteen years in its service at a minute wage, and he was soon to retire, here he usually winked, on the impressive income of fifty-five dollars a month. He looked upon it as a gorgeous joke that he had played upon the dozens who had bullied and scorned him since he was a Georgia country boy of nineteen. At present there were but two lieutenants, Hopkins and the popular Cretching. The latter was considered a good fellow and a fine leader until a year later when he disappeared with a mess fund of eleven hundred dollars and, like so many leaders, proved exceedingly difficult to follow. Eventually there was Captain Dunning, god of this brief but self-sufficing microcosm. He was a reserve officer, nervous, energetic, and enthusiastic. This latter quality, indeed, often took material form and was visible as fine froth in the corners of his mouth. Like most executives, he saw his charges strictly from the front, and to his hopeful eyes his command seemed just such an excellent unit as such an excellent war deserved. For all his anxiety and absorption he was having the time of his life. Baptiste, the little Sicilian of the train, fell foul of him the second week of drill. The captain had, several times, ordered the men to be clean-shaven when they fell in each morning. One day there was disclosed an alarming breach of this rule, surely a case of Teutonic connivance. During the night four men had grown hair upon their faces. The fact that three of the four understood a minimum of English made a practical object lesson only the more necessary, so Captain Dunning resolutely sent a volunteer barber back to the company street for a razor. Whereupon, for the safety of democracy, a half ounce of hair was scraped dry from the cheeks of three Italians in one pole. Outside the world of the company there appeared, from time to time, the colonel, a heavy man with snarling teeth, who circumnavigated the battalion drill field upon a handsome black horse. He was a West Pointer and, mimetically, a gentleman. He had a dowdy wife and a dowdy mind, and spent much of his time in town taking advantage of the army's lately exalted social position. Last of all was the general, who traversed the roads of the camp preceded by his flag, a figure so austere, so removed, so magnificent, as to be scarcely comprehensible. December. Cool winds at night now, and damp, chilly mornings on the drill grounds. As the heat faded, Anthony found himself increasingly glad to be alive. Renewed strangely through his body, he worried little and existed in the present with a sort of animal content. It was not that Gloria, or the life that Gloria represented, was less often in his thoughts. It was simply that she became, day by day, less real, less vivid. For a week they had corresponded passionately, almost hysterically. Then, by an unwritten agreement, they had ceased to write more than twice, and then once a week. She was bored, she said. If his brigade was to be there a long time, she was coming down to join him. Mr. Haight was going to be able to submit a stronger brief than he had expected, but doubted that the appealed case would come up until late spring. Muriel was in the city, doing Red Cross work, and they went out together rather often. What would Anthony think if she went into the Red Cross? Trouble was, she had heard that she might have to bathe Negroes in alcohol, and after that she hadn't felt so patriotic. The city was full of soldiers, and she'd seen a lot of boys she hadn't laid eyes on for years. Anthony did not want her to come south. He told himself that this was for many reasons. He needed a rest from her, and she from him. She would be bored beyond measure in town, and she would be able to see Anthony for only a few hours each day. But in his heart he feared that it was because he was attracted to Dorothy. As a matter of fact, he lived in terror that Gloria should learn by some chance or intention of the relation he had formed. By the end of a fortnight the entanglement began to give him moments of misery at his own faithlessness. Nevertheless, as each day ended, he was unable to withstand the lure that would draw him irresistibly out of his tent and over to the telephone at the YMCA. Dot. Yes? I may be able to get in tonight. I'm so glad. Do you want to listen to my splendid eloquence for a few starry hours? Oh, you funny. For an instant he had a memory of five years before, of Geraldine. Then, I'll arrive about eight. At seven he would be in a jitney bound for the city, 
where hundreds of little southern girls were waiting on moonlit porches for their lovers. He would be excited already for her warm, retarded kisses, for the amazed quietude of the glances she gave him, glances nearer to worship than any he had ever inspired. Gloria and he had been equals, giving without thought of thanks or obligation. To this girl his very caresses were an inestimable boon. Crying quietly, she had confessed to him that he was not the first man in her life, that there had been one other. He gathered that the affair had no sooner commenced than it had been over. Indeed, so far as she was concerned, she spoke the truth. She had forgotten the clerk, the naval officer, the clothier's son, forgotten her vividness of emotion, which is true forgetting. She knew that in some opaque and shadowy existence, someone had taken her. It was as though it had occurred in sleep. Almost every night Anthony came to town. It was too cool now for the porch, so her mother surrendered to them the tiny sitting-room with its dozens of cheaply framed chromos, its yard upon yard of decorative fringe, and its thick atmosphere of several decades in the proximity of the kitchen. They would build a fire, then, happily, inexhaustibly, she would go about the business of love. Each evening at ten she would walk with him to the door, her black hair in disarray, her pale face without cosmetics, paler still under the whiteness of the moon. As a rule it would be bright and silver outside. Now and then there was a slow, warm rain, too indolent almost to reach the ground. "'Say you love me,' she would whisper. "'Why, of course, you sweet baby.' "'Am I, baby?' "'This almost wistfully. "'Just a little baby.' "'She knew vaguely of Gloria. "'It gave her pain to think of it, "'so she imagined her to be haughty and proud and cold. "'She had decided that Gloria must be older than Anthony, "'and that there was no love between husband and wife. "'Sometimes she let herself dream that after the war "'Anthony would get a divorce and they would be married. "'But she never mentioned this to Anthony. "'She scarcely knew why.' She shared his company's idea that he was a sort of bank clerk. She thought that he was respectable and poor. She would say, "'If I had some money, darling, I'd give every bit of it to you. I'd like to have about fifty thousand dollars.' "'I suppose that'd be plenty,' agreed Anthony. In her letter that day, Gloria had written, "'I suppose if we could settle for a million, it would be better to tell Mr. Hake to go ahead and settle, but it'd seem a pity.' "'We could have an automobile!' exclaimed Dot, in a final burst of triumph. An Impressive Occasion Captain Dunning prided himself on being a great reader of character. Half an hour after meeting a man, he was accustomed to place him in one of a number of astonishing categories. Fine man, good man, smart fellow, theorizer, poet, and worthless. One day, early in February, he caused Anthony to be summoned to his presence in the orderly tent. Patch, he said sententiously, I've had my eye on you for several weeks. Anthony stood erect and motionless. And I think you've got the makings of a good soldier. He waited for the warm glow, which this would naturally arouse, to cool, and then continued. This is no child's play, he said, narrowing his brows. Anthony agreed with a melancholy. No, sir. It's a man's game, and we need leaders. Then the climax, swift, sure, and electric. Patch, I'm going to make you a corporal. At this point, Anthony should have staggered slightly backward, overwhelmed. He was to be one of the quarter million selected for that consummate trust. He was going to be able to shout the technical phrase, Follow me, to seven other frightened men. You seem to be a man of some education, said Captain Dunning. Yes, sir. That's good, that's good. Education's a great thing, but don't let it go to your head. Keep on the way you're going, and you'll be a good soldier. With these parting words lingering in his ears, Corporal Patch saluted, executed a right about face, and left the tent. Though the conversation amused Anthony, it did generate the idea that life would be more exciting as a sergeant, or, should he find a less exacting medical examiner, as an officer. He was little interested in the work, which seemed to belie the army's boasted gallantry. At the inspections, one did not dress up to look well, one dressed up to keep from looking badly. But as winter wore away, 
the short snowless winter marked by damp nights and cool rainy days he marvelled at how quickly the system had grasped him he was a soldier all who were not soldiers were civilians the world was divided primarily into those two classifications it occurred to him that all strongly accentuated classes such as the military divided men into two kinds their own kind and those without to the clergyman there were clergy and laity to the catholic there were catholics and non-catholics to the negro there were blacks and whites to the prisoner there were the imprisoned and the free and to the sick man there were the sick and the well so without thinking of it once in his lifetime he had been a civilian a layman a non-catholic a gentile white free and well as the american troops were poured into the french and british trenches he began to find the names of many Harvard men among the casualties recorded in the Army and Navy Journal. But for all the sweat and blood the situation appeared unchanged, and he saw no prospect of the war's ending in the perceptible future. In the old chronicles the right wing of one army always defeated the left wing of the other, the left wing being, meanwhile, vanquished by the enemy's right. After that the mercenaries fled. It had been so simple in those days, almost as if prearranged. Gloria wrote that she was reading a great deal. What a mess they had made of their affairs, she said. She had so little to do now that she spent her time imagining how differently things might have turned out. Her whole environment appeared insecure, and a few years back she had seemed to hold all the strings in her own little hand. In June her letters grew hurried and less frequent. She suddenly ceased to write about coming south. End of Book 3, Chapter 1, Part 1 of 2《Book 3, Chapter 1, Part 2 of 2 of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald Book Three, Chapter One, A Matter of Civilization, Part Two of Two Defeat March in the country around was rare with jasmine and jonquils and patches of violets in the warming grass. Afterward, he remembered especially one afternoon of such a fresh and magic glamour that as he stood in the rifle pit marking targets he recited Atlanta in Caledon to an uncomprehending pole, his voice mingling with the rip, sing, and splatter of bullets overhead. When the hounds of spring, spang, are on winter's traces, were the mother of months, hey, come to Mark three. In town the streets were in a sleepy dream again, and together Anthony and Dot idled in their own tracks of the previous autumn, until he began to feel a drowsy attachment for this south, a south, it seemed, more of Algiers than of Italy, with faded aspirations pointing back over innumerable generations to some warm, primitive nirvana without hope or care. Here there was an inflection of cordiality, of comprehension, in every voice, Life plays the same lovely and agonizing joke on all of us, they seem to say in their plaintive, pleasant cadence, in the rising inflection terminating on an unresolved minor. He liked his barber shop, where he was, Hi, Corporal, to a pale, emaciated young man who shaved him and pushed a cool, vibrating machine endlessly over his insatiable head. He liked Johnston's Gardens, where they danced, where a tragic negro made yearning, aching music on a saxophone until the garish hall became an enchanted jungle of barbaric rhythms and smoky laughter, where to forget the uneventful passage of time upon Dorothy's soft sighs and tender whisperings was the consummation of all aspiration, of all content. There was an undertone of sadness in her character, a conscious evasion of all except the pleasurable minutiae of life, her violet eyes would remain for hours apparently insensate as, thoughtful and reckless, she basked like a cat in the sun. He wondered what the tired, spiritless mother thought of them, 
and whether in her moments of uttermost cynicism she ever guessed at their relationship. On Sunday afternoons they walked along the countryside, resting at intervals on the dry moss in the outskirts of a wood. Here the birds had gathered, and the clusters of violets in white dogwood. Here the hoar-trees shone crystalline and cool, oblivious to the intoxicating heat that waited outside. Here he would talk, intermittently, in a sleepy monologue, in a conversation of no significance, of no replies. July came scorching down. Captain Dunning was ordered to detail one of his men to learn blacksmithing. The regiment was filling up to war strength, and he needed most of his veterans for drill masters, so he selected the little Italian, Baptiste, whom he could most easily spare. Little Baptiste had never had anything to do with horses. His fear made matters worse. He reappeared in the orderly room one day and told Captain Dunning that he wanted to die if he couldn't be relieved. The horses kicked at him, he said. He was no good at the work. Finally, he fell on his knees and besought Captain Dunning, in a mixture of broken English and scriptural Italian, to get him out of it. He had not slept for three days. Monstrous stallions reared and cavorted through his dreams. Captain Dunning reproved the company clerk, who had burst out laughing, and told Baptiste he would do what he could. But when he thought it over, he decided that he couldn't spare a better man. Little Baptiste went from bad to worse. The horses seemed to divine his fear and take every advantage of it. Two weeks later a great black mare crushed his skull in with her hoofs while he was trying to lead her from her stall. In mid-July came rumors, and then orders, that concerned a change of camp. The brigade was to move to an empty cantonment a hundred miles farther south, there to be expanded into a division. At first the men thought they were departing for the trenches, and all evening little groups jabbered in the company street, shouting to each other in swaggering exclamations, "'Sure we are!' When the truth leaked out, it was rejected indignantly as a blind to conceal their real destination. They reveled in their own importance. That night they told their girls in town that they were going to get the Germans. Anthony circulated for a while among the groups, then, stopping a jitney, rode down to tell Dot that he was going away. She was waiting on the dark veranda in a cheap white dress that accentuated the youth and softness of her face. Oh, she whispered, I've wanted you so, honey, all this day. I have something to tell you. She drew him down beside her on the swinging seat, not noticing his ominous tone. Tell me. We're leaving next week. Her arms, seeking his shoulders, remained poised upon the dark air, her chin tipped up. When she spoke, the softness was gone from her voice. Leaving for France? No, less luck than that leaving for some darn camp in Mississippi. She shut her eyes, and he could see that the lids were trembling. Dear little Dot, life is so damned hard. She was crying upon his shoulder. So damned hard, he repeated aimlessly. So damned hard. It just hurts people and hurts people until finally it hurts them so that they can't be hurt ever any more. That's the last and worst thing it does. Frantic, wild with anguish, she strained him to her breast. Oh, God, she whispered brokenly, you can't go away from me. I'd die. He was finding it impossible now to pass off his departure as a common, impersonal blow. He was too near to her to do more than repeat, poor little Dot, poor little Dot. And then what? she demanded wearily. What do you mean? You're my whole life, that's all. I'd die for you right now if you said so. I'd get a knife and kill myself. You can't leave me here. Her tone frightened him. These things happen, he said evenly. Then I'm going with you. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. Her mouth was trembling in an ecstasy of grief and fear. Sweet, he muttered sentimentally. Sweet little girl. Don't you see we'd just be putting off what's bound to happen? I'll be going to France in a few months. She leaned away from him and, clinching her fists, lifted her face toward the sky. "'I want to die,' she said, as if molding each word carefully in her heart. "'Dot,' he whispered uncomfortably, "'you'll forget. Things are sweeter when they're lost.' 
I know, because once I wanted something and got it. It was the only thing I ever wanted badly, Dot, and when I got it it turned to dust in my hands. All right. Absorbed in himself, he continued, I've often thought that if I hadn't got what I wanted, things might have been different with me. I might have found something in my mind and enjoyed putting it in circulation. I might have been content with the work of it and had some sweet vanity out of the success. I suppose that at one time I could have had anything I wanted within reason, but that was the only thing I ever wanted with any fervor. God! And that taught me you can't have anything, you can't have anything at all, because desire just cheats you. It's like a sunbeam skipping here and there about a room. It stops and gilds some inconsequential object, and we poor fools try to grasp it. But when we do, the sunbeam moves on to something else, and you've got the inconsequential part. The glitter that made you want it is gone. He broke off uneasily. She had risen and was standing, dry-eyed, picking little leaves from a dark vine. Dot, go away, she said coldly. What? Why? I don't want just words. If that's all you have for me, you'd better go. Why, Dot, what's death to me is just a lot of words to you. You put them together so pretty. I'm sorry. I was talking about you, Dot. Go away from here. He approached her with arms outstretched, but she held him away. You don't want me to go with you, she said evenly, because you're going to meet that, that girl. She could not bring herself to say wife. How do I know? Well, then, I reckon you're not my fellow any more, so go away. For a moment, while conflicting warnings and desires prompted Anthony, it seemed one of those rare times when he would take a step prompted from within. He hesitated. Then a wave of weariness broke against him. It was too late. Everything was too late. For years now he had dreamed the world away, basing his decisions upon emotions unstable as water. The little girl in the white dress dominated him as she approached beauty in the hard symmetry of her desire. The fire blazing in her dark and injured heart seemed to glow around her like a flame. With some profound and uncharted pride, she had made herself remote, and so achieved her purpose. I didn't mean to seem so callous, Dot. It don't matter. The fire rolled over Anthony. Something wrenched at his bowels, and he stood there, helpless and beaten. Come with me, Dot, little loving Dot. Oh, come with me. I couldn't leave you now. With a sob she wound her arms around him, and let him support her weight while the moon, at its perennial labor of covering the bad complexion of the world, showed its illicit honey over the drowsy street. THE CATASTROPHE Early September in Camp Boone, Mississippi. The darkness, alive with insects, beat in upon the mosquito netting, beneath the shelter of which Anthony was trying to write a letter. An intermittent chatter over a poker game was going on in the next tent, and outside a man was strolling up the company street, singing a current bit of doggerel about k k, -k katie With an effort, Anthony hoisted himself to his elbow and, pencil in hand, looked down at his blank sheet of paper. Then, omitting any heading, he began, I can't imagine what the matter is, Gloria. I haven't had a line from you for two weeks, and it's only natural to be worried. He threw this away with a disturbed grunt and began again. I don't know what to think, Gloria. Your last letter, short, cold, without a word of affection or even a decent account of what you've been doing, came two weeks ago. It's only natural that I should wonder. If your love for me isn't absolutely dead, it seems that you'd at least keep me from worry. Again he crumpled the page and tossed it angrily through a tear in the tent wall realizing simultaneously that he would have to pick it up in the morning. He felt disinclined to try again. He could get no warmth into the lines, only a persistent jealousy and suspicion. Since midsummer, these discrepancies in Gloria's correspondence had grown more and more noticeable. At first he had scarcely perceived them. He was so inured to the perfunctory dearest and darlings scattered through her letters that he was oblivious to their presence or absence. But in this last fortnight he had become increasingly aware that there was something amiss. 
He had sent her a night letter saying that he had passed his examinations for an officer's training camp and expected to leave for Georgia shortly. She had not answered. He had wired again. When he received no word, he imagined that she might be out of town. But it occurred and recurred to him that she was not out of town, and a series of distraught imaginings began to plague him. Supposing Gloria, bored and restless, had found someone, even as he had, the thought terrified him with its possibility. It was chiefly because he had been so sure of her personal integrity that he had considered her so sparingly during the year. And now, as a doubt was born, the old angers, the rages of possession, swarmed back a thousandfold. What more natural than that she should be in love again? He remembered the Gloria who promised that, should she ever want anything, she would take it, insisting that, since she would act entirely for her own satisfaction, she could go through such an affair unsmirched. It was only the effect on a person's mind that counted, anyhow, she said, and her reaction would be the masculine one, of satiation and faint dislike. But that had been when they were first married. Later, with the discovery that she could be jealous of Anthony, she had, outwardly at least, changed her mind. There were no other men in the world for her. This he had known only too early. Perceiving that a certain fastidiousness would restrain her, he had grown lax in preserving the completeness of her love, which, after all, was the keystone of the entire structure. Meanwhile, all through the summer he had been maintaining Dot in a boarding-house downtown. To do this, it had been necessary to write to his broker for money. Dot had covered her journey south by leaving her house a day before the brigade broke camp, informing her mother in a note that she had gone to New York. On the evening following, Anthony had called as though to see her. Mrs. Raycroft was in a state of collapse, and there was a policeman in the parlor. A questionnaire had ensued, from which Anthony had extricated himself with some difficulty. In September, with his suspicions of Gloria, the company of Dot had become tedious, then almost intolerable. He was nervous and irritable from lack of sleep. His heart was sick and afraid. Three days ago he had gone to Captain Dunning and asked for a furlough, only to be met with benignant procrastination. The division was starting overseas, while Anthony was going to an officer's training camp. What furloughs could be given must go to the men who were leaving the country. Upon this refusal, Anthony had started to the telegraph office, intending to wire Gloria to come south. He reached the door and receded despairingly seeing the utter impracticality of such a move. Then he had spent the evening quarreling irritably with Dot, and returned to camp morose and angry with the world. There had been a disagreeable scene, in the midst of which he had precipitately departed. What was to be done with her did not seem to concern him vitally at present. He was completely absorbed in the disheartening silence of his wife. The flap of the tent made a sudden triangle back upon itself and a dark head appeared against the night. "'Sergeant Patch?' The accent was Italian, and Anthony saw by the belt that the man was a headquarters orderly. "'Want me?' "'Lady, call up headquarters ten minutes ago. Say she have speak with you. Very important.' Anthony swept aside the mosquito netting and stood up. It might be a wire from Gloria, telephoned over. "'She say to get you. She call again ten o'clock.' All right, thanks. He picked up his hat and in a moment was striding beside the orderly through the hot, almost suffocating darkness. Over in the headquarters shack, he saluted a dozing night service officer. Sit down and wait, suggested the lieutenant nonchalantly. Girl seemed awful anxious to speak to you. Anthony's hopes fell away. Thank you very much, sir. And as the phone squeaked on the sidewall, he knew who was calling. This is Dot, came an unsteady voice. I've got to see you. Dot, I told you I couldn't get down for several days. I've got to see you tonight. It's important. It's too late, he said coldly. It's ten o'clock, and I have to be in camp at eleven. All right. There was so much wretchedness compressed into the two words that Anthony felt a measure of compunction. What's the matter? I want to tell you good-bye. Oh, don't be a little idiot, he exclaimed, but his spirits rose. 
What luck if she should leave town this very night! What a burden from his soul! But he said, You can't possibly leave before tomorrow. Out of the corner of his eye he saw the night service officer regarding him quizzically. Then, startlingly, came Dot's next words. I don't mean leave that way. Anthony's hand clutched the receiver fiercely. He felt his nerves turning cold, as if the heat was leaving his body. What? Then quickly, in a wild, broken voice, he heard, Goodbye, oh, goodbye. Clip. She had hung up the receiver. With a sound that was half a gasp, half a cry, Anthony hurried from the headquarters building. Outside, under the stars that dripped like silver tassels through the trees of the little grove, he stood motionless, hesitating. Had she meant to kill herself? Oh, the little fool! He was filled with bitter hate toward her. In this denouement he found it impossible to realize that he had ever begun such an entanglement, such a mess, a sordid melange of worry and pain. He found himself walking slowly away, repeating over and over that it was futile to worry. He had best go back to his tent and sleep. He needed sleep. God! Would he ever sleep again? His mind was in a vast clamor and confusion. As he reached the road he turned around in a panic and began running, not toward his company but away from it. Men were returning now, he could find a taxicab. After a minute two yellow eyes appeared around a bend. Desperately, he ran toward them. Jitney! Jitney! It was an empty Ford. I want to go to town. Cost you a dollar. All right, if you'll just hurry. After an interminable time, he ran up the steps of a dark, ramshackle little house and through the door, almost knocking over an immense negress who was walking, candle in hand, along the hall. Where's my wife? He cried wildly. She gone to bed up the stairs, three at a time, down the creaking passage. The room was dark and silent, and with trembling fingers he struck a match. Two wide eyes looked up at him from a wretched ball of clothes on the bed. "'Ah, I knew you'd come,' she murmured brokenly. Anthony grew cold with anger. "'So it was just a plan to get me down here, get me in trouble,' he said. "'God damn it, you've shouted wolf once too often.' She regarded him pitifully. I had to see you. I couldn't have lived. Oh, I had to see you. He sat down on the side of the bed and slowly shook his head. You're no good, he said decisively, talking unconsciously, as Gloria might have talked to him. This sort of thing isn't fair to me, you know. Come closer. Whatever he might say, Dot was happy now. He cared for her. She had brought him to her side. Oh, God, said Anthony hopelessly. As weariness rolled along its inevitable wave, his anger subsided, receded, vanished. He collapsed suddenly, fell sobbing beside her on the bed. Oh, my darling, she begged him, don't cry, oh, don't cry. She took his head upon her breast and soothed him, mingled her happy tears with the bitterness of his. Her hand played gently with his dark hair. I'm such a little fool she murmured brokenly, but I love you, and when you're cold to me it seems as if it isn't worth while to go on living. After all, this was peace, the quiet room with the mingled scent of women's powder and perfume, Dot's hand soft as a warm wind upon his hair, the rise and fall of her bosom as she took breath. For a moment it was as though it were Gloria there, as though he were at rest in some sweeter and safer home than he had ever known. An hour passed. A clock began to chime in the hall. He jumped to his feet and looked at the phosphorescent hands of his wristwatch. It was twelve o'clock. He had trouble in finding a taxi that would take him out at that hour. As he urged the driver faster along the road, he speculated on the best method of entering camp. He had been late several times recently, and he knew that, were he caught again, his name would probably be stricken from the list of officer candidates. He wondered if he had better not dismiss the taxi and take a chance on passing the sentry in the dark. Still, officers often rode past the sentries after midnight. Halt! The monosyllable came from the yellow glare that the headlights dropped upon the changing road. The taxi driver threw out his clutch and a sentry walked up, carrying his rifle at the port. With him, 
by an ill chance, was an officer of the guard. Out late, sergeant? Yes, sir. Got delayed. Too bad. Have to take your name. As the officer waited, notebook and pencil in hand, something not fully intended crowded to Anthony's lips, something born of panic, of muddle, of despair. Sergeant R. A. Foley, he answered breathlessly. And the outfit? Company Q, 83rd Infantry. All right. You'll have to walk from here, sergeant. Anthony saluted, quickly paid his taxi driver, and set off for a run toward the regiment he had named. When he was out of sight, he changed his course, and with his heart beating wildly, hurried to his company, feeling that he had made a fatal error of judgment. Two days later, the officer who had been in command of the guard recognized him in a barber shop downtown. In charge of a military policeman, he was taken back to the camp, where he was reduced to the ranks without trial and confined for a month to the limits of his company street. With this blow a spell of utter depression overtook him, and within a week he was again caught downtown, wandering around in a drunken daze, with a pint of bootleg whiskey in his hip pocket. It was because of a sort of craziness in his behavior at the trial that his sentence to the guardhouse was for only three weeks. Nightmare Early in his confinement, the conviction took root in him that he was going mad. It was as though there were a quantity of dark yet vivid personalities in his mind, some of them familiar, some of them strange and terrible, held in check by a little monitor who sat aloft somewhere and looked on. The thing that worried him was that the monitor was sick and holding out with difficulty. Should he give up, should he falter for a moment, out would rush these intolerable things, only Anthony could know what a state of blackness there would be if the worst of him could roam, his consciousness unchecked. The heat of the day had changed somehow, until it was a burnished darkness crushing down upon a devastated land. Over his head the blue circles of ominous uncharted suns, of unnumbered centers of fire, revolved interminably before his eyes as though he were lying constantly exposed to the hot light and in a state of feverish coma. At seven in the morning, something phantasmal, something almost absurdly unreal, that he knew was his mortal body, went out with seven other prisoners and two guards to work on the camp roads. One day they loaded and unloaded quantities of gravel, spread it, raked it. The next day they worked with huge barrels of red-hot tar, flooding the gravel with black, shining pools of molten heat. At night, locked up in the guardhouse, he would lie without thought, without courage to compass thought, staring at the irregular beams of the ceiling overhead until about three o'clock, when he would slip into a broken, troubled sleep. During the work hours he labored with uneasy haste, attempting, as the day bore toward the sultry Mississippi sunset, to tire himself physically so that in the evening he might sleep deeply from utter exhaustion. Then one afternoon, the second week, he had a feeling that two eyes were watching him from a place a few feet beyond one of the guards. This aroused him to a sort of terror. He turned his back on the eyes and shoveled feverishly until it became necessary for him to face about and go for more gravel. Then they entered his vision again, and his already taut nerves tightened up to the breaking point. The eyes were leering at him. Out of a hot silence he heard his name called in a tragic voice, and the earth tipped absurdly back and forth to a babble of shouting and confusion. When next he became conscious, he was back in the guardhouse, and the other prisoners were throwing him curious glances. The eyes returned no more. It was many days before he realized, the voice must have been Dot's, that she had called out to him and made some sort of disturbance. He decided this just previous to the expiration of his sentence, when the cloud that oppressed him had lifted, leaving him in a deep, dispirited lethargy. As the conscious mediator, the monitor who kept that fearsome melange of horror, grew stronger, Anthony became physically weaker. He was scarcely able to get through the two days of toil, and when he was released one rainy afternoon, and returned to his company, he reached his tent only to fall into a heavy doze, from which he awoke before dawn, aching and unrefreshed. Beside his cot were two letters that had been awaiting him in the orderly tent for some time. The first was from Gloria. It was short and cool. The case is coming to trial late in November. Can you possibly get leave? I've tried to write you again and again, but it just seems to make things worse. 
I want to see you about several matters, but you know that you have once prevented me from coming, and I am disinclined to try again. In view of a number of things, it seems necessary that we have a conference. I'm very glad about your appointment. Gloria. He was too tired to try to understand, or to care. Her phrases, her intentions, were all very far away in an incomprehensible past. At the second letter he scarcely glanced. It was from Dot, an incoherent, tear-swollen scrawl, a flood of protest, endearment, and grief. After a pause he let it slip from his inert hand and drowsed back into a nebulous hinterland of his own. At drill call he awoke with a high fever and fainted when he tried to leave his tent. At noon he was sent to the base hospital with influenza. He was aware that this sickness was providential. It saved him from a hysterical relapse, and he recovered in time to entrain on a damp November day for New York and for the interminable massacre beyond. When the regiment reached Camp Mills, Long Island, Anthony's single idea was to get into the city and see Gloria as soon as possible. It was now evident that an armistice would be signed within the week, but rumor had it that, in any case, troops would continue to be shipped to France until the last moment. Anthony was appalled at the notion of the long voyage, of the tedious debarkation at a French port, of being kept abroad for a year, possibly, to replace the troops who had seen actual fighting. His intention had been to obtain a two-day furlough, but Camp Mills proved to be under a strict influenza quarantine. It was impossible for even an officer to leave except on official business. For a private, it was out of the question. The camp itself was a dreary muddle, cold, windswept, and filthy, with the accumulated dirt incident to the passage through of many divisions. Their train came in at seven one night, and they waited in line until one, while a military tangle was straightened out somewhere ahead. Officers ran up and down ceaselessly, calling orders and making a great uproar. It turned out that the trouble was due to the colonel, who was in a righteous temper because he was a West Pointer and the war was going to stop before he could get overseas. Had the militant governments realized the number of broken hearts among the older West Pointers during that week, they would indubitably have prolonged the slaughter another month. The thing was pitiable. Gazing out at the bleak expanse of tents, extending for miles over a trodden welter of slush and snow, Anthony saw the impracticality of trudging to a telephone that night. He would call her at the first opportunity in the morning. Aroused in the chill and bitter dawn, he stood at Reveille and listened to a passionate harangue from Captain Dunning. "'You men may think the war is over. Well, let me tell you, it isn't. Those fellows aren't going to go sign the armistice.' It's another trick, and we'd be crazy to let anything slacken up here in the company because, let me tell you, we're going to sail from here within a week, and when we do, we're going to see some real fighting. He paused that they might get the full effect of his pronouncement. And then, if you think the war's over, just talk to anyone who's been in it and see if they think the Germans are all in. They don't. Nobody does. I've talked to the people that know, and they say there'll be, anyways, a year longer of war. They don't think it's over so you men better not get any foolish ideas that it is. Doubly stressing this final admonition, he ordered the company dismissed. At noon, Anthony set off at a run for the nearest canteen telephone. As he approached what corresponded to the downtown of the camp, he noticed that many other soldiers were running also, that a man near him had suddenly leaped into the air and clicked his heels together. The tendency to run became general, and from little excited groups here and there came the sounds of cheering. He stopped and listened. Over the cold country, whistles were blowing, and the chimes of the Garden City churches broke suddenly into reverberatory sound. Anthony began to run again. The cries were clear and distinct now as they rose with clouds of frosted breath into the chilly air. Germany surrendered! Germany surrendered! The False Armistice that evening, in the opaque gloom of six o'clock, Anthony slipped between two freight cars, and once over the railroad, followed the track along to Garden City, where he caught an electric train for New York. He stood some chance of apprehension. He knew that the military police were often sent through the cars to ask for passes, but he imagined that tonight the vigilance would be relaxed. But in any event, he would have tried to slip through, for he had been unable to locate Gloria by telephone and another day of suspense would have been intolerable. 
After inexplicable stops and waits that reminded him of the night he had left New York over a year before, they drew into the Pennsylvania station, and he followed the familiar way to the taxi stand, finding it grotesque and oddly stimulating to give his own address. Broadway was a riot of light, thronged as he had never seen it with a carnival crowd which swept its glittering way through scraps of paper piled ankle-deep on the sidewalks. Here and there, elevated upon benches and boxes, soldiers addressed the heedless mass, each face in which was clear-cut and distinct under the white glare overhead. Anthony picked out half a dozen figures. A drunken sailor, tipped backward and supported by two other gobs, was waving his hat and emitting a wild series of roars. A wounded soldier, crutch in hand, was borne along in an eddy of shoulders of some shrieking civilians. A dark-haired girl sat cross-legged and meditative on top of a parked taxicab. Here, surely, the victory had come in time. The climax had been scheduled with the uttermost celestial foresight. The great, rich nation had made triumphant war, suffered enough for poignancy, but not enough for bitterness. Hence the carnival, the feasting, the triumph— under these bright lights glittered the faces of peoples whose glory had long since passed away, whose very civilizations were dead, men whose ancestors had heard the news of victory in Babylon, in Nineveh, in Baghdad, in Tyre, a hundred generations before, men whose ancestors had seen a flower-decked, slave-adorned cortege drift with its wake of captives down the avenues of imperial Rome. Past the Rialto, the glittering front of the Astor, the jeweled magnificence of Times Square, a gorgeous alley of incandescence ahead. Then, was it years later? He was paying the taxi driver in front of a white building on 57th Street. He was in the hall. Ah, there was the Negro boy from Martinique, lazy, indolent, unchanged. Is Mrs. Patch in? I have just come on, sir, the man announced with his incongruous British accent. Take me up. Then the slow drone of the elevator, the three steps to the door which swung open at the impetus of his knock. Gloria? His voice was trembling. No answer. A faint string of smoke was rising from a cigarette tray. A number of Vanity Fair sat astraddle on the table. Gloria! He ran into the bathroom, the bath. She was not there. A negligee of robin's egg blue laid out upon the bed, diffused a faint perfume, elusive and familiar. On a chair were a pair of stockings and a street dress. An open powder box yawned upon the bureau. She must have just gone out. The telephone rang abruptly, and he started, answered it with all the sensations of an impostor. Hello, is Mrs. Patch there? No, I'm looking for her myself. Who is this? This is Mr. Crawford. This is Mr. Patch speaking. I've just arrived unexpectedly, and I don't know where to find her. Oh, Mr. Crawford sounded a bit taken aback. Why, I imagine she's at the armistice ball. I know she intended going, but I didn't think she'd leave so early. Where's the armistice ball? At the Astor. Thanks. Anthony hung up sharply and rose. Who was Mr. Crawford? And who was it that was taking her to the ball? How long had this been going on? All these questions asked and answered themselves a dozen times, a dozen ways. His very proximity to her drove him half frantic. In a frenzy of suspicion, he rushed here and there about the apartment, hunting for some sign of masculine occupation, opening the bathroom cupboard, searching feverishly through the bureau drawers. Then he found something that made him stop suddenly and sit down on one of the twin beds, the corners of his mouth drooping as though he were about to weep. There, in the corner of her drawer, tied with a frail blue ribbon, were all the letters and telegrams he had written to her during the year past. He was suffused with happy and sentimental shame. I'm not fit to touch her, he cried aloud to the four walls. I'm not fit to touch her little hand. Nevertheless, he went out to look for her. In the Astor lobby he was engulfed immediately in a crowd so thick as to make progress almost impossible. He asked the direction of the ballroom from half a dozen people before he could get a sober and intelligible answer. Eventually, after a last long wait, he checked his military overcoat in the hall. It was only nine, but the dance was in full blast. The panorama was incredible. Women, women everywhere. Girls gay with wine, singing shrilly above the clamor of the dazzling, confetti-covered throng. 
girls set off by the uniforms of a dozen nations, fat females collapsing without dignity upon the floor and retaining self-respect by shouting, Hurrah for the Allies! Three women with white hair dancing hand in hand around a sailor who revolved in a dizzying spin upon the floor, clasping to his heart an empty bottle of champagne. Breathlessly, Anthony scanned the dancers, scanned the muddled lines trailing in single file in and out among the tables, scanned the horn-blowing, kissing, coughing, laughing, drinking parties under the great full-bosomed flags which leaned in glowing color over the pageantry and the sound. Then he saw Gloria. She was sitting at a table for two directly across the room. Her dress was black, and above it her animated face tinted with the most glamorous rose, made, he thought, a spot of poignant beauty on the room. His heart leaped as though to a new music. He jostled his way toward her and called her name just as the gray eyes looked up and found him. For that instant, as their bodies met and melted, the world, the revel, the tumbling whimper of the music faded to an ecstatic monotone, hushed as a song of bees. "'Oh, my Gloria!' he cried. Her kiss was a cool rill flowing from her heart. End of Book Three, Chapter One, Part Two of Two. Book Three, Chapter Two, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Three, Chapter Two A Matter of Aesthetics. Part One of Two. On the night when Anthony had left for Camp Hooker one year before, all that was left of the beautiful Gloria Gilbert, her shell, her young and lovely body, moved up the broad marble steps of the Grand Central Station, with the rhythm of the engine beating in her ears like a dream, and out onto Vanderbilt Avenue, where the huge bulk of the Biltmore overhung the street, and, down at its low, gleaming entrance, sucked in the many-colored opera cloaks of gorgeously dressed girls. For a moment she paused by the taxi stand and watched them, wondering that, but a few years before she had been of their number, ever setting out for a radiant somewhere, always just about to have that ultimate passionate adventure for which the girls' cloaks were delicate and beautifully furred, for which their cheeks were painted and their hearts higher than the transitory dome of pleasure that would engulf them, coiffure, cloak and all. It was growing colder, and the men passing had flipped up the collars of their overcoats. This change was kind to her. It would have been kinder still had everything changed, weather, streets, and people, and had she been whisked away to wake in some high, fresh-scented room, alone, and statesque within and without, as in her virginal and colorful past. Inside the taxicab she wept impotent tears. That she had not been happy with Anthony for over a year mattered little. Recently his presence had been no more than what it would awaken her of that memorable June. The Anthony of late, irritable, weak, and poor, could do no less than make her irritable in turn, and bored with everything except the fact that, in a highly imaginative and eloquent youth, they had come together in an ecstatic revel of emotion. Because of this mutually vivid memory, she would have done more for Anthony than for any other human. So when she got into the taxicab she wept passionately, and wanted to call his name aloud. Miserable, lonesome as a forgotten child, she sat in the quiet apartment and wrote him a letter full of confused sentiment. I can almost look down the tracks and see you going. But without you, dearest, dearest, I can't see or hear or feel or think. Being apart, whatever has happened or will happen to us, is like begging for mercy from a storm, Anthony. It's like growing old. I want to kiss you so, in the back of your neck where your old black hair starts. Because I love you, and whatever we do or say to each other, or have done, or have said, you've got to feel how much I do, 
how inanimate I am when you're gone. I can't even hate the damnable presence of people, those people in the station who haven't any right to live. I can't resent them even though they're dirtying up our world, because I'm engrossed in wanting you so. If you hated me, if you were covered with sores like a leper, if you ran away with another woman or starved me or beat me, how absurd this sounds, I'd still want you, I'd still love you. I know, my darling. It's late. I have all the windows open, and the air outside is just as soft as spring, yet somehow much more young and frail than spring. Why do they make spring a young girl? Why does that illusion dance and yodel its way for three months through the world's preposterous barrenness? Spring is a lean old plough horse, with its ribs showing. It's a pile of refuse in a field, parched by the sun and rain, to an ominous cleanliness. In a few hours you'll wake up, my darling, and you'll be miserable and disgusted with life. You'll be in Delaware or Carolina or somewhere, and so unimportant. I don't believe there's anyone alive who can contemplate themselves as an impermanent institution, as a luxury or an unnecessary evil. Very few of the people who accentuate the futility of life remark the futility of themselves. Perhaps they think that, in proclaiming the evil of living, they somehow salvage their own worth from the ruin. But they don't, even you and I. Still I can see you. There's blue haze about the trees where you'll be passing, too beautiful to be predominant. No, the fallow squares of earth will be most frequent. They'll be along beside the track like dirty coarse brown sheets drying in the sun, alive, mechanical, abominable. Nature, slovenly old hag, has been sleeping in them with every old farmer or negro or immigrant who happened to covet her. So you see that now you've gone, I've written a letter all full of contempt and despair, and that just means that I love you, Anthony, with all there is to love in your... Gloria. When she had addressed the letter, she went to her twin bed and lay down upon it, clasping Anthony's pillow in her arms, as though by sheer force of emotion she could metamorphize it into his warm and living body. Two o'clock saw her dry-eyed, staring with steady, persistent grief into the darkness, remembering, remembering unmercifully, blaming herself for a hundred fancied unkindnesses making a likeness of Anthony akin to some martyred and transfigured Christ. For a time she thought of him as he, in his more sentimental moments, probably thought of himself. At five she was still awake. A mysterious grinding noise that went on every morning across the area way told her the hour. She heard an alarm clock ring and saw a light make a yellow square on an illusory blank wall opposite. With the half-formed resolution of following him south immediately, her sorrow grew remote and unreal, and moved off from her as the dark moved westward. She fell asleep. When she awoke, the sight of the empty bed beside her brought a renewal of misery, dispelled shortly, however, by the inevitable callousness of the bright morning. Though she was not conscious of it, there was relief in eating breakfast without Anthony's tired and worried face opposite her. Now that she was alone, she lost all desire to complain about the food. She would change her breakfasts, she thought, have a lemonade and a tomato sandwich instead of the sempiternal bacon and eggs and toast. Nonetheless, at noon, when she had called up several of her acquaintances, including the Marshal Muriel, and found each one engaged for lunch, she gave way to a quiet pity for herself and her loneliness. Curled on the bed, with pencil and paper, she wrote Anthony another letter. Late in the afternoon arrived a special delivery, mailed from some small New Jersey town, and the familiarity of the phrasing, the almost audible undertone of worry and discontent, were so familiar that they comforted her. Who knew? Perhaps army discipline would harden Anthony and accustom him to the idea of work. She had immutable faith that the war would be over before he was called upon to fight, and meanwhile the suit would be won, and they could begin again, this time on a different basis. The first thing different would be that she would have a child. It was unbearable that she should be so utterly alone. It was a week before she could stay in the apartment, with the probability of remaining dry-eyed. There seemed little in the city that was amusing. 
Muriel had been shifted to a hospital in New Jersey, from which she took a metropolitan holiday only every other week, and with this defection Gloria grew to realize how few were the friends she had made in all these years of New York. The men she knew were in the army. Men she knew? She had conceded vaguely to herself that all the men who had ever been in love with her were her friends. Each one of them had, at a certain considerable time, professed to value her favor above anything in life. But now, where were they? At least two were dead. Half a dozen or more were married. The rest scattered from France to the Philippines. She wondered whether any of them thought of her, and how often, and in what respect. Most of them must still picture the little girl of seventeen or so, the adolescent siren of nine years before. The girls, too, were gone far afield. She had never been popular in school. She had been too beautiful, too lazy, not sufficiently conscious of being a farm-over girl and a future wife and mother, in perpetual capital letters. And girls who had never been kissed hinted, with shocked expressions on their plain, but not particularly wholesome faces, that Gloria had. Then these girls had gone east or west or south, married, and become people, prophesying, if they prophesied about Gloria, that she would come to a bad end, not knowing that no endings were bad, and that they, like her, were by no means the mistresses of their destinies. Gloria told over to herself the people who had visited them in the grey house at Marietta. It had seemed at the time that they were always having company. She had indulged in an unspoken conviction that each guest was ever afterwards slightly indebted to her. They owed her a sort of moral ten dollars apiece, and, should she ever be in need, she might, so to speak, borrow from them this visionary currency. But they were gone, scattered like chaff, mysteriously and subtly vanished in essence or in fact. By Christmas, Gloria's conviction that she should join Anthony had returned, no longer as a sudden emotion but as a recurrent need. She decided to write to him word of her coming, but postponed the announcement upon the advice of Mr. Haight, who expected almost weekly that the case was coming up for trial. One day, early in January, as she was walking on Fifth Avenue, bright now with uniforms and hung with the flags of the virtuous nations, she met Rachel Barnes, whom she had not seen for nearly a year. Even Rachel, whom she had grown to dislike, was a relief from ennui, and together they went to the Ritz for tea. After a second cocktail they became enthusiastic. They liked each other. They talked about their husbands. Rachel, in that tone of public vainglory with private reservations in which wives are wont to speak. Rodman's abroad in the quartermaster corps. He's a captain. He was bound he would go, and he didn't think he could get into anything else. Anthony's in the infantry. The words in their relation to the cocktail gave Gloria a sort of glow. With each sip she approached a warm and comforting patriotism. "'By the way,' said Rachel, half an hour later, as they were leaving, "'can't you come up to dinner tomorrow night? I'm having two awfully sweet officers who are just going overseas. I think we ought to do all we can to make it attractive for them.' Gloria accepted gladly. She took down the address, recognizing by its number a fashionable apartment building on Park Avenue. "'It's been awfully good to have seen you, Rachel. It's been wonderful. I've wanted to.' With these three sentences, a certain night in Marietta two summers before, when Anthony and Rachel had been unnecessarily attentive to each other, was forgiven. Gloria forgave Rachel, Rachel forgave Gloria. Also, it was forgiven that Rachel had been witness to the greatest disaster in the lives of Mr. and Mrs. Anthony Patch. Compromising with events, time moves along. The Wiles of Captain Collins The two officers were captains of the popular craft, machine gunnery. At dinner they referred to themselves with conscious boredom as members of the Suicide Club. In those days every recondite branch of the service referred to itself as the Suicide Club. One of the captains, Rachel's captain, Gloria observed, was a tall, horsey man of thirty, with a pleasant mustache and ugly teeth. The other, Captain Collins, was chubby, pink-faced, pink-faced, 
and inclined to laugh with abandon every time he caught Gloria's eye. He took an immediate fancy to her, and throughout dinner showered her with inane compliments. With her second glass of champagne, Gloria decided that, for the first time in months, she was thoroughly enjoying herself. After dinner it was suggested that they all go somewhere and dance. The two officers supplied themselves with bottles of liquor from Rachel's sideboard, a law forbade service to the military, and so equipped they went through innumerable fox-trots in several glittering caravanseries along Broadway, faithfully alternating partners, while Gloria became more and more uproarious and more and more amusing to the pink-faced captain, who seldom bothered to remove his genial smile at all. At eleven o'clock, to her great surprise, she was in the minority for staying out. The others wanted to return to Rachel's apartment, to get some more liquor, they said. Gloria argued persistently that Captain Collins's flask was half full. She had just seen it. Then, catching Rachel's eye, she received an unmistakable wink. She deduced, confusedly, that her hostess wanted to get rid of the officers, and assented to being bundled into a taxicab outside. Captain Wolfe sat on the left with Rachel on his knees. Captain Collins sat in the middle, and as he settled himself he slipped his arm about Gloria's shoulders. It rested there lifelessly for a moment and then tightened like a vise. He leaned over her. "'You're awfully pretty,' he whispered. "'Thank you kindly, sir.' She was neither pleased nor annoyed. Before Anthony came, so many arms had done likewise that it had become little more than a gesture, sentimental but without significance. Up in Rachel's long front room a low fire and two lamps shaded with orange silk gave all the light, so that the corners were full of deep and somnolent shadows. The hostess, moving about in a dark-figured gown of loose chiffon, seemed to accentuate the already sensuous atmosphere. For a while they were all four together, tasting the sandwiches that waited on the tea-table. Then Gloria found herself alone with Captain Collins on the fireside lounge. Rachel and Captain Wolfe had withdrawn to the other side of the room, where they were conversing in subdued voices. "'I wish you weren't married,' said Collins, his face a ludicrous travesty of, in all seriousness. "'Why?' She held out her glass to be filled with a highball. "'Don't drink any more,' he urged her, frowning. "'Why not? You'd be nicer if you didn't.' Gloria caught suddenly the intended suggestion of the remark, the atmosphere he was attempting to create. She wanted to laugh, yet she realized that there was nothing to laugh at. She had been enjoying the evening, and she had no desire to go home. At the same time, it hurt her pride to be flirted with, on just that level. "'Pour me another drink,' she insisted. "'Please. Oh, don't be ridiculous,' she cried in exasperation. "'Very well,' he yielded with ill grace. Then his arm was about her again, and again she made no protest. But when his pink cheek came close, she leaned away. "'You're awfully sweet,' he said with an aimless air. She began to sing softly, wishing now that he would take down his arm. Suddenly her eye fell on an intimate scene across the room. Rachel and Captain Wolfe were engrossed in a long kiss. Gloria shivered slightly. She knew not why. Pink Face approached again. "'You shouldn't look at them,' he whispered. Almost immediately his other arm was around her. His breath was on her cheek. Again absurdity triumphed over disgust and her laugh was a weapon that needed no edge of words. "'Oh, I thought you were a sport,' he was saying. "'What's a sport?' "'Why, a person that likes to—to—to to enjoy life.' "'Is kissing you generally considered a joyful affair?' They were interrupted as Rachel and Captain Wolfe appeared suddenly before them. "'It's late, Gloria,' said Rachel. She was flushed and her hair was disheveled. "'You'd better stay here all night.' For an instant Gloria thought the officers were being dismissed. Then she understood, and, understanding, got to her feet as casually as she was able. Uncomprehendingly, Rachel continued, "'You can have the room just off this one. I can lend you everything you need.' Collins's eyes implored her like a dog's. 
Captain Wolfe's arm had settled familiarly around Rachel's waist. They were waiting. But the lure of promiscuity, colorful, various, labyrinthine, and ever a little odorous and stale, had no call or promise for Gloria. Had she so desired, she would have remained without hesitation, without regret. As it was, she could face coolly the six hostile and offended eyes that followed her out into the hall with forced politeness and hollow words. He wasn't even sport enough to try to take me home, she thought in the taxi, and then with a quick surge of resentment, how utterly common! Gallantry in February she had an experience of quite a different sort. Tudor Baird, an ancient flame, a young man whom at one time she had fully intended to marry, came to New York by way of the Aviation Corps and called upon her. They went several times to the theatre, and within a week, to her great enjoyment, he was as much in love with her as ever. Quite deliberately she brought it about, realizing too late that she had done a mischief. He reached the point of sitting with her in miserable silence whenever they went out together. A scroll and keys man at Yale, he possessed the correct reticences of a good egg, the correct notions of chivalry and noblesse oblige, and, of course, but unfortunately, the correct biases and the correct lack of ideas, all those traits which Anthony had taught her to despise, but which, nevertheless, she rather admired. Unlike the majority of his type, she found that he was not a bore. He was handsome, witty in a light way, and when she was with him she felt that because of some quality he possessed, call it stupidity, loyalty, sentimentality, or something not quite as definite as any of the three, he would have done anything in his power to please her. He told her this, among other things, very correctly, and with a ponderous manliness that masked a real suffering. Loving him not at all, she grew sorry for him and kissed him sentimentally one night because he was so charming, a relic of a vanishing generation which lived a priggish and graceful illusion and was being replaced by less gallant fools. Afterward she was glad she had kissed him, for next day when his plane fell fifteen hundred feet at Mineola, a piece of a gasoline engine smashed through his heart. Gloria Alone when Mr. Haight told her that the trial would not take place until autumn, she decided that, without telling Anthony, she would go into the movies. When he saw her, successful, both histrionically and financially, when he saw that she could have her will of Joseph Blockman, yielding nothing in return, he would lose his silly prejudices. She lay awake half one night, planning her career and enjoying her successes in anticipation and the next morning she called up films par excellence. Mr. Blackman was in Europe. But the idea had gripped her so strongly this time that she decided to go the rounds of the moving picture employment agencies. As had so often been the case, her sense of smell worked against her good intentions. The employment agency smelt as though it had been dead a very long time. She waited five minutes, inspecting her unprepossessing competitors, then she walked briskly out into the farthest recesses of Central Park and remained so long that she caught a cold. She was trying to air the employment agency out of her walking suit. In the spring she began to gather from Anthony's letters, not from any one in particular, but from their cumulative effect, that he did not want her to come south. Curiously repeated excuses that seemed to haunt him by their very insufficiency occurred with Freudian regularity. He set them down in each letter, as though he feared he had forgotten them the last time, as though it were desperately necessary to impress her with them. And the dilutions of his letters, with affectionate diminutives, began to be mechanical and unspontaneous, almost as though, having completed the letter, he had looked it over and literally stuck them in, like epigrams in an Oscar Wilde play. She jumped to the solution, rejected it, was angry and depressed by turns, Finally, she shut her mind to it proudly, and allowed an increasing coolness to creep into her end of the correspondence. Of late, she had found a good deal to occupy her attention. Several aviators, whom she had met through Tudor Baird, came into New York to see her, and two other ancient bows turned up, stationed at Camp Dix. As these men were ordered overseas, they, so to speak, handed her down to their friends. 
but after another rather disagreeable experience with a potential Captain Collins, she made it plain that when any one was introduced to her, he should be under no misapprehension as to her status and personal intentions. When summer came, she learned, like Anthony, to watch the officer's casualty list, taking a sort of melancholy pleasure in hearing of the death of someone with whom she had once danced a German, and in identifying by name the younger brothers of former suitors, thinking, as the drive toward Paris progressed, that here, at length, went the world to inevitable and well-merited destruction. She was twenty-seven. Her birthday fled by, scarcely noticed. Years before, it had frightened her when she became twenty, to some extent when she reached twenty-six. But now she looked in the glass with calm self-approval, seeing the British freshness of her complexion, and her figure, boyish and slim as of old. She tried not to think of Anthony. It was as though she were writing to a stranger. She told her friends that he had been made a corporal, and was annoyed when they were politely unimpressed. One night she wept because she was sorry for him. Had he been even slightly responsive, she would have gone to him without hesitation on the first train. Whatever he was doing, he needed to be taken care of spiritually, and she felt that now she would be able to do even that. Recently, without his continual drain on her moral strength, she found herself wonderfully revived. Before he left, she had been inclined through sheer association to brood on her wasted opportunities. Now she returned to her normal state of mind, strong, disdainful, existing each day for each day's worth. She bought a doll and dressed it. One week she wept over Ethan Frome. The next she reveled in some novels of Galsworthy's, whom she liked for his power of recreating, by spring in darkness, that illusion of young romantic love to which women look forever forward and forever back. In October Anthony's letters multiplied, became almost frantic, then suddenly ceased. For a worried month it needed all her powers of control to refrain from leaving immediately for Mississippi. Then a telegram told her that he had been in the hospital and that she could expect him in New York within ten days. Like a figure in a dream he came back into her life, across the ballroom, on that November evening. And all through the long hours that held familiar gladness she took him close to her breast, nursing an illusion of happiness and security she had not thought that she would know again. Discomfiture of the Generals After a week, Anthony's regiment went back to the Mississippi camp to be discharged. The officers shut themselves up in the compartments on the Pullman cars and drank the whiskey they had bought in New York. And in the coaches, the soldiers got as drunk as possible also, and pretended that, whenever the train stopped at a village, that they were just returned from France, where they had practically put an end to the German army. As they all wore overseas caps, and claimed that they had not had time to have their gold service stripes sewed on, the yokelry of the seaboard were much impressed, and asked them how they liked the trenches, to which they replied, Oh boy, with great smacking of tongues and shaking of heads. Someone took a piece of chalk and scrawled on the side of the train, We won the war, now we're going home and the officers laughed and let it stay. They were all getting what swagger they could out of this ignominious return. As they rumbled on toward camp, Anthony was uneasy lest he should find Dot awaiting him patiently at the station. To his relief, he neither saw nor heard anything of her, and thinking that, were she still in town, she would certainly attempt to communicate with him, he concluded that she had gone, whither he neither knew nor cared. He wanted only to return to Gloria, Gloria reborn and wonderfully alive. When eventually he was discharged, he left his company on the rear of a great truck, with a crowd who had given tolerant, almost sentimental cheers for their officers, especially for Captain Dunning. The captain, on his part, had addressed them with tears in his eyes as to the pleasure, etc., and the work, etc., and time not wasted, etc., and duty, etc. It was very dull and human. Having given ear to it, Anthony, whose mind was freshened by his week in New York, renewed his deep loathing for the military profession and all it connoted. In their childish hearts, two out of every three professional officers considered that wars were made for armies and not armies for wars. He rejoiced to see general and field officers 
riding desolately about the barren camp, deprived of their commands. He rejoiced to hear the men in his company laugh scornfully at the inducements tendered them to remain in the army. They were to attend schools. He knew what these schools were. Two days later, he was with Gloria in New York. Another Winter Late one February afternoon, Anthony came into the apartment, and, groping through the little hall, pitch dark in the winter dust, found Gloria sitting by the window. She turned as he came in. "'What did Mr. Haight have to say?' she asked listlessly. "'Nothing,' he answered. "'Usual thing. Next month, perhaps.' She looked at him closely. Her ear attuned to his voice caught the slightest thickness in the dissyllable. "'You've been drinking,' she remarked dispassionately. "'Couple glasses?' "'Oh.' He yawned in the armchair, and there was a moment's silence between them. Then she demanded suddenly, "'Did you go to Mr. Haight? Tell me the truth.' "'No,' he smiled weakly. "'As a matter of fact, I didn't have time. I thought you didn't go. He sent for you. I don't give a damn. I'm sick of waiting around his office.' You'd think he was doing me a favor. He glanced at Gloria as though expecting moral support, but she had turned back to her contemplation of the dubious and unprepossessing out of doors. I feel rather weary of life today, he offered tentatively. Still she was silent. I met a fellow and we talked in the Biltmore bar. The dusk had suddenly deepened, but neither of them made any move to turn on the lights. Lost in heaven knew what contemplation, they sat there until a flurry of snow drew a languid sigh from Gloria. "'What have you been doing?' he asked, finding the silence oppressive. "'Reading a magazine, all full of idiotic articles by prosperous authors about how terrible it is for poor people to buy silk shirts, and while I was reading it I could think of nothing else except how I wanted a grey squirrel coat, and how we can't afford one.' "'Yes, we can.' Oh, no. Oh, yes. If you want a fur coat, you can have one. Her voice coming through the dark held an implication of scorn. You mean we can sell another bond? If necessary. I don't want you to go without things. We have spent a lot, though, since I've been back. Oh, shut up, she said in irritation. Why? Because I'm sick and tired of hearing you talk about what we've spent or what we've done, you came back two months ago, and we've been on some sort of a party practically every night since. We've both wanted to go out, and we've gone. Well, you haven't heard me complain, have you? But all you do is whine, whine, whine. I don't care any more what we do or what becomes of us, and at least I'm consistent. But I will not tolerate your complaining and calamity howling. You're not very pleasant yourself sometimes, you know. I'm under no obligations to be. You're not making any attempt to make things different but I am. Huh, seems to me I've heard that before. This morning you weren't going to touch another thing to drink until you'd gotten a position, and you didn't even have the spunk to go to Mr. Haight when he sent for you about the suit. Anthony got to his feet and switched on the lights. See here, he cried, blinking. I'm getting sick of that sharp tongue of yours. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do you think I'm particularly happy? he continued, ignoring her question. Do you think I don't know we're not living as we ought to? In an instant, Gloria stood trembling beside him. I won't stand it, she burst out. I won't be lectured to, you and your suffering. You're just a pitiful weakling, and you always have been. They faced one another, idiotically, each of them unable to impress the other, each of them tremendously, achingly bored. Then she went into the bedroom and shut the door behind her. His return had brought into the foreground all their pre-bellum exasperations. Prices had risen alarmingly, and in perverse ratio their income had shrunk to a little over half its original size. There had been the large retainer's fee to Mr. Haight. There were stocks bought at one hundred, now down to thirty and forty, and other investments that were not paying at all. During the previous spring, Gloria had been given the alternative of leaving the apartment or signing a year's lease at two hundred and twenty-five a month. She had signed it. Inevitably, as the necessity for economy had increased, they found themselves as a pair quite unable to save. 
The old policy of prevarication was resorted to. Weary of their incapabilities, they chattered of what they would do, oh, tomorrow, of how they would stop going to parties, and of how Anthony would go to work. But when dark came down, Gloria, accustomed to an engagement every night, would feel the ancient restlessness creeping over her. She would stand in the doorway of the bedroom, chewing furiously at her fingers, and sometimes meeting Anthony's eyes as he glanced up from his book. Then the telephone, and her nerves would relax. She would answer it with ill-concealed eagerness. Someone was coming up, for just a few minutes, and, oh, the weariness of pretense, the appearance of the wine-table, the revival of their jaded spirits, and the awakening, like the midpoint of a sleepless night in which they moved. As the winter passed with the march of the returning troops along Fifth Avenue, they became more and more aware that, since Anthony's return, their relations had entirely changed. After that reflowering of tenderness and passion, each of them had returned into some solitary dream unshared by the other, and what endearments passed between them passed, it seemed, from empty heart to empty heart echoing hollowly the departure of what they knew at last was gone. Anthony had again made the rounds of the metropolitan newspapers, and had again been refused encouragement by a motley of office boys, telephone girls, and city editors. The word was, we're keeping any vacancies open for our own men who are still in France. Then, late in March, his eye fell on an advertisement in the morning paper, and in consequence, he found at last the semblance of an occupation. You can sell. Why not earn while you learn? Our salesmen make fifty to two hundred dollars weekly. There followed an address on Madison Avenue and instructions to appear at one o'clock that afternoon. Gloria, glancing over his shoulder after one of their usual late breakfasts, saw him regarding it idly. Why don't you try it? she suggested. Oh, it's one of those crazy schemes. It might not be. At least it'd be experience. At her urging, he went at one o'clock to the appointed address, where he found himself one of a dense miscellany of men waiting in front of the door. They ranged from a messenger boy, evidently misusing his company's time, to an immemorial individual with a gnarled body and a gnarled cane. Some of the men were seedy, with sunken cheeks and puffy pink eyes, Others were young, possibly still in high school. After a jostled fifteen minutes, during which they all eyed one another with apathetic suspicion, there appeared a smart young shepherd clad in a waistline suit, and wearing the manner of an assistant rector who herded them upstairs into a large room, which resembled a schoolroom and contained innumerable desks. Here the prospective salesman sat down, and again waited. After an interval, a platform at the end of the hall was clouded with half a dozen sober but sprightly men, who, with one exception, took seats in a semicircle facing the audience. The exception was the man who seemed the soberest, the most sprightly and the youngest of the lot, and who advanced to the front of the platform. The audience scrutinized him hopefully. He was rather small and rather pretty, with the commercial rather than the thespian sort of prettiness. He had straight, blond, bushy brows, and eyes that were almost preposterously honest, and as he reached the edge of his rostrum, he seemed to throw these eyes out into the audience, simultaneously extending his arm with two fingers, outstretched. Then, while he rocked himself to a state of balance, an expectant silence settled over the hall. With perfect assurance, the young man had taken his listeners in hand, and his words, when they came, were steady and confident and of the school of straight from the shoulder. Men, he began, and paused. The word died with a prolonged echo at the end of the hall. The faces regarding him, hopefully, cynically, wearily, were alike arrested and grossed. Six hundred eyes were turned slightly upward, with an even graceless flow that reminded Anthony of the rolling of bowling balls. He launched himself into the sea of exposition. This bright and sunny morning you picked up your favorite newspaper and you found an advertisement which made the plain, unadorned statement that you could sell. That was all it said. It didn't say what, it didn't say how, it didn't say why. 
it just made one single solitary assertion that you and you and you business of pointing could sell now my job isn't to make a success of you because every man is born a success he makes himself a failure it's not to teach you how to talk because each man is a natural orator and only makes himself a clam my business is to tell you one thing in a way that will make you know it is to tell you that you and you and you have the heritage of money and prosperity waiting for you to come and claim it at this point an irishman of saturnine appearance rose from his desk near the rear of the hall and went out that man thinks he'll go look for it in the beer parlor around the corner laughter he won't find it there once upon a time i looked for it there myself laughter but that was before i did what every one of you men no matter how young or how old how poor or how rich a faint ripple of satirical laughter can do it was before i found myself now i wonder if any of you men know what a heart talk is a heart talk is a little book in which i started about five years ago to write down what i had discovered were the principal reasons for a man's failure and the principal reasons for a man's success from john d rockefeller back to john d napoleon laughter and before that back in the days when awell sold his birthright for a mess of pottage there are now one hundred of these heart talks those of you who are sincere who are interested in our proposition above all who are dissatisfied with the way things are breaking for you at present will be handed one to take home with you as you go out yonder door this afternoon now in my own pocket i have four letters just received concerning heart talks these letters have names signed to them that are familiar in every household in the u s a listen to this one from detroit dear mr carleton i want to order three thousand more copies of heart talks for distribution among my salesmen they have done more for getting work out of the men than any bonus proposition ever considered i read them myself constantly and i desire to heartily congratulate you on getting at the roots of the biggest problem that faces our generation today the problem of salesmanship the rock bottom on which the country is founded is the problem of salesmanship with many felicitations i am yours very cordially henry w terrell he brought the name out in three long booming triumphancies pausing for it to produce its magical effect then he read two more letters one from a manufacturer of vacuum cleaners and one from the president of the great northern doily company and now he continued i'm going to tell you in a few words what the proposition is that's going to make those of you who go into it in the right spirit simply put it's this heart talks have been incorporated as a company we're going to put these little pamphlets into the hands of every big business organization every salesman and every man who knows i don't say thinks i say knows that he can sell we are offering some of the stock of the heart talks concern upon the market and in order that the distribution may be as wide as possible and in order also that we can furnish a living concrete flesh and blood example of what salesmanship is or rather what it may be we're going to give those of you who are the real thing a chance to sell that stock now i don't care what you've tried to sell before or how you've tried to sell it it don't matter to me how old you are or how young you are i only want to know two things first do you want success and second will you work for it my name is sammy carlton not mr carlton but just plain sammy i'm a regular no-nonsense man with no fancy frills about me i want you to call me sammy now this is all i'm going to say to you today tomorrow i want those of you who have thought it over and have read the copy of heart talks which will be given to you at the door to come back to this same room at this same time then we'll go into the proposition further and i'll explain to you what i found the principles of success to be i'm going to make you feel that you and you and you can sell mr carleton's voice echoed for a moment through the hall and then died away to the stamping of many feet anthony was pushed and jostled with the crowd out of the room end of book three chapter two part one of two
Book Three, Chapter Two, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Three, Chapter Two A Matter of Aesthetics. Part Two of Two. Further Adventures with Heart Talks. With an accompaniment of ironic laughter, Anthony told Gloria the story of his commercial adventure, but she listened without amusement. "'You're going to give up again?' she demanded coldly. "'Why, you don't expect me to. I never expected anything of you.' He hesitated. "'Well, I can't see the slightest benefit in laughing myself sick over this sort of affair. If there's anything older than the old story, it's the new twist.' It required an astonishing amount of moral energy on Gloria's part to intimidate him into returning, and when he reported the next day, somewhat depressed from his perusal of the senile bromides skittishly set forth in Heart Talks on Ambition, he found only fifty of the original three hundred awaiting the appearance of the vital and compelling Sammy Carlton. Mr. Carlton's powers of vitality and compulsion were, this time, exercised in elucidating that magnificent piece of speculation, how to sell. It seemed that the approved method was to state one's proposition, and then to say, not, and now will you buy. This was not the way. Oh, no. The way was to state one's proposition, and then, having reduced one's adversary to a state of exhaustion, to deliver oneself of the categorical imperative, now see here, you've taken up my time explaining this matter to you, you've admitted my points, all I want to ask is how many do you want? As Mr. Carlton piled assertion upon assertion, Anthony began to feel a sort of disgusted confidence in him. The man appeared to know what he was talking about. Obviously prosperous, he had risen to the position of instructing others. It did not occur to Anthony that the type of man who attains commercial success seldom knows how or why, and, as in his grandfather's case, when he ascribes reasons, the reasons are generally inaccurate and absurd. Anthony noted that, of the numerous old men who had answered the original advertisement, only two had returned, and that among the thirty-odd who assembled on the third day to get actual selling instructions from Mr. Carlton, only one gray head was in evidence. These thirty were eager converts. With their mouths, they followed the working of Mr. Carlton's mouth. They swayed in their seats with enthusiasm, and in the intervals of his talk they spoke to each other in tense, approving whispers. Yet of the chosen few who, in the words of Mr. Carlton, were determined to get those desserts that rightly and truly belonged to them, Less than half a dozen combined even a modicum of personal appearance with that great gift of being a pusher. But they were told that they were all natural pushers. It was merely necessary that they should believe with a sort of savage passion in what they were selling. He even urged each one to buy some stock himself, if possible, in order to increase his own sincerity. On the fifth day, then, Anthony sallied into the street with all the sensations of a man wanted by the police. Acting according to instructions, he selected a tall office building in order that he might ride to the top story and work downward, stopping in every office that had a name on the door. But at the last minute he hesitated. Perhaps it would be more practicable to acclimate himself to the chilly atmosphere which he felt was awaiting him by trying a few offices on, say, Madison Avenue. He went into an arcade that seemed only semi-prosperous, and, seeing a sign which read, Percy B. Weatherby, Architect, he opened the door heroically and entered. A starchy young woman looked up questioningly. "'Can I see Mr. Weatherby?' He wondered if his voice sounded tremulous. She laid her hand tentatively on the telephone receiver. "'What's the name, please?' "'He wouldn't, uh, know me. He wouldn't know my name.' "'What's your business with him? You an insurance agent?' "'Oh, no, nothing like that,' denied Anthony hurriedly. "'Oh, no, it's a, it's a personal matter.' He wondered if he should have said this. It had all sounded so simple when Mr. Carlton had enjoined his flock. "'Don't allow yourself to be kept out. Show them you've made up your mind to talk to them, and they'll listen.' 
The girls succumbed to Anthony's pleasant, melancholy face and in a moment the door to the inner room opened and admitted a tall, splay-footed man with slicked hair. He approached Anthony with ill-concealed impatience. "'You wanted to see me on a personal matter?' Anthony quailed. "'I wanted to talk to you,' he said defiantly. "'About what? It'll take some time to explain. Well, what's it about?' Mr. Weatherby's voice indicated rising irritation. Then Anthony, straining at each word, each syllable, began, I don't know whether or not you've ever heard of a series of pamphlets called Heart Talks. Good grief, cried Percy B. Weatherby, architect. Are you trying to touch my heart? No, it's business. Heart Talks have been incorporated, and we're putting some shares on the market. His voice faded slowly off, harassed by a fixed and contemptuous stare from his unwilling prey. For another minute he struggled on, increasingly sensitive and tangled in his own words. His confidence oozed from him in great retching emanations that seemed to be sections of his own body. Almost mercifully, Percy B. Weatherby, architect, terminated the interview. Good grief, he exploded in disgust, and you call that a personal matter. He whipped about and strode into his private office, banging the door behind him. Not daring to look at the stenographer, Anthony, in some shameful and mysterious way, got himself from the room. Perspiring profusely, he stood in the hall wondering why they didn't come and arrest him. In every hurried look he discerned infallibly a glance of scorn. After an hour, and with the help of two strong whiskies, he brought himself up to another attempt. He walked into a plumber's shop, but when he mentioned his business, the plumber began pulling on his coat in a great hurry, gruffly announcing that he had to go to lunch. Anthony remarked politely that it was futile to try and sell a man anything when he was hungry, and the plumber heartily agreed. This episode encouraged Anthony. He tried to think that, had the plumber not been bound for lunch, he would at least have listened. Passing by a few glittering and formidable bazaars, he entered a grocery store. A talkative proprietor told him that, before buying any stocks, he was going to see how the armistice affected the market. To Anthony this seemed almost unfair. In Mr. Carlton's salesman's utopia, the only reason prospective buyers ever gave for not purchasing stock was that they doubted it to be a promising investment. Obviously, a man in that state was almost ludicrously easy game to be brought down merely by the judicious application of the correct selling points. But these men... Why, actually, they weren't considering buying anything at all. Anthony took several more drinks before he approached his fourth man, a real estate agent. Nevertheless, he was floored with a coup, as decisive as a syllogism. The real estate agent said that he had three brothers in the investment business. Viewing himself as a breaker-up of homes, Anthony apologized and went out. After another drink, he conceived the brilliant plan of selling the stock to the bartenders along Lexington Avenue. This occupied several hours, for it was necessary to take a few drinks in each place in order to get the proprietor in the proper frame of mind to talk business. But the bartenders, one and all, contended that, if they had any money to buy bonds, they would not be bartenders. It was as though they had all convened and decided upon that rejoinder. As he approached a dark and soggy five o'clock, he found that they were developing a still more annoying tendency to turn him off with a jest. At five, then, with a tremendous effort at concentration, he decided that he must put more variety into his canvassing. He selected a medium-sized delicatessen store and went in. He felt, illuminatingly, that the thing to do was to cast a spell not only over the storekeeper, but over all the customers as well, and perhaps through the psychology of the herd instinct they would buy as an astounded and immediately convinced whole. Afternoon, he began in a loud, thick voice. Got a little proposition. If he had wanted silence, he obtained it. A sort of awe descended upon the half-dozen women marketing, and upon the gray-haired ancient who, in cap and apron, was slicing chicken. Anthony pulled a batch of papers from his flopping briefcase and waved them cheerfully. Buy a bun! he suggested. Good as liberty bond. The phrase pleased him, and he elaborated upon it. 
better in Liberty Bond. Each one of these bonds worth two Liberty Bonds. His mind made a hiatus and skipped to his peroration, which he delivered with appropriate gestures, these being somewhat marred by the necessity of clinging to the counter with one or both hands. Now see here, are you taking up my time? I don't want to know why you won't buy. I just want you to say why. Want you to say how many. At this point, they should have approached him with checkbooks and fountain pens in hand. Realizing that they must have missed a cue, Anthony, with the instincts of an actor, went back and repeated his finale. Now see here, you take it out my time, you file a proposition, you agree the reasoning? Now all I want from you is how many liberty bonds? See here, broke in a new voice, a portly man, whose face was adorned with symmetrical scrolls of yellow hair, had come out of a glass cage in the rear of the store and was bearing down upon Anthony. See here, you. How many? repeated the salesman sternly. You taken up my time. Hey, you, cried the proprietor. I'll have you taken up by the police. You most certainly won't, retorted Anthony with fine defiance. All I want to know is how many. From here and there in the store went up little clouds of comment and expostulation. How terrible. He's a raving maniac. He's disgracefully drunk. The proprietor grasped Anthony's arm sharply. Get out, or I'll call a policeman. Some relics of rationality moved Anthony to nod and replace his bonds clumsily in the case. How many? He reiterated doubtfully. The whole force, if necessary, thundered his adversary his yellow mustache trembling fiercely. Sell em all a bond. With this Anthony turned, bowed gravely to his late auditors, and wobbled from the store. He found a taxicab at the corner and rode home to the apartment. There he fell sound asleep on the sofa, and so Gloria found him, his breath filling the air with an unpleasant pungency, his hand still clutching his open briefcase. Except when Anthony was drinking, his range of sensation had become less than that of a healthy old man, and when Prohibition came in July, he found that, among those who could afford it, there was more drinking than ever before. One's host now brought out a bottle upon the slightest pretext. The tendency to display liquor was a manifestation of the same instinct that led a man to deck his wife with jewels. To have liquor was a boast almost a badge of respectability. In the mornings, Anthony awoke, tired, nervous, and worried. Halcyon summer twilights and the purple chill of morning alike left him unresponsive. Only for a brief moment every day in the warmth and renewed life of a first highball did his mind turn to those opalescent dreams of future pleasure, the mutual heritage of the happy and the damned. But this was only for a little while. As he grew drunker, the dreams faded, and he became a confused specter, moving in odd crannies of his own mind, full of unexpected devices, harshly contemptuous at best, and reaching sodden and dispirited depths. One night in June he had quarreled violently with Maury over a matter of the utmost triviality. He remembered dimly next morning that it had been about a broken pint bottle of champagne. Maury had told him to sober up, and Anthony's feelings had been hurt. So, with an attempted gesture of dignity, he had risen from the table and, seizing Gloria's arm, half led, half shamed her into a taxicab outside, leaving Maury with three dinners ordered and tickets for the opera. This sort of semi-tragic fiasco had become so usual that, when they occurred, he was no longer stirred into making amends. If Gloria protested, and of late she was more likely to sink into a contemptuous silence, he would either engage in a bitter defense of himself or else stalk dismally from the apartment. Never, since the incident on the station platform at Redgate, had he laid his hands on her in anger, though he was withheld often only by some instinct that itself made him tremble with rage. Just as he still cared for her more than for any other creature, so did he more intensely and frequently hate her. So far, the judges of the appellate division had failed to hand down a decision, but after another postponement, they finally affirmed the decree of the lower court, two justices dissenting. A notice of appeal was served upon Edward Shuttleworth. 
The case was going to the court of last resort, and they were in for another interminable wait, six months, perhaps a year. It had grown enormously unreal to them, remote and uncertain as heaven. Throughout the previous winter one small matter had been a subtle and omnipresent irritant, the question of Gloria's grey fur coat. At that time women, enveloped in long squirrel wraps, could be seen every few yards along Fifth Avenue. The women were converted to the shape of tops. They seemed porcine and obscene. They resembled kept women in the concealing richness, the feminine animality of the garment. Yet Gloria wanted a grey squirrel coat. Discussing the matter, or rather arguing it, for even more than in the first year of their marriage did every discussion take the form of bitter debate, full of such phrases as, most certainly, utterly outrageous, it's so, nevertheless, and the ultra-emphatic, regardless, they concluded that they could not afford it. And so, gradually, it began to stand as a symbol of their growing financial anxiety. To Gloria, the shrinkage of their income was a remarkable phenomenon, without explanation or precedent, that it could happen at all within the space of five years seemed almost an intended cruelty, conceived and executed by a sardonic god. When they were married, seventy-five hundred a year had seemed ample for a young couple, especially when augmented by the expectation of many millions. Gloria had failed to realize that it was decreasing not only in amount, but in purchasing power, until the payment of Mr. Haight's retaining fee of fifteen thousand dollars made the fact suddenly and startlingly obvious. When Anthony was drafted, they had calculated their income at over four hundred a month, with a dollar even then decreasing in value. But on his return to New York they discovered an even more alarming condition of affairs. They were receiving only forty-five hundred a year from their investments, and though the suit over the will moved ahead of them like a persistent mirage, and the financial danger mark loomed up in the near distance, they found, nevertheless, that living within their income was impossible. So Gloria went without the squirrel coat, and every day upon Fifth Avenue she was a little conscious of her well-worn, half-length leopard skin, now hopelessly old-fashioned. Every other month they sold a bond, yet when the bills were paid it left only enough to be gulped down hungrily by their current expenses. Anthony's calculations showed that their capital would last about seven years longer. So Gloria's heart was very bitter, for in one week, on a prolonged hysterical party, during which Anthony whimsically divested himself of coat, vest, and shirt in a theatre, and was assisted out by a posse of ushers, they spent twice what the grey squirrel coat would have cost. It was November, Indian summer rather, and a warm, warm night, which was unnecessary, for the work of the summer was done. Babe Ruth had smashed the home run record for the first time, and Jack Dempsey had broken Jess Willard's cheekbone out in Ohio. Over in Europe, the usual number of children had swollen stomachs from starvation, and the diplomats were at their customary business of making the world safe for new wars. In New York City, the proletariat were being disciplined, and the odds on Harvard were generally quoted at five to three. Peace had come down in earnest, the beginning of new days. Up in the bedroom of the apartment on 57th Street, Gloria lay upon her bed and tossed from side to side, sitting up at intervals to throw off a superfluous cover, and once asking Anthony, who was lying awake beside her, to bring her a glass of ice water. "'Be sure and put ice in it,' she said with insistence. "'It isn't cold enough the way it comes from the faucet.' Looking through the frail curtains, she could see the rounded moon over the roofs, and beyond it, on the sky, the yellow glow from Times Square. And watching the two incongruous lights, her mind worked over an emotion, or rather, an interwoven complex of emotions, that had occupied it through the day, and the day before that, and back to the last time when she could remember having thought clearly and consecutively about anything, which must have been while Anthony was in the army. She would be twenty-nine in February. The month assumed an ominous and inescapable significance, making her wonder, through these nebulous half-fevered hours, whether after all she had not wasted her faintly tired beauty, whether there was such a thing as use for any quality bounded by a harsh and inevitable mortality. Years before, when she was twenty-one, she had written in her diary, Beauty is only to be admired, only to be loved, to be harvested carefully, 
and then flung at a chosen lover like a gift of roses. It seems to me, so far as I can judge clearly at all, that my beauty should be used like that. And now, all this November day, all this desolate day, under a sky dirty and white, Gloria had been thinking that perhaps she had been wrong. To preserve the integrity of her first gift, she had looked no more for love. When the first flame and ecstasy had grown dim, sunk down, departed, she had begun preserving what? It puzzled her that she no longer knew just what she was preserving, a sentimental memory or some profound and fundamental concept of honor. She was doubting now whether there had been any moral issue involved in her way of life, to walk unworried and unregretful along the gayest of all possible lanes, and to keep her pride by being always herself in doing what it seemed beautiful that she should do. From the first little boy in an Eton collar whose girl she had been, down to the latest casual man whose eyes had grown alert and appreciative as they rested upon her, there was needed only that matchless candor she could throw into a look or clothe with an inconsequent clause, for she had always talked in broken clauses, to weave about her immeasurable illusions, immeasurable distances, immeasurable light, to create souls in men, to create fine happiness and fine despair, she must remain deeply proud, proud to be inviolate, proud also to be melting, to be passionate and possessed. She knew that in her breast she had never wanted children. The reality, the earthiness, the intolerable sentiment of childbearing, the menace to her beauty, had appalled her. She wanted to exist only as a conscious flower, prolonging and preserving itself. Her sentimentality could cling fiercely to her own illusions, but her ironic soul whispered that motherhood was also the privilege of the female baboon. So her dreams were of ghostly children only, the early, the perfect symbols of her early and perfect love for Anthony. In the end, then, her beauty was all that had never failed her. She had never seen beauty like her own. What it meant ethically or aesthetically faded before the gorgeous concreteness of her pink and white feet, the clean perfectness of her body, and the baby mouth that was like the material symbol of a kiss. She would be twenty-nine in February. As the long night waned, she grew supremely conscious that she and beauty were going to make use of these next three months. At first she was not sure for what, but the problem resolved itself gradually into the old lure of the screen. She was in earnest now. No material want could have moved her as this fear moved her. No matter for Anthony, Anthony, the poor in spirit, the weak and broken man with bloodshot eyes, for whom she still had moments of tenderness, no matter. She would be twenty-nine in February, a hundred days, so many days. She would go to Blockman tomorrow. With the decision came relief. It cheered her that in some manner the illusion of beauty could be sustained, or preserved, perhaps, in celluloid, after the reality had vanished. Well, tomorrow. The next day she felt weak and ill. She tried to go out, and saved herself from collapse only by clinging to a mailbox near the front door. The Martinique elevator boy helped her upstairs, and she waited on the bed for Anthony's return without energy to unhook her brazier. For five days she was down with influenza, which, just as the month turned corner into winter, ripened into double pneumonia. In the feverish perambulations of her mind she prowled through a house of bleak unlighted rooms hunting for her mother. All she wanted was to be a little girl to be efficiently taken care of by some yielding but superior power, stupider and steadier than herself. It seemed that the only lover she had ever wanted was a lover in a dream. Odi Profanum Vulgus One day, in the midst of Gloria's illness, there occurred a curious incident that puzzled Miss McGovern, the trained nurse, for some time afterward. It was noon, but the room in which the patient lay was dark and quiet. Miss McGovern was standing near the bed, mixing some medicine, when Mrs. Patch, who had apparently been sound asleep, sat up and began to speak vehemently. "'Millions of people,' she said, "'swarming like rats, chattering like apes, smelling like all hell, monkeys, or lice, I suppose, for one really exquisite palace, on Long Island, say, or even in Greenwich.' 
for one palace full of pictures from the old world and exquisite things with avenues of trees and green lawns and a view of the blue sea and lovely people about in slick dresses i'd sacrifice a hundred thousand of them a million of them she raised her hand feebly and snapped her fingers i care nothing for them understand me the look she bent upon miss mcgovern at the conclusion of this speech was curiously elfin curiously content then she gave a short little laugh polished with scorn and tumbling backward fell off again to sleep miss mcgovern was bewildered she wondered what were the hundred thousand things that mrs patch would sacrifice for her palace dollars she supposed yet it had not sounded exactly like dollars the movies it was february seven days before her birthday and the great snow that had filled up the cross streets as dirt fills the cracks in a floor had turned to slush and was being escorted to the gutters by the hoses of the street cleaning department the wind none the less bitter for being casual whipped in through the open windows of the living room bearing with it the dismal secrets of the areaway and clearing the patch apartment of stale smoke in its cheerless circulation gloria wrapped in a warm kimono came into the chilly room and taking up the telephone receiver called joseph blackman do you mean mr joseph black demanded the telephone girl at films par excellence blackman joseph blackman b l o mr joseph blackman has changed his name to black do you want him what yes she remembered nervously that she had once called him blockhead to his face his office was reached by courtesy of two additional female voices the last was a secretary who took her name only with the flow through the transmitter of his own familiar but faintly impersonal tone did she realize that it had been three years since they had met and he had changed his name to black can you see me she suggested lightly it's on a business matter really i'm going into the movies at last if i can i'm awfully glad i've always thought you'd like it do you think you can get me a child she demanded with the arrogance peculiar to all beautiful women to all women who have ever at any time considered themselves beautiful he assured her that it was merely a question of when she wanted the trial any time well he'd phone later in the day and let her know a convenient hour the conversation closed with conventional padding on both sides then from three o'clock to five she sat close to the telephone with no result but next morning came a note that contented and excited her my dear gloria just by luck a matter came to my attention that i think will be just suited to you i would like to see you start with something that would bring you notice at the same time if a very beautiful girl of your sort is put directly into a picture next to one of the rather shop-worn stars with which every company is afflicted tongues would very likely wag but there is a flapper part in a percy b debris production that i think would be just suited to you and would bring you notice Willis Sable plays opposite Gaston Mears in a sort of character part, and your part, I believe, would be her younger sister. Anyway, Percy B. Debris, who is directing the picture, says, if you'll come to the studios day after tomorrow, Thursday, he will run off a test. If ten o'clock is suited to you, I will meet you there at that time. With all good wishes, ever faithfully, Joseph Black. Gloria had decided that Anthony was to know nothing of this until she had obtained a definite position, and accordingly, she was dressed and out of the apartment next morning before he awoke. Her mirror had given her, she thought, much the same account as ever. She wondered if there were any lingering traces of her sickness. She was still slightly underweight, and she had fancied, a few days before, that her cheeks were a trifle thinner. But she felt that those were merely transitory conditions, and that on this particular day she looked as fresh as ever. She had bought and charged a new hat, and as the day was warm, she had left the leopard-skin coat at home. At the Films Par Excellence studios, she was announced over the telephone and told that Mr. Black would be down directly. She looked around her. Two girls were being shown about by a little fat man in a slash-pocket coat, and one of them had indicated a stack of thin parcels piled breast-high against the wall and extending along for twenty feet. That studio mail, explained the fat man, pictures of the stars who are with films par excellence oh each one's autographed by florence kelly or gaston mears or mac dodge 
he winked confidentially. At least when Minnie McGluck out in Sock Center gets the picture she wrote for, she thinks it's autographed. Just a stamp? Sure. It'd take him a good eight-hour day to autograph half of them. They say Mary Pickford's studio mail costs her fifty thousand a year. Say. Sure, fifty thousand. But it's the best kind of advertising there is. They drifted out of earshot, and almost immediately Blockman appeared. Blockman, a dark, suave gentleman, gracefully engaged in the middle forties, who greeted her with courteous warmth, and told her she had not changed a bit in three years. He led the way into a great hall, as large as an armory, and broken intermittently, with busy sets and blinding rows of unfamiliar light. Each piece of scenery was marked in large white letters, Gaston Mears Company, Mac Dodge Company, or simply, Films par excellence. Ever been in a studio before? Never have. She liked it. There was no heavy closeness of grease paint, no scent of soiled and tawdry costumes, which years before had revolted her behind the scenes of a musical comedy. This work was done in the clean mornings. The appurtenances seemed rich and gorgeous and new. On a set that was joyous with Manchu hangings, a perfect Chinaman was going through a scene according to megaphone directions, as the great glittering machine ground out its ancient moral tale for the edification of the national mind. A red-headed man approached them and spoke with familiar deference to Blockman, who answered, "'Hello, Debris. Want you to meet Mrs. Patch. Mrs. Patch wants to go into pictures, as I explained to you. All right now, where do we go?' Mr. Debris, the great Percy B. Debris, thought Gloria, showed them to a set which represented the interior of an office. Some chairs were drawn up around the camera, which stood in front of it, and the three of them sat down. "'Ever been in a studio before?' asked Mr. Debris, giving her a glance that was surely the quintessence of keenness. "'No? Well, I'll explain exactly what's going to happen. We're going to take what we call a test in order to see how your features photograph and whether you've got natural stage presence and how you respond to coaching. There's no need to be nervous over it. I'll just have the cameraman take a few hundred feet in an episode I've got marked here in the scenario. We can tell pretty much what we want to from that. He produced a typewritten continuity and explained to her the episode she was to enact. It developed that one Barbara Wainwright had been secretly married to the junior partner of the firm whose office was there represented. Entering the deserted office one day by accident, she was naturally interested in seeing where her husband worked. The telephone rang, and after some hesitation she answered it. She learned that her husband had been struck by an automobile and instantly killed. She was overcome. At first she was unable to realize the truth, but finally she succeeded in comprehending it and went into a dead faint on the floor. "'Now that's all we want,' concluded Mr. Debris. I'm going to stand here and tell you approximately what to do, and you're to act as though I wasn't here, and just go on and do it your own way. You needn't be afraid we're going to judge this too severely. We simply want to get a general idea of your screen personality. I see. You'll find makeup in the room in back of the set. Go light on it, very little red. I see, repeated Gloria, nodding. She touched her lips nervously with the tip of her tongue. The Test as she came into the set through the real wooden door and closed it carefully behind her, she found herself inconveniently dissatisfied with her clothes. She should have brought a Mrs. dress for the occasion, she could still wear them, and it might have been a good investment if it had accentuated her airy youth. Her mind snapped sharply into the momentous present as Mr. Debris's voice came from the glare of the white lights in front. "'You look around for your husband?' Now, you don't see him. You're curious about the office. She became conscious of the regular sound of the camera. It worried her. She glanced toward it involuntarily and wondered if she had made up her face correctly. Then, with a definite effort, she forced herself to act, and she had never felt that the gestures of her body were so banal, so awkward, so bereft of grace or distinction. She strolled around the office, picking up articles here and there, and looking at them inanely. Then she scrutinized the ceiling, the floor, and thoroughly inspected an inconsequential lead pencil on the desk. Finally, because she could think of nothing else to do, 
and less than nothing to express, she forced a smile. All right. Now the phone rings. ting a ling a ling Hesitate, and then answer it. She hesitated, and then, too quickly, she thought, picked up the receiver. Hello? Her voice was hollow and unreal. The words rang in the empty set like the ineffectualities of a ghost. The absurdities of their requirements appalled her. Did they expect that, on an instant's notice, she could put herself in the place of this preposterous and unexplained character? No, no, not yet. Now, listen. John Sumner has been knocked over by an automobile and instantly killed. Gloria let her baby mouth drop slowly open. Then, now hang up, with a bang. She obeyed, clung to the table with her eyes wide and staring. At length she was feeling slightly encouraged, and her confidence increased. My God, she cried. Her voice was good, she thought. Oh, my God! Now faint. She collapsed forward to her knees, and throwing her body outward on the ground, lay without breathing. All right, called Mr. Debris. That's enough. Thank you. That's plenty. Get up. That's enough. Gloria arose, mustering her dignity and brushing off her skirt. Awful, she remarked with a cool laugh, though her heart was bumping tumultuously. Terrible, wasn't it? Did you mind it? said Mr. Debris, smiling blandly. Did it seem hard? I can't tell anything about it until I have it run off. Of course not, she agreed, trying to attach some sort of meaning to his remark, and failing. It was just the sort of thing he would have said had he been trying not to encourage her. A few moments later she left the studio. Blockman had promised her that she should hear the result of the test within the next few days. Too proud to force any definite comment, she felt a baffling uncertainty, and only now, when the step had at last been taken, did she realize how the possibility of a successful screen career had played in the back of her mind for the past three years. That night she tried to tell over to herself the elements that might decide for or against her. Whether or not she had used enough makeup worried her, and, as the part was that of a girl of twenty, she wondered if she had not been just a little too grave. About her acting she was least of all satisfied. Her entrance had been abominable. In fact, not until she reached the phone had she displayed a shred of poise, and then the test had been over. If they had only realized, she wished that she could try it again. A mad plan to call up in the morning and ask for a new trial took possession of her, and as suddenly faded. It seemed neither politic nor polite to ask another favor of Blockman. The third day of waiting found her in a highly nervous condition. She had bitten the insides of her mouth until they were raw and smarting, and burnt unbearably when she washed them with Listerine. She had quarreled so persistently with Anthony that he had left the apartment in a cold fury. But because he was intimidated by her exceptional frigidity, he called up an hour afterward, apologized, and said he was having dinner at the Amsterdam Club, the only one in which he still retained membership. It was after one o'clock, and she had breakfasted at eleven, so, deciding to forego luncheon, she started for a walk in the park. At three there would be a mail. She would be back by three. It was an afternoon of premature spring. Water was drying on the walks, and in the park little girls were gravely wheeling white doll buggies up and down under the thin trees, while behind them followed bored nursery maids in twos, discussing with each other those tremendous secrets that are peculiar to nursery maids. Two o'clock by her little gold watch. She should have a new watch, one made in a platinum oblong and encrusted with diamonds. But those cost even more than squirrel coats, and of course they were out of their reach now, like everything else. Unless, perhaps, the right letter was awaiting her, in about an hour, fifty-eight minutes exactly, ten to get there, left forty-eight, forty-seven now, Little girls soberly wheeling their buggies along the damp sunny walks, the nursery maids chattering in pairs about their inscrutable secrets, here and there a raggedy man seated upon newspapers spread on a drying bench, related not to the radiant and delightful afternoon, but to the dingy snow that slept exhausted in obscure corners, waiting for extermination. Ages later, 
Coming into the dim hall, she saw the Martinique elevator boy standing incongruously in the light of the stained-glass window. "'Is there any mail for us?' she asked. "'Upstairs, madame.' The switchboard squawked abominably, and Gloria waited while he ministered to the telephone. She sickened as the elevator groaned its way up. The floors passed like the slow lapse of centuries, each one ominous, accusing, significant. The letter, a white leprous spot, lay upon the dirty tiles of the hall. "'My dear Gloria, we had the test run off yesterday afternoon, and Mr. Debris seemed to think that for the part he had in mind he needed a younger woman. He said that the acting was not bad, and there was a small character part supposed to be a very haughty rich widow that he thought you might— Desolately, Gloria raised her glance until it fell out across the areaway. But she found she could not see the opposite wall, for her gray eyes were full of tears. She walked into the bedroom. The letter crinkled tightly in her hand and sank down upon her knees before the long mirror on the wardrobe floor. This was her twenty-ninth birthday, and the world was melting away before her eyes. She tried to think that it had been the make-up, but her emotions were too profound, too overwhelming, for any consolation that the thought conveyed. She strained to see until she could feel the flesh on her temples pull forward. Yes, the cheeks were ever so faintly thin, the corners of the eyes were lined with tiny wrinkles. The eyes were different. Why, they were different. And then, suddenly, she knew how tired her eyes were. "'Oh, my pretty face!' she whispered, passionately grieving. "'Oh, my pretty face! Oh, I don't want to live without my pretty face! Oh, what's happened?' Then she slid toward the mirror and, as in the test, sprawled face downward upon the floor and lay there sobbing. It was the first awkward movement she had ever made. End of Book 3, Chapter 2, Part 2 of 2《Book 3, Chapter 3, Part 1 of 2 of The Beautiful and Damned》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald Book 3, Chapter 3, No Matter, Part 1 of 2 Within another year, Anthony and Gloria had become like players who had lost their costumes, lacking the pride to continue on the note of tragedy, so that, when Mrs. and Miss Holm of Kansas City cut them dead in the plaza one evening, it was only that Mrs. and Miss Holm, like most people, abominated mirrors of their atavistic selves. Their new apartment, for which they paid eighty-five dollars a month, was situated on Claremont Avenue, which is two blocks from the Hudson, in the dim hundreds. They had lived there a month when Muriel Kane came to see them late one afternoon. It was a reproachless twilight on the summer side of spring. Anthony lay upon the lounge, looking up 127th Street toward the river, near which he could just see a single patch of vivid green trees that guaranteed the brummagem umbrageousness of Riverside Drive. Across the water were the palisades, crowned by the ugly framework of the amusement park, yet soon it would be dusk, and those same iron cobwebs would be a glory against the heavens, an enchanted palace set over the smooth radiance of a tropical canal. The streets near the apartment, Anthony had found, were streets where children played, streets a little nicer than those he had been used to pass on his way to Marietta, but of the same general sort, with an occasional hand organ or hurdy-gurdy, and in the cool of the evening many pairs of young girls walking down to the corner drug store for ice cream soda, and dreaming unlimited dreams under the low heavens. Dusk in the streets now, and children playing shouting up incoherent ecstatic words that faded out close to the open window, and Muriel, who had come to find Gloria, chattering to him from an opaque gloom over across the room. "'Light the lamp, why don't we?' she suggested. "'It's getting ghostly in here.' With a tired movement he arose and obeyed. The grey window panes vanished. He stretched himself. He was heavier now. His stomach was a limp weight against his belt. His flesh had softened and expanded. He was thirty-two, and his mind was a bleak and disordered wreck. "'Have a little drink, Muriel?' 
Not me, thanks. I don't use it any more. What are you doing these days, Anthony? She asked curiously. Well, I've been pretty busy with this lawsuit, he answered indifferently. It's gone to the Court of Appeals. Ought to be settled up one way or the other by autumn. There's been some objection as to whether the Court of Appeals has jurisdiction over the matter. Muriel made a clicking sound with her tongue and cocked her head on one side. Well, you tell him. I never heard of anything taking so long. Oh, they all do, he replied listlessly. All will cases. They say it's exceptional to have one settled under four or five years. Oh, Muriel daringly changed her tack. Why don't you go to work, you lazy? At what? he demanded abruptly. Why, at anything, I suppose. You're still a young man. If that's encouragement, I'm much obliged, he answered dryly. And then, with sudden weariness, does it bother you particularly that I don't want to work? It doesn't bother me, but it does bother a lot of people who claim, Oh, God, he said brokenly. It seems to me that for three years I've heard nothing about myself but wild stories and virtuous admonitions. I'm tired of it. If you don't want to see us, let us alone. I don't bother my former friends, but I need no charity calls and no criticism disguised as good advice. Then he added apologetically, I'm sorry, but really, Muriel, you mustn't talk like a lady slum worker even if you are visiting the lower middle classes. He turned his bloodshot eyes on her reproachfully, eyes that had once been a deep, clear blue that were weak now, strained and half-ruined from reading when he was drunk. "'Why do you say such awful things?' she protested. "'You talk as if you and Gloria were in the middle classes.' "'Why pretend we're not? I hate people who claim to be great aristocrats when they can't even keep up the appearances of it. Do you think a person has to have money to be aristocratic?' "'Muriel, the horrified Democrat. "'Why, of course.' Aristocracies only in admission that certain traits which we call fine, courage and honor and beauty and all that sort of thing, can best be developed in a favorable environment, where you don't have the warpings of ignorance and necessity. Muriel bit her lower lip and waved her head from side to side. Well, all I say is that if a person comes from a good family, they're always nice people. That's the trouble with you and Gloria. You think that just because things aren't going your way right now, all your old friends are trying to avoid you. You're too sensitive. As a matter of fact, said Anthony, you know nothing at all about it. With me, it's simply a matter of pride, and for once, Gloria's reasonable enough to agree that we oughtn't go where we're not wanted, and people don't want us. We're too much the ideal bad examples. Nonsense. You can't park your pessimism in my little sudden parlor. I think you ought to forget all those morbid speculations and go to work. Here I am, thirty-two. Suppose I did start in at some idiotic business. Perhaps in two years I might rise to fifty dollars a week, with luck. That's if I could get a job at all. There's an awful lot of unemployment. Well, suppose I made fifty a week. Do you think I'd be any happier? Do you think that if I don't get this money of my grandfather's, life will be endurable? Muriel smiled complacently. Well, she said, that may be clever, but it isn't common sense. A few minutes later Gloria came in, seeming to bring with her into the room some dark color indeterminate and rare. In a taciturn way, she was happy to see Muriel. She greeted Anthony with a casual, Hi! I've been talking philosophy with your husband, cried the irrepressible Miss Kane. We took up some fundamental concepts, said Anthony, a faint smile disturbing his pale cheeks, paler still under two days' growth of beard. Oblivious to his irony, Muriel rehashed her contention. When she had done, Gloria said quietly, Anthony's right. It's no fun to go around when you have the sense that people are looking at you in a certain way. He broke in plaintively. Don't you think that when even Maury Noble, who was my best friend, won't come to see us, it's high time to stop calling people up? Tears were standing in his eyes. That was your fault about Maury Noble, said Gloria coolly. It wasn't. It most certainly was. Muriel intervened quickly. I met a girl who knew Maury the other day, and she says he doesn't drink any more. He's getting pretty cagey. Doesn't? Practically not at all. He's making piles of money. He's sort of changed since the war. He's going to marry a girl in Philadelphia who has millions. Cecil Larrabee. Anyway, that's what the town tattle said. He's thirty-three, said Anthony, thinking aloud. But it's odd to imagine his getting married. I used to think he was so brilliant. He was, murmured Gloria, in a way. But brilliant people don't settle down in business, or do they? Or what do they do? 
or what becomes of everybody you used to know and have so much in common with? You drift apart, suggested Muriel with the appropriate dreamy look. They change, said Gloria. All the qualities that they don't use in their daily lives get cobwebbed up. The last thing he said to me, recollected Anthony, was that he was going to work so as to forget there was nothing worth working for. Muriel caught at this quickly. That's what you ought to do, she exclaimed triumphantly. Of course I shouldn't think anybody would want to work for nothing, but it'd give you something to do. What do you do with yourselves, anyway? Nobody ever sees you at Montre or, or anywhere. Are you economizing? Gloria laughed scornfully, glancing at Anthony from the corners of her eyes. Well, he demanded, what are you laughing at? You know what I'm laughing at, she answered coldly. At that case of whiskey? Yes. She turned to Muriel. He paid seventy-five dollars for a case of whiskey yesterday. What if I did? It's cheaper that way than if you get it by the bottle. You needn't pretend that you won't drink any of it. At least I don't drink in the daytime. That's a fine distinction, he cried, springing to his feet in a weak rage. What's more, I'll be damned if you can hurl that at me every few minutes. It's true. It is not. And I'm getting sick of this eternal business of criticizing me before visitors. He had worked himself up to such a state that his arms and shoulders were visibly trembling. You'd think everything was my fault. You'd think you hadn't encouraged me to spend money, and spent a lot more on yourself than I ever did by a long shot. Now Gloria rose to her feet. I won't let you talk to me that way. All right, then. By heaven, you don't have to. In a sort of rush, he left the room. The two women heard his steps in the hall, and then the front door banged. Gloria sank back into her chair. Her face was lovely in the lamplight, composed, inscrutable. Oh, cried Muriel in distress. Oh, what is the matter? Nothing particularly. He's just drunk. Drunk? Why, he's perfectly sober. He talked. Gloria shook her head. Oh, no, he doesn't show it any more unless he can hardly stand up. And he talks all right until he gets excited. He talks much better than he does when he's sober. But he's been sitting here all day drinking, except for the time it took him to walk to the corner for a newspaper. Oh, how terrible! Muriel was sincerely moved, her eyes filled with tears. Has this happened much? Drinking, you mean? No, this, leaving you. Oh, yes, frequently. He'll come in about midnight, and weep and ask me to forgive him. And do you? I don't know. We just go on. The two women sat there in the lamplight and looked at each other, each in a different way helpless before this thing. Gloria was still pretty, as pretty as she would ever be again. Her cheeks were flushed, and she was wearing a new dress that she had bought, imprudently, for fifty dollars. She had hoped she could persuade Anthony to take her out tonight, to a restaurant or even to one of the great gorgeous moving picture palaces, where there would be a few people to look at her, at whom she could bear it to look in turn. She wanted this because she knew her cheeks were flushed, and because her dress was new and becomingly fragile. Only very occasionally, now, did they receive any invitations, but she did not tell these things to Muriel. "'Gloria, dear, I wish we could have dinner together, but I promised a man, and it's seven-thirty already. I've got to tear. Oh, I couldn't anyway. In the first place, I've been ill all day. I couldn't eat a thing.' After she had walked with Muriel to the door, Gloria came back into the room, turned out the lamp, and leaning her elbows on the window sill, looked out at Palisades Park where the brilliant revolving circle of the ferris wheel was like a trembling mirror catching the yellow reflection of the moon. The street was quiet now. The children had gone in. Over the way she could see a family at dinner. Pointlessly, ridiculously, they rose and walked about the table. Seen thus, all that they did appeared incongruous. It was as though they were being jiggled carelessly and to no purpose by invisible overhead wires. She looked at her watch. It was eight o'clock. She had been pleased for a part of the day, in the early afternoon, in walking along that Broadway of Harlem, 125th Street, with her nostrils alert to many odors, and her mind excited by the extraordinary beauty of some Italian children. It affected her curiously, as Fifth Avenue had affected her once, in the days when, with the placid confidence of beauty, she had known that it was all hers, every shop and all it held, every adult toy glittering in a window, all hers for the asking. Here on 125th Street there were Salvation Army bands and spectrum-shawled old ladies on doorsteps 
and sugary, sticky candy in the grimy hands of shiny-haired children, and the late sun striking down on the sides of the tall tenements, all very rich and racy and savory, like a dish by a provident French chef one could not help enjoying, even though one knew that the ingredients were probably leftovers. Gloria shuddered suddenly as a river siren came moaning over the dusky roofs, and leaning back in till the ghostly curtains fell from her shoulder, she turned on the electric lamp. It was growing late. She knew there was some change in her purse, and she considered whether she would go down and have some coffee and rolls, where the liberated subway made a roaring cave of Manhattan Street, or eat the deviled ham and bread in the kitchen. Her purse decided for her. It contained a nickel and two pennies. After an hour, the silence of the room had grown unbearable, and she found that her eyes were wandering from her magazine to the ceiling, toward which she stared without thought. Suddenly she stood up, hesitated for a moment, biting at her finger. Then she went to the pantry, took down a bottle of whiskey from the shelf, and poured herself a drink. She filled up the glass with ginger ale, and, returning to her chair, finished an article in the magazine. It concerned the last revolutionary widow, who, when a young girl, had married an ancient veteran of the Continental Army, and who had died in 1906. It seemed strange and oddly romantic to Gloria that she and this woman had been contemporaries. She turned the page and learned that a candidate for Congress was being accused of atheism by an opponent. Gloria's surprise vanished when she found that the charges were false. The candidate had merely denied the miracle of the loaves and fishes. He admitted, under pressure, that he gave full credence to the stroll upon the water. Finishing her first drink, Gloria got herself a second. After slipping on a negligee and making herself comfortable on the lounge, she became conscious that she was miserable and that the tears were rolling down her cheeks. She wondered if they were tears of self-pity and tried resolutely not to cry, but this existence without hope, without happiness, oppressed her, and she kept shaking her head from side to side, her mouth drawn down tremulously in the corners, as though she were denying an assertion made by someone, somewhere. She did not know that this gesture of hers was years older than history, that, for a hundred generations of men, intolerable and persistent grief has offered that gesture of denial, of protest, of bewilderment, to something more profound, more powerful than the God made in the image of man, and before which that God, did he exist, would be equally impotent. It is a truth set at the heart of tragedy that this force never explains, never answers, this force intangible as air, more definite than death. Richard Caramel Early in the summer, Anthony resigned from his last club, the Amsterdam. He had come to visit it hardly twice a year, and the dues were a recurrent burden. He had joined it on his return from Italy because it had been his grandfather's club and his father's, and because it was a club that, given the opportunity, one indisputably joined. But, as a matter of fact, he had preferred the Harvard club, largely because of Dick and Moray. However, with the decline of his fortunes, it had seemed an increasingly desirable bauble to cling to. It was relinquished at the last, with some regret. His companions numbered now a curious dozen. Several of them he had met in a place called Sammy's, on 43rd Street, where, if one knocked on the door and were favorably passed on from behind a grating, one could sit around a great round table drinking fairly good whiskey. It was here that he encountered a man named Parker Allison, who had been exactly the wrong sort of rounder at Harvard, and who was running through a large yeast fortune as rapidly as possible. Parker Allison's notion of distinction consisted in driving a noisy red and yellow racing car up Broadway with two glittering, hard-eyed girls beside him. He was the sort who dined with two girls rather than one. His imagination was almost incapable of sustaining a dialogue. Besides Allison, there was Pete Lytell, who wore a gray derby on the side of his head, he always had money, and he was customarily cheerful, so Anthony held aimless, long-winded conversation with him through many afternoons of the summer and fall. Lytell, he found, not only talked but reasoned in phrases. His philosophy was a series of them, assimilated here and there through an active, thoughtless life. He had phrases about socialism, the immemorial ones. He had phrases pertaining to the existence of a personal deity, something about one time when he had been in a railroad accident and he had phrases about the Irish problem, the sort of woman he respected, and the futility of prohibition. 
The only time his conversation ever rose superior to these muddled clauses with which he interpreted the most rococo happenings in a life that had been more than usually eventful was when he got down to the detailed discussion of his most animal existence. He knew, to a subtlety, the foods, the liquor, and the women that he preferred. He was at once the commonest and most remarkable product of civilization. He was nine out of ten people that one passes on a city street, and he was a hairless ape with two dozen tricks. He was the hero of a thousand romances of life and art, and he was a virtual moron, performing staidly yet absurdly a series of complicated and infinitely astounding epics over a span of threescore years. With men such as these two, Anthony Patch drank and discussed and drank and argued. He liked them because they knew nothing about him, because they lived in the obvious and had not the faintest conception of the inevitable continuity of life. They sat not before a motion picture with consecutive reels, but at a musty, old-fashioned travelogue, with all values stark and hence all implications confused. Yet they themselves were not confused, because there was nothing in them to be confused. They changed phrases from month to month, as they changed neckties. Anthony, the courteous, the subtle, the perspicacious, was drunk each day, in Sammy's with these men, in the apartment over a book, some book he knew, and, very rarely, with Gloria, who, in his eyes, had begun to develop the unmistakable outlines of a quarrelsome and unreasonable woman. She was not the Gloria of old, certainly, the Gloria who, had she been sick, would have preferred to inflict misery upon every one around her rather than confess that she needed sympathy or assistance. She was not above whining now. She was not above being sorry for herself. Each night, when she prepared for bed, she smeared her face with some new ungent, which she hoped, illogically, would give back the glow and freshness to her vanishing beauty. When Anthony was drunk, he taunted her about this. When he was sober, he was polite to her, on occasions even tender. He seemed to show, for short hours, a trace of that old quality of understanding too well to blame, that quality which was the best of him, and had worked swiftly and ceaselessly toward his ruin. But he hated to be sober. It made him conscious of the people around him, of that air of struggle, of greedy ambition, of hope more sordid than despair, of incessant passage up or down, which, in every metropolis, is most in evidence through the unstable middle class. Unable to live with the rich, he thought that his next choice would have been to live with the very poor. Anything was better than this cup of perspiration and tears. The sense of the enormous panorama of life, never strong in Anthony, had become dim almost to extinction. At long intervals now some incident, some gesture of Gloria's, would take his fancy, but the gray veils had come down in earnest upon him. As he grew older those things faded, after that there was wine. There was a kindliness about intoxication. There was that indescribable gloss and glamour it gave, like the memories of ephemeral and faded evenings. After a few highballs, there was magic in the tall, glowing Arabian night of the Bush Terminal building, its summit a peak of sheer grandeur, gold and dreaming against the inaccessible sky, and Wall Street, the crass, the banal. Again it was the triumph of gold, a gorgeous sentient spectacle. It was where the great kings kept the money for their wars. The fruit of youth or of the grape, the transitory magic of the brief passage from darkness to darkness, the old illusion that truth and beauty were in some way entwined. As he stood in front of Delmonico's, lighting a cigarette one night, he saw two hansoms drawn up close to the curb, waiting for a chance drunken fare. The outmoded cabs were worn and dirty, the cracked patent leather wrinkled like an old man's face, the cushions faded to a brownish lavender. The very horses were ancient and weary, so were the white-haired men who sat aloft, cracking their whips, with a grotesque affectation of gallantry, a relic of vanished gaiety. Anthony Patch walked away in a sudden fit of depression, pondering the bitterness of such survivals. There was nothing, it seemed, that grew stale so soon as pleasure. On 42nd Street one afternoon he met Richard Caramel for the first time in many months, a prosperous, fattening Richard Caramel, whose face was filling out to match the Bostonian brow. "'Just got in this week from the coast.' was going to call you up, but I didn't know your new address. We've moved. Richard Caramel noticed that Anthony was wearing a soiled shirt, that his cuffs were slightly but perceptibly frayed, that his eyes were set in half-moons the color of cigar smoke. 
So I gathered, he said, fixing his friend with his bright yellow eye. But where and how is Gloria? My God, Anthony, I've been hearing the doggondest stories about you two, even out in California. And when I get back to New York, I find you've sunk absolutely out of sight. Why don't you pull yourself together? Now listen, chattered Anthony unsteadily. I can't stand a long lecture. We've lost money in a dozen ways, and naturally people have talked. On account of the lawsuit, but the thing's coming to a final decision this winter, surely. You're talking so fast that I can't understand you, interrupted Dick calmly. Well, I've said all I'm going to say, snapped Anthony. Come and see us if you like, or don't. With this he turned and started to walk off in the crowd, but Dick overtook him suddenly and grasped his arm. Say, Anthony, don't fly off the handle so easily. You know Gloria's my cousin, and you're one of my oldest friends, so it's natural for me to be interested when I hear that you're going to the dogs and taking her with you. I don't want to be preached to. Well, then, all right. How about coming up to my apartment and having a drink? I've just got settled. I've bought three cases of Gordon Gin from a revenue officer. As they walked along, he continued in a burst of exasperation. And how about your grandfather's money? You going to get it? Well, answered Anthony resentfully, that old fool hate seems hopeful, especially because people are tired of reformers right now. You know, it might make a slight difference, for instance, if some judge thought that Adam Patch made it harder for him to get liquor. You can't do without money, said Dick sententiously. Have you tried to write any lately? Anthony shook his head silently. That's funny, said Dick. I always thought that you and Maury would write some day and now he's grown to be a sort of tight-fisted aristocrat, and you're... I'm the bad example. I wonder why. You probably think you know, suggested Anthony, with an effort at concentration. The failure and the success both believe in their hearts that they have accurately balanced points of view. The success because he succeeded, and the failure because he's failed. The successful man tells his son to profit by his father's good fortune, and the failure tells his son to profit by his father's mistakes. I don't agree with you, said the author of A Shave Tale in France. I used to listen to you and Maury when we were young, and I used to be impressed because you were so consistently cynical. But now, well, after all, by God, which of us three has taken to the, to the intellectual life? I don't want to sound vainglorious, but it's me, and I've always believed that moral values existed, and I always will. Well, objected Anthony, who was rather enjoying himself. Even granting that, you know that, in practice, life never presents problems as clear-cut, does it? It does to me. There's nothing I'd violate certain principles for. But how do you know when you're violating them? You have to guess at things, just like most people do. You have to apportion the values when you look back. You finish up the portrait, then paint in the details and shadows. Dick shook his head with a lofty stubbornness. Same old feudal cynic, he said. It's just a mode of being sorry for yourself. You don't do anything, so nothing matters. Oh, I'm quite capable of self-pity, admitted Anthony, nor am I claiming that I'm getting as much fun out of life as you are. You say, at least you used to, that happiness is the only thing worthwhile in life. Do you think you're any happier for being a pessimist? Anthony grunted savagely. His pleasure in the conversation began to wane. He was nervous and craving for a drink. My golly, he cried, where do you live? I can't keep walking forever. Your endurance is all mental, eh? returned Dick sharply. Well, I live right here. He turned in at the apartment house on 49th Street, and a few minutes later they were in a large new room with an open fireplace and four walls lined with books. A colored butler served them gin rickies, and an hour vanished politely with the mellow shortening of their drinks and the glow of a light mid-autumn fire. The arts are very old, said Anthony after a while. With the few glasses, the tension of his nerves relaxed, and he found that he could think again. Which art? All of them. Poetry is dying fast. It'll be absorbed into prose sooner or later. For instance, the beautiful word, the colored and glittering word, and the beautiful simile belong in prose now. To get attention, poetry has got to strain for the unusual word, the harsh, earthy word that's never been beautiful before. Beauty, as the sum of several beautiful parts, reached its apotheosis in Swinburne. It can't go any further, except in the novel, perhaps. Dick interrupted him impatiently. You know these new novels make me tired. My God, everywhere I go some silly girl asks me if I've read This Side of Paradise. Are girls really like that? 
If it's true to life, which I don't believe, the next generation is going to the dogs. I'm sick of all this shoddy realism. I think there's a place for the romanticist in literature. Anthony tried to remember what he had read lately of Richard Caramel's. There was a shave tale in France, a novel called The Land of Strong Men, and several dozen short stories which were even worse. It had become the custom among young and clever reviewers to mention Richard Caramel with a smile of scorn. Mr. Richard Caramel, they called him. His corpse was dragged obscenely through every literary supplement. He was accused of making a great fortune by writing trash for the movies. As the fashion in books shifted, he was becoming almost a byword of contempt. While Anthony was thinking this, Dick had got to his feet, and seemed to be hesitating at an avowal. "'I've gathered quite a few books,' he said suddenly. "'So I see. I've made an exhaustive collection of good American stuff, old and new. I don't mean the usual Longfellow Whittier thing. In fact, most of it's modern.' He stepped to one of the walls, and, seeing that it was expected of him, Anthony arose and followed. Look. Under a printed tag Americana, he displayed six long rows of books, beautifully bound and, obviously, carefully chosen. And here are the contemporary novelists. Then Anthony saw the Joker. Wedged in between Mark Twain and Dreiser were eight strange and inappropriate volumes, the works of Richard Caramel, the demon lover, true enough, but also seven others that were execrably awful, without sincerity or grace. Unwillingly, Anthony glanced at Dick's face, and caught a slight uncertainty there. "'I've put my own books in, of course,' said Richard Caramel, hastily, "'though one or two of them are uneven. I'm afraid I wrote a little too fast when I had that magazine contract. But I don't believe in false modesty. Of course some of the critics haven't paid so much attention to me since I've been established. But, after all, it's not the critics that count. They're just sheep.' For the first time in so long that he could scarcely remember, Anthony felt a touch of the old, pleasant contempt for his friend. Richard Caramel continued. My publishers, you know, have been advertising me as the Thackeray of America because of my New York novel. Yes, Anthony managed to muster. I suppose there's a good deal in what you say. He knew that his contempt was unreasonable. He knew that he would have changed places with Dick unhesitatingly. He himself had tried his best to write with his tongue in his cheek. Ah, well then. Can a man disparage his life work so readily? And that night, while Richard Caramel was hard at toil, with great hittings of the wrong keys and screwings up of his weary, unmatched eyes, laboring over his trash far into those cheerless hours when the fire dies down and the head is swimming from the effect of prolonged concentration, Anthony, abominably drunk, was sprawled across the back seat of a taxi on his way to the flat on Claremont Avenue. End of Book 3, Chapter 3, Part 1 of 2book three chapter three part two of two of the beautiful and damned this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the beautiful and damned by f scott fitzgerald book three chapter three no matter part two of two the beating as winter approached it seemed that a sort of madness seized upon Anthony. He awoke in the morning so nervous that Gloria could feel him trembling in the bed before he could muster enough vitality to stumble into the pantry for a drink. He was intolerable now except under the influence of liquor, and as he seemed to decay and coarsen under her eyes, Gloria's soul and body shrank away from him. When he stayed out all night, as he did several times, she not only failed to be sorry, but even felt a measure of dismal relief. Next day he would be faintly repentant, and would remark, in a gruff, hang-dog fashion, that he guessed he was drinking a little too much. For hours at a time he would sit in the great armchair that had been in his apartment, lost in a sort of stupor. Even his interest in reading his favorite books seemed to have departed, and though an incessant bickering went on between husband and wife, the one subject upon which they ever really conversed was the progress of the will case. What Gloria hoped in the tenebrous depths of her soul, what she expected that great gift of money to bring about, is difficult to imagine. 
she was being bent by her environment into a grotesque similitude of a housewife. She, who until three years before had never made coffee, prepared sometimes three meals a day. She walked a great deal in the afternoons, and in the evening she read, books, magazines, anything she found at hand. If now she wished for a child, even a child of the Anthony who sought her bed blind drunk, she neither said so, nor gave any show or sign of interest in children. It is doubtful if she could have made it clear to anyone what it was she wanted, or indeed what there was to want. A lonely, lovely woman, thirty now, retrenched behind some impregnable inhibition, born and coexistent with her beauty. One afternoon, when the snow was dirty again along Riverside Drive, Gloria, who had been to the grocer's, entered the apartment to find Anthony pacing the floor in a state of aggravated nervousness. The feverish eyes he turned on her were traced with tiny pink lines that reminded her of rivers on a map. For a moment she received the impression that he was suddenly and definitely old. "'Have you any money?' he inquired of her precipitately. "'What? What do you mean?' "'Just what I said. Money, money. Can't you speak English?' She paid no attention, but brushed by him and into the pantry to put the bacon and eggs in the icebox. When his drinking had been unusually excessive, he was invariably in a whining mood. This time he followed her, and, standing in the pantry door, persisted in his question. "'You heard what I said. Have you any money?' She turned about from the icebox and faced him. "'Why, Anthony, you must be crazy. You know I haven't any money, except a dollar in change.' He executed an abrupt about-face and returned to the living-room, where he renewed his pacing. It was evident that he had something portentous on his mind. He quite obviously wanted to be asked what was the matter. Joining him a moment later, she sat upon the long lounge and began taking down her hair. It was no longer bobbed, and it had changed in the last year from a rich gold dusted with red to an unresplendent light brown. She had bought some shampoo soap and meant to wash it now. She had considered putting a bottle of peroxide into the rinsing water. Well, she implied silently. That darn bank, he quavered. They've had my account for over ten years. Ten years! Well, it seems they've got some autocratic rule that you have to keep over five hundred dollars there, or they won't carry you. They wrote me a letter a few months ago and told me I'd been running too low. Once I gave out two bum checks. Remember? The night in Reason Weavers? But I made them good the very next day. Well, I promised old Halloran, he's the manager of the greedy Mick, that I'd watch out. And I thought I was going all right. I kept up the stubs in my checkbook pretty regular. Well, I went in there today to cash a check, and Halloran came up and told me they'd have to close my account. Too many bad checks, he said, and I never had more than five hundred to my credit, and that only for a day or so at a time. And by God, what do you think he said then? What? He said this was a good time to do it because I didn't have a damn penny in there. You didn't? That's what he told me. Seems I'd given these Bidros people a check for sixty for that last case of liquor, and I only had forty-five dollars in the bank. Well, the Bidros people deposited fifteen dollars to my account and drew the whole thing out. In her ignorance, Gloria conjured up a specter of imprisonment and disgrace. Oh, they won't do anything, he assured her. Bootlegging's too risky a business. They'll send me a bill for fifteen dollars and I'll pay it. Oh, she considered a moment. Well, we can sell another bond. He laughed sarcastically. Oh, yes, that's always easy. When the few bonds we have that are paying any interest at all are only worth between fifty and eighty cents on the dollar, we lose about half the bond every time we sell. What else can we do? Oh, we'll sell something, as usual. We've got paper worth eighty thousand dollars at par. Again he laughed unpleasantly. Bring about thirty thousand on the open market. I distrusted those ten percent investments. The deuce you did, he said. You pretended you did, so you could claw at me if they went to pieces, but you wanted to take a chance as much as I did. She was silent a moment, as if considering. Then, Anthony, she cried suddenly, two hundred a month is worse than nothing. Let's sell all the bonds and put the thirty thousand dollars in the bank, and if we lose the case, we can live in Italy for three years and then just die. In her excitement, as she talked, she was aware of a faint flush of sentiment, the first she had felt in many days. Three years, he said nervously. Three years? You're crazy. Mr. Haight will take more than that if we lose. Do you think he's working for charity? I forgot that. 
And here it is Saturday, he continued, and I've only got a dollar and some change, and we've got to live till Monday when I can get to my broker's. And not a drink in the house, he added, as a significant afterthought. Can't you call up Dick? I did. His man says he's gone down to Princeton to address a literary club or some such thing. Won't be back till Monday. Well, let's see. Don't you know some friend you might go to? I've tried a couple of fellows. Couldn't find anybody in. I wish I'd sold that Keats letter like I started to last week. How about those men you play cards with in that Sammy place? Do you think I'd ask them? His voice rang with righteous horror. Gloria winced. He would rather contemplate her active discomfort than feel his own skin crawl at asking an inappropriate favor. I thought of Muriel, he suggested. She's in California. Well, how about some of those men who gave you such a good time while I was in the army? You'd think they might be glad to do a little favor for you. She looked at him contemptuously, but he took no notice. Or how about your old friend Rachel, or Constance Merriam? Constance Merriam's been dead a year, and I wouldn't ask Rachel. Well, how about that gentleman who was so anxious to help you once that he could hardly restrain himself, Blockman? Oh, he had hurt her at last, and he was not too obtuse or too careless to perceive it. Why not him? he insisted callously. Because he doesn't like me any more, she said with difficulty. And then, as he did not answer, but only regarded her cynically, if you want to know why, I'll tell you. A year ago I went to Blockman, he's changed his name to Black, and asked him to put me into pictures. You went to Blockman? Yes. Why didn't you tell me? he demanded incredulously, the smile fading from his face. Because you were probably off drinking somewhere. He had them give me a test, and they decided that I wasn't young enough for anything except a character part. A character part? A woman of thirty sort of thing. I wasn't thirty, and I didn't think I looked thirty. "'Why, damn him!' cried Anthony, championing her violently, with a curious perverseness of emotion. "'Why—' "'Well, that's why I can't go to him.' "'Why, the insolence!' insisted Anthony nervously. "'The insolence!' "'Anthony, that doesn't matter now. The thing is, we've got to live over Sunday, and there's nothing in the house but a loaf of bread and a half pound of bacon and two eggs for breakfast.' She handed him the contents of her purse. There's seventy, eighty, a dollar fifteen. With what you have, that makes about two and a half altogether, doesn't it? Anthony, we can get along on that. We can buy lots of food with that. More than we can possibly eat. Jiggling the change in his hand, he shook his head. No, I've got to have a drink. I'm so darn nervous that I'm shivering. A thought struck him. Perhaps Sammy'd cash a check, and then Monday I could rush down to the bank with the money but they've closed your account. That's right, that's right, I'd forgotten. I'll tell you what, I'll go down to Sammy's, and I'll find somebody there who'll lend me something. I hate like the devil to ask them, though. He snapped his fingers suddenly. I know what I'll do. I'll hawk my watch. I can get twenty dollars on it and get it back before Monday for sixty cents extra. It's been hawked before, when I was at Cambridge. He had put on his overcoat, and with a brief goodbye he started down the hall toward the outer door. Gloria got to her feet. It had suddenly occurred to her where he would probably go first. "'Anthony,' she called after him, "'hadn't you better leave two dollars with me? You'll only need car fare.' The outer door slammed. He had pretended not to hear her. She stood for a moment, looking after him. Then she went into the bathroom, among her tragic ungents, and began preparations for washing her hair." Down at Sammy's he found Parker Allison and Pete Lytell sitting alone at a table, drinking whiskey sours. It was just after six o'clock, and Sammy, or Samuel Bendiri, as he had been christened, was sweeping an accumulation of cigarette butts and broken glass into a corner. "'Hi, Tony,' called Parker Allison to Anthony. Sometimes he addressed him as Tony, at other times it was Dan. To him all Anthonys must sail under one of these diminutives." Sit down. What'll you have? On the subway, Anthony had counted his money and found that he had almost four dollars. He could pay for two rounds at fifty cents a drink, which meant that he would have six drinks. Then he would go over to Sixth Avenue and get twenty dollars and a pawn ticket in exchange for his watch. Well, roughnecks, he said jovially, how's the life of crime? Pretty good, said Allison. He winked at Pete Lytell. Too bad you're a married man. 
We've got some pretty good stuff lined up for about eleven o'clock when the show's let out. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. Too bad he's married, isn't it, Pete? It's a shame. At half-past seven, when they had completed the six rounds, Anthony found that his intentions were giving audience to his desires. He was happy and cheerful now, thoroughly enjoying himself. It seemed to him that the story which Pete had just finished telling was unusually and profoundly humorous, and he decided, as he did every day at about this point, that they were damn good fellows, by golly, who would do a lot more for him than anyone else he knew. The pawn shops would remain open until late Saturday nights, and he felt that if he took just one more drink, he would attain a gorgeous rose-colored exhilaration. Artfully, he fished in his vest pockets, brought up his two quarters, and stared at them as though in surprise. "'Well, I'll be darned,' he protested in an aggrieved tone. "'Here I've come out without my pocketbook.' "'Need some cash?' asked Lytell easily. "'I left my money on the dresser at home, and I wanted to buy you another drink.' "'Oh, knock it,' Lytell waved the suggestion away disparagingly. "'I guess we can blow a good fellow to all the drinks he wants. "'What do you have, same?' "'I tell you,' suggested Parker Allison. "'Suppose we send Sammy across the street for some sandwiches "'and eat dinner here.' "'The other two agreed. "'Good idea. "'Hey, Sammy, why don't you do something for us?' "'Just after nine o'clock, Anthony staggered to his feet "'and, bidding them a thick good night, "'walked unsteadily to the door.' handing Sammy one of his two quarters as he passed out. Once in the street, he hesitated uncertainly, and then started in the direction of Sixth Avenue, where he remembered to have frequently passed several loan offices. He went by a newsstand and two drug stores, and then he realized that he was standing in front of the place which he sought, and that it was shut and barred. Unperturbed, he continued. Another one, half a block down, was also closed. So were two more across the street, and a fifth in the square below. Seeing a faint light in the last one, he began to knock on the glass door. He desisted only when a watchman appeared in the back of the shop and motioned him angrily to move on. With growing discouragement, with growing befuddlement, he crossed the street and walked back toward 43rd. On the corner near Sammy's he paused, undecided. If he went back to the apartment, as he felt his body required, he would lay himself open to bitter reproach. Yet, now that the pawn shops were closed, he had no notion where to get the money. He decided finally that he might ask Parker Allison after all, but he approached Sammy's only to find the door locked and the lights out. He looked at his watch. 9.30. He began walking. Ten minutes later, he stopped aimlessly at the corner of 43rd and Madison Avenue, diagonally across from the bright, but nearly deserted entrance to the Biltmore Hotel. Here he stood for a moment, and then sat down heavily on a damp board amid some debris of construction work. He rested there for almost half an hour, his mind a shifting pattern of surface thoughts, chiefest among which were that he must obtain some money and get home before he became too sodden to find his way. Then, glancing over toward the Biltmore, he saw a man standing directly under the overhead glow of the porte cochere lamps beside a woman in an ermine coat. As Anthony watched, the couple moved forward and signaled to a taxi. Anthony perceived, by the infallible identification that lurks in the walk of a friend, that it was Maury Noble. He rose to his feet. Maury! he shouted. Maury looked in his direction, then turned back to the girl, just as the taxi came up into place. With the chaotic idea of borrowing ten dollars, Anthony began to run as fast as he could across Madison Avenue and along 43rd Street. As he came up, Maury was standing beside the yawning door of the taxicab. His companion turned and looked curiously at Anthony. "'Hello, Maury,' he said, holding out his hand. "'How are you?' "'Fine, thank you.' Their hands dropped, and Anthony hesitated. Maury made no move to introduce him but only stood there regarding him with an inscrutable feline silence. "'I wanted to see you,' began Anthony uncertainly. He did not feel that he could ask for a loan, with the girl not four feet away, so he broke off and made a perceptible motion of his head, as if to beckon Maury to one side. "'I'm in rather a big hurry, Anthony.' "'I know, but can you—can you—' can you? Again he hesitated. "'I'll see you some other time,' said Maury. It's important. I'm sorry, Anthony. 
Before Anthony could make up his mind to blurt out his request, Moray had turned coolly to the girl, helped her into the car, and, with a polite good evening, stepped in after her. As he nodded from the window, it seemed to Anthony that his expression had not changed by a shade or a hair. Then, with a fretful clatter, the taxi moved off, and Anthony was left standing there alone under the lights. Anthony went on into the Biltmore, for no reason in particular, except that the entrance was at hand, and, ascending the wide stair, found a seat in an alcove. He was furiously aware that he had been snubbed. He was as hurt and angry as it was possible for him to be when in that condition. Nevertheless, he was stubbornly preoccupied with the necessity of obtaining some money before he went home, and once again he told over on his fingers the acquaintances he might conceivably call on in this emergency. He thought, eventually, that he might approach Mr. Howland, his broker, at his home. After a long wait, he found that Mr. Howland was out. He returned to the operator, leaning over her desk and fingering his quarter as though loath to leave unsatisfied. "'Call Mr. Blockman,' he said suddenly. His own words surprised him. The name had come from some crossing of two suggestions in his mind. "'What's the number, please?' Scarcely conscious of what he did, Anthony looked up Joseph Blockman in the telephone directory. He could find no such person, and was about to close the book when it flashed into his mind that Gloria had mentioned a change of name. It was the matter of a minute to find Joseph Black. Then he waited in the booth while Central dialed the number. "'Hello, Mr. Blockman? I mean, Mr. Blackian? No, he's out this evening. Is there any message?' The intonation was cockney. It reminded him of the rich vocal deferences of Bounds. "'Where is he?' "'Why, uh, who is this, please, sir?' "'This Mr. Patch. Matter of vital importance. "'Why, he's with a party at the Bull Mitch, sir. "'Thanks.' Anthony got his five cents change and started for the Boul Mitch, a popular dancing resort on 45th Street. It was nearly ten, but the streets were dark and sparsely peopled until the theaters should eject their spawn an hour later. Anthony knew the Boul Mitch, for he had been there with Gloria during the year before, and he remembered the existence of a rule that patrons must be in evening dress. Well, he would not go upstairs. He would send a boy up for Blockman, and wait for him in the lower hall. For a moment he did not doubt that the whole project was entirely natural and graceful. To his distorted imagination, Blockman had become simply one of his old friends. The entrance hall of the Boul Mitch was warm. There were high yellow lights over a thick green carpet, from the center of which a white stairway rose to the dancing floor. Anthony spoke to the hall boy. "'I want to see Mr. Blockman, Mr. Black,' he said. He's upstairs. Have him paged. The boy shook his head. It's against the rules to have him paged. You know what table he's at? No, but I've got to see him. Wait, and I'll get you a waiter. After a short interval, a head waiter appeared, bearing a card on which were charted the table reservations. He darted a cynical look at Anthony, which, however, failed of its target. Together they bent over the cardboard and found the table without difficulty. A party of eight, Mr. Black's own. Tell him, Mr. Patch, very, very important. Again he waited, leaning against the banister, and listening to the confused harmonies of Jazz Mad, which came floating down the stairs. A Czech girl near him was singing, Out in the shimmy sanatorium, the jazz mad nuts reside. Out in the shimmy sanitarium, I left my blushing bride. She went and shook herself insane, so let her shiver back again. Then he saw Blockman descending the staircase, and took a step forward to meet him and shake hands. "'You wanted to see me?' said the older man, coolly. "'Yes,' answered Anthony, nodding. "'Personal matter. Can you just step over here?' Regarding him narrowly, Blockman followed Anthony to a half-bend, made by the staircase where they were beyond observation or earshot of anyone entering or leaving the restaurant. "'Well?' he inquired. "'Wanted to talk to you. What about?' Anthony only laughed, a silly laugh. He intended it to sound casual. "'What do you want to talk to me about?' repeated Blockman. "'Well, sorry, old man.' He tried to lay his hand in a friendly gesture upon Blockman's shoulder, but the latter drew away slightly. "'How've been?' "'Very well, thanks. See here, Mr. Patch, I've got a party upstairs. They'll think it's rude if I stay away too long. 
What was it you wanted to see me about? For the second time that evening, Anthony's mind made an abrupt jump, and what he said was not at all what he intended to say. I understand you kept my wife out of the movies. What? Blockman's ruddy face darkened in parallel planes of shadows. You heard me. Look here, Mr. Patch, said Blockman, evenly and without changing his expression. You're drunk. You're disgustingly and insultingly drunk. Not too drunk talk to you, insisted Anthony with a leer. First place, my wife wants nothing whatever to do with you. Never did. Understand me? Be quiet, said the older man angrily. I should think you'd respect your wife enough not to bring her into the conversation under these circumstances. Never you mind how I expect my wife. One thing, you leave her alone. You go to hell. See here, I think you're a little crazy, exclaimed Blockman. He took two paces forward, as though to pass by, but Anthony stepped in his way. Not so fast, you got him, Jew. For a moment they stood regarding each other, Anthony swaying gently from side to side, Blockman almost trembling with fury. Be careful, he cried in a strained voice. Anthony might have remembered then a certain look Blockman had given him in the Biltmore Hotel years before, but he remembered nothing, nothing. I'll say it again, you god. Then Blockman struck out, with all the strength in the arm of a well-conditioned man of forty-five, struck out and caught Anthony squarely in the mouth. Anthony cracked up against the staircase, recovered himself, and made a wild, drunken swing at his opponent. But Blockman, who took exercise every day and knew something of sparring, blocked it with ease, and struck him twice in the face with two swift smashing jabs. Anthony gave a little grunt and toppled over onto the green plush carpet, finding, as he fell, that his mouth was full of blood and seemed oddly loose in front. He struggled to his feet, panting and spitting, and then as he started toward Blockman, who stood a few feet away, his fists clenched but not up, two waiters who had appeared from nowhere seized his arms and held him, helpless. In back of them a dozen people had miraculously gathered. "'I'll kill him!' cried Anthony, pitching and straining from side to side. "'Let me kill—' "'Throw him out!' ordered Blockman excitedly, just as a small man with a pock-marked face pushed his way hurriedly through the spectators. "'Any trouble, Mr. Black?' "'This bum tried to blackmail me,' said Blockman, and then— his voice rising to a faintly shrill note of pride. He got what was coming to him. The little man turned to a waiter. "'Call a policeman,' he commanded. "'Oh, no,' said Blockman quickly. "'I can't be bothered. Just throw him out in the street. Ugh! What an outrage!' He turned and with conscious dignity walked toward the washroom, just as six brawny hands seized upon Anthony and dragged him toward the door. The bum was propelled violently to the sidewalk where he landed on his hands and knees with a grotesque slapping sound and rolled over slowly onto his side. The shock stunned him. He lay there for a moment in acute distributed pain. Then his discomfort became centralized in his stomach, and he regained consciousness to discover that a large foot was prodding him. "'You've got to move on, you bum. Move on.' It was the bulky doorman speaking. A town car had stopped at the curb, and its occupants had disembarked. That is, two of the women were standing on the dashboard, waiting in offended delicacy until this obscene obstacle should be removed from their path. "'Move on, or else I'll throw you on. Here, I'll get him. This was a new voice. Anthony imagined that it was somehow more tolerant, better disposed than the first. Again arms were about him, half lifting, half dragging him into a welcome shadow four doors up the street, and propping him against the stone front of a millinery shop. Much obliged, muttered Anthony feebly. Someone pushed his soft hat down upon his forehead, and he winced. Just sit still, buddy, and you'll feel better. Those guys sure gave you a bump. I'm going back and kill that dirty— He tried to get to his feet, but collapsed backward against the wall. You can't do nothing now, came the voice. Get him some other time. I'm telling you straight, ain't I? I'm helping you. Anthony nodded. And you better go home. You dropped a tooth tonight, buddy, you know that? Anthony explored his mouth with his tongue, verifying the statement. Then, with an effort, he raised his hand and located the gap. "'I'm a-going to get you home, friend. Whereabouts do you live?' "'Oh, by God, by God!' interrupted Anthony, clenching his fists passionately. "'I'll show the dirty bunch. 
You help me show em and I'll fix it with you. My grandfather's Adam Patch of Tarrytown. Who? Adam Patch, by God. You want to go all the way to Tarrytown? No. Well, you tell me where to go, friend, and I'll get a cab. Anthony made out that his Samaritan was a short, broad-shouldered individual, somewhat the worse for wear. Sodden and shaken as he was, Anthony felt that his address would be poor collateral for his wild boast about his grandfather. "'Give me a cab,' he commanded, feeling in his pockets. A taxi drove up. Again, Anthony essayed to rise, but his ankle swung loose as though it were in two sections. The Samaritan must needs help him in, and climb in after him. "'See here, fella,' said he. "'You're soused, and you're bunged up, and you won't be able to get in your house lest somebody carries you in, so I'm going with you. And I know you'll make it all right with me. Where do you live?' With some reluctance, Anthony gave his address. Then, as the cab moved off, he leaned his head against the man's shoulder and went into a shadowy, painful torpor. When he awoke, the man had lifted him from the cab in front of the apartment on Claremont Avenue and was trying to set him on his feet. "'Can you walk?' "'Yes, sort of. You better not come in with me.' Again he felt hopelessly in his pockets. "'Say,' he continued, apologetically, swaying dangerously on his feet, "'I'm afraid I haven't got a cent.' "'Huh?' I'm cleaned out. Say, didn't I hear you promise you'd fix it with me? Who's going to pay the taxi bill? He turned to the driver for confirmation. Didn't you hear him say he'd fix it? All that about his grandfather? Matter of fact, muttered Anthony imprudently, it was you did all the talking. However, if you come round tomorrow... At this point, the taxi driver leaned from his cab and said ferociously, Ah, poke him on the dirty cheapskate. If he wasn't a bum, they wouldn't have thrown him out. In answer to this suggestion, the fist of the Samaritan shot out like a battering ram, and sent Anthony crashing down against the stone steps of the apartment house, where he lay without movement while the tall buildings rocked to and fro above him. After a long while he awoke, and was conscious that it had grown much colder. He tried to move himself, but his muscles refused to function. He was curiously anxious to know the time, but he reached for his watch, only to find the pocket empty. Involuntarily his lips formed an immemorial phrase, "'What a night!' Strangely enough, he was almost sober. Without moving his head, he looked up to where the moon was anchored in mid-sky, shedding light down into Claremont Avenue, as into the bottom of a deep and uncharted abyss. There was no sign or sound of life, save for the continuous buzzing in his own ears. But after a moment, Anthony himself broke the silence with a distinct and peculiar murmur. It was the sound that he had consistently attempted to make back there in the Bull Mitch, when he had been face to face with Blockman, the unmistakable sound of ironic laughter, and on his torn and bleeding lips it was like a pitiful retching of the soul. Three weeks later the trial came to an end. The seemingly endless spool of legal red tape, having unrolled over a period of three or four years, suddenly snapped off. Anthony and Gloria, and, on the other side, Edward Shuttleworth, and a platoon of beneficiaries, testified and lied and ill-behaved generally in varying degrees of greed and desperation. Anthony awoke one morning in March, realizing that the verdict was to be given at four that afternoon, and at the thought he got up out of his bed and began to dress. With his extreme nervousness there was mingled an unjustified optimism as to the outcome. He believed that the decision of the lower court would be reversed, if only because of the reaction, due to excessive prohibition, that had recently set in against reforms and reformers. He counted more on the personal attacks that they had leveled at Shuttleworth than on the more sheerly legal aspects of the proceedings. Dressed, he poured himself a drink of whiskey and then went into Gloria's room, where he found her already wide awake. She had been in bed for a week, humoring herself, Anthony fancied, though the doctor had said that she had best not be disturbed. "'Good morning,' she murmured without smiling. Her eyes seemed unusually large and dark. "'How do you feel?' he asked grudgingly. "'Better?' "'Yes.' "'Much?' "'Yes. Do you feel well enough to go down to court with me this afternoon?' She nodded. "'Yes, I want to. Dick said yesterday that if the weather was nice he was coming up in his car and take me for a ride in Central Park. And look, the room's all full of sunshine.' Anthony glanced mechanically out the window and then sat down upon the bed. 
God, I'm nervous, he exclaimed. Please don't sit there, she said quickly. Why not? You smell of whiskey. I can't stand it. He got up absent-mindedly and left the room. A little later she called to him, and he went out and brought her some potato salad and cold chicken from the delicatessen. At two o'clock Richard Caramel's car arrived at the door, and when he phoned up, Anthony took Gloria down in the elevator and walked with her to the curb. She told her cousin that it was sweet of him to take her riding. "'Don't be simple,' Dick replied disparagingly. "'It's nothing.' But he did not mean that it was nothing, and this was a curious thing. Richard Caramel had forgiven many people for many offences, but he had never forgiven his cousin, Gloria Gilbert, for a statement she had made just prior to her wedding seven years before. She had said that she did not intend to read his book. Richard Caramel remembered this. He had remembered it well for seven years. "'What time will I expect you back?' asked Anthony. "'We won't come back,' she answered. "'We'll meet you down there at four. "'All right,' he muttered. "'I'll meet you.' Upstairs he found a letter waiting for him. It was a mimeographed notice urging the boys, in condescendingly colloquial language, to pay the dues of the American Legion. He threw it impatiently into the wastebasket and sat down with his elbows on the window sill, looking down blindly into the sunny street. Italy. If the verdict was in their favor, it meant Italy. The word had become a sort of talisman to him, a land where the intolerable anxieties of life would fall away like an old garment. They would go to the watering places first, and among the bright and colorful clouds forget the gray appendages of despair. Marvelously renewed, he would walk again in the Piazza di Spagna at twilight, moving in that drifting flotsam of dark women and ragged beggars, of austere, barefooted friars. The thought of Italian women stirred him faintly. When his purse hung heavy again, even romance might fly back to perch upon it. The romance of blue canals in Venice, of the golden-green hills of Fiesole after rain, of women, women who changed, dissolved, melted into other women, and receded from his life, but who were always beautiful and always young. But it seemed to him that there should be a difference in his attitude. All the distress that he had ever known, the sorrow and the pain, had been because of women. It was something that, in different ways, they did to him, unconsciously, almost casually, perhaps finding him tender-minded and afraid, they killed the things in him that menaced their absolute sway. Turning about from the window, he faced his reflection in the mirror, contemplating dejectedly the wan, pasty face, the eyes with their crisscross of lines like shreds of dried blood, the stooped and flabby figure whose very sag was a document in lethargy. He was thirty-three. He looked forty. Well, things would be different. The doorbell rang abruptly, and he started as though he had been dealt a blow. Recovering himself, he went into the hall and opened the outer door. It was Dot. The Encounter He retreated before her into the living room, comprehending only a word here and there in the slow flood of sentences that poured from her steadily, one after the other, in a persistent monotone. She was decently and shabbily dressed, a somehow pitiable little hat adorned with pink and blue flowers covered and hid her dark hair. He gathered from her words that several days before she had seen an item in the paper concerning the lawsuit and had obtained his address from the clerk of the appellate division. She had called up the apartment and had been told that Anthony was out by a woman to whom she had refused to give her name. In the living room he stood by the door regarding her with a sort of stupefied horror as she rattled on. His predominant sensation was that all the civilization and convention around him was curiously unreal. She was in a milliner's shop in Sixth Avenue, she said. It was a lonesome life. She had been sick for a long while after he left for Camp Mills. Her mother had come down and taken her home again to Carolina. She had come to New York with the idea of finding Anthony. She was appallingly in earnest. Her violet eyes were red with tears. Her soft intonation was ragged with little gasping sobs. That was all. She had never changed. She wanted him now, and if she couldn't have him, she must die. You'll have to get out, he said at length, speaking with tortuous intensity. Haven't I enough to worry about without you coming here? My God, you'll have to get out. Sobbing, she sat down in a chair. I love you, she cried. I don't care what you say to me. I love you. I don't care, he almost shrieked. Get out. Oh, get out. 
Haven't you done me harm enough? Haven't you done enough? Hit me, she implored him, wildly, stupidly. Oh, hit me, and I'll kiss the hand you hit me with. His voice rose until it was pitched almost at a scream. I'll kill you, he cried. If you don't get out, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. There was madness in his eyes now, but, unintimidated, Dot rose and took a step toward him. Anthony, Anthony! He made a little clicking sound with his teeth and drew back as though to spring at her. Then, changing his purpose, he looked wildly about him on the floor and wall. I'll kill you, he was muttering in short, broken gasps. I'll kill you! He seemed to bite at the word as though to force it into materialization. Alarmed at last, she made no further movement forward, but meeting his frantic eyes, took a step back toward the door. Anthony began to race here and there on his side of the room, still giving out his single cursing cry. Then he found what he had been seeking, a stiff oaken chair that stood beside the table. Uttering a harsh, broken shout, he seized it, swung it above his head, and let go with all his raging strength straight at the white, frightened face across the room. Then a thick, impenetrable darkness came down upon him and blotted out thought, rage, and madness together. With almost a tangible snapping sound, the face of the world changed before his eyes. Gloria and Dick came in at five and called his name. There was no answer. They went into the living room and found a chair with its back smashed, lying in the doorway. And they noticed that all about the room there was a sort of disorder. The rugs had slid, the pictures and bric-a-brac were upset upon the center table. The air was sickly sweet with cheap perfume. They found Anthony sitting in a patch of sunshine on the floor of his bedroom. Before him, open, were spread his three big stamp books, and when they entered he was running his hand through a great pile of stamps that he had dumped from the back of one of them. Looking up and seeing Dick and Gloria, he put his head critically on one side and motioned them back. Anthony, cried Gloria tensely, we've won. They reversed the decision. Don't come in, he murmured wanly. You'll must them. I'm sorting, and I know you'll step in them. Everything always gets must. What are you doing? demanded Dick in astonishment. Going back to childhood? Don't you realize you've won the suit? They've reversed the decision of the lower courts. You're worth thirty millions. Anthony only looked at him reproachfully. Shut the door when you go out. He spoke like a pert child. With a faint horror dawning in her eyes, Gloria gazed at him. Anthony, she cried, what is it? What's the matter? Why didn't you come? Why, what is it? See here, said Anthony softly. You two get out, now both of you, or else I'll tell my grandfather. He held up a handful of stamps and let them come drifting down about him like leaves, varicolored and bright turning and fluttering gaudily upon the sunny air, stamps of England and Ecuador, Venezuela and Spain, Italy, together with the sparrows. That exquisite heavenly irony which has tabulated the demise of so many generations of sparrows doubtless records the subtlest verbal inflections of the passengers of such ships as the Berengaria, and doubtless it was listening when the young man in the plaid cap crossed the deck quietly, and spoke to the pretty girl in yellow. "'That's him,' he said, pointing to a bundled figure seated in a wheelchair near the rail. "'That's Anthony Patch. First time he's been on deck.' "'Oh, that's him?' "'Yes. He's been a little crazy, they say, ever since he got his money, four or five months ago. You see the other fellow, Shuttleworth, the religious fellow, the one that didn't get the money? He locked himself up in a room in a hotel and shot himself.' "'Oh, he did!' but I guess Anthony Patch don't care much. He got his thirty million, and he's got his private physician along, in case he doesn't feel just right about it. Has she been on deck? he asked. The pretty girl in yellow looked around cautiously. She was here a minute ago. She had on a Russian sable coat that must have cost a small fortune. She frowned, and then added decisively, I can't stand her, you know. She seems sort of, sort of dyed and unclean, if you know what I mean. Some people just have that look about them, whether they are or not. Sure, I know, agreed the man with the plaid cap. She's not bad-looking, though. He paused. Wonder what he's thinking about. His money, I guess. Or maybe he's got remorse about that fellow Shuttleworth. Probably. But the man in the plaid cap was quite wrong. Anthony Patch, 
sitting near the rail and looking out at the sea, was not thinking of his money, for he had seldom in his life been really preoccupied with material vainglory, nor of Edward Shuttleworth, for it is best to look on the sunny side of these things. No, he was concerned with a series of reminiscences, much as a general might look back upon a successful campaign and analyze his victories. He was thinking of the hardships, the insufferable tribulations he had gone through. They had tried to penalize him for the mistakes of his youth. He had been exposed to ruthless misery. His very craving for romance had been punished. His friends had deserted him. Even Gloria had turned against him. He had been alone, alone, facing it all. Only a few months before, people had been urging him to give in, to submit to mediocrity, to go to work. But he had known that he was justified in his way of life, and he had stuck it out stanchly. Why, the very friends who had been most unkind had come to respect him, to know he had been right all along. Had not the Laceys and the Merediths and the Cartwright Smiths called on Gloria and him, at the Ritz-Carlton, just a week before they sailed? Great tears stood in his eyes, and his voice was tremulous as he whispered to himself, "'I showed them,' he was saying. It was a hard fight, but I didn't give up, and I came through. End of Book 3, Chapter 3, Part 2 of 2 End of The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald Recorded in Los Angeles, California, August 2008